You Are Dead by Peter James Read by Daniel Wayman Chapter 1 Thursday the 11th of December Logan was driving fast in the pelting rain, hurrying home, glad that her shitty day, which had gone from bad to worse, and then progressively worse still, was nearly at an end. She was looking forward to a large glass of chilled white wine and a sneaky cigarette on the balcony before Jamie got home. The familiar Radio Sussex jingle played. Then the female presenter announced it was 5.30pm and time for the news headlines. As Logan listened, with half an ear, she was blissfully unaware that by this time tomorrow evening she would be the lead item on the local news and the subject of one of the biggest manhunts ever launched by Sussex police. Her catalogue of disasters had started as she had got out of bed, late for work, with a splitting headache after a tiresome dinner with clumsy, untidy Jamie, and tripped over a boot he'd left on the carpet. She'd stumbled forward, gashing her big toe open on the edge of the bathroom door. She should have gone to hospital but she couldn't spare the time for the inevitable wait at A&E, so she'd bandaged it herself and hoped for the best. Then, to add insult to injury, she had been flashed by the same damn speed camera she had driven past every working day for the past few years at a careful 32 miles per hour. Somehow today, in her rush to get to work for her first appointment, she had totally forgotten it was there and had gone past it at well over 45 miles per hour. The gilding on the lily came when one of her partners in the chiropractic clinic, the woman who brought in the largest share of their income, announced she was pregnant with triplets and intended, if all went well, to be a full-time mum. Without her income stream, the future of the place could be in doubt. Overshadowing all of that were her concerns about Jamie. He stubbornly refused to accept anything was wrong. But there was. There was so much wrong. His untidiness, which at first had amused her, had grown to irritate her beyond belief, especially when he told her crassly that it was a woman's role to keep the home tidy. So she had tidied up. She'd scooped up all the clothes that he had left lying on the floor, and his beer cans and dirty beer glasses, left after a bunch of his friends had come round to watch the footy, and dumped them down the rubbish chute in the corridor of their flat. She was grinning in satisfaction at the memory, as she indicated right, braked, then halted her car at the entrance to the underground car park beneath their apartment block in Brighton's Kemp Town. She pressed the clicker to open the electric gates. Then, as she drove down the ramp, she was startled by a figure lurking in the darkness. She stamped her foot hard on the brake pedal. Chapter 2 Thursday the 11th of December Within seconds of answering the phone to his fiancée, Jamie Ball sensed something was wrong. The connection was bad as he drove his battered old VW Golf down the M23 towards Brighton in the heavy rush hour traffic and pelting rain, and it was hard to hear what she was saying, but even through the crackly line he could hear the unease in her voice. Are you okay, darling? he asked. No, she said. No, I'm not. What is it? There's a man down here in the car park. I just saw him. He tried to hide as I drove in. Neither of them liked that underground car park beneath their apartment block. Their small ninth-floor flat, close to Brighton's Royal Sussex County Hospital in Kemptown, had views to die for across the rooftops and far out into the English Channel, but the car park always gave them the creeps. It was poorly lit, with many totally dark areas, and there was only minimal security. Several vehicles lay beneath dust sheets and never appeared to be moved. Sometimes, when he drove down there, Jamie felt he was entering a mausoleum. If Logan arrived home on her own late at night, she preferred to park on the street and risk a ticket in the morning rather than go down there in the dark. He had repeatedly warned Logan to make sure the electronic gates had closed behind her before driving on down the ramp. Now, the scenario he had always feared seemed to be happening. OK, darling, he said. Listen to me. Lock your doors, turn around, and drive straight back out. 
she did not reply. Logan, did you hear me? He heard her scream. A terrible scream. Then silence. Chapter 3 Thursday the 11th of December Felix is fine with the fact that I kill people. He gets it. He understands my reasons. I have a sneaking feeling he'd like to do the same himself, if he had more courage. Harrison's not so sure about the whole moral issue here. As for Marcus, well, really, he's dead against it. No pun intended. <laughs> he thinks I'm a bad person. But hey, it's good to have smart friends who have opinions and aren't afraid to express them. Personally, I've always respected people who speak their mind. They say a true friend is someone who knows everything about you and still likes you. But I would question that unconditional aspect of friendship. We need friends to keep checks and balances on us, to help each of us keep our perspectives, our moral compass. But I have to say that Marcus is wrong. I'm not really a bad person. I'm just a victim. All of us in life, all of us are victims. We're all prisoners of our past in some form. Our past defines us in ways that are not always obvious. It's only later, on occasions, when you read something that touches a nerve or your therapist points out some connection you had never made. That's when you have the light bulb moment, when suddenly it all makes sense and you can justify everything. I've just started my next project. She's a young lady in her mid-twenties, slim, pretty, with long brown hair. The way I like all my projects to look. I've been following her for the past three months, from a distance mostly, but also on her Facebook page and through her tweets. I like to make a thorough study of my projects, working out the best way to take them, then thinking about what I'm going to do with them. It's the anticipation that really gives me the bang. It's like going online and looking at the menu of some great restaurant I plan to eat in. My beautiful dossiers. Logan is quite a girl. She's fit in every sense. Runs marathons. Was due to get married. So that's not going to happen now. And that's nothing to do with me. But that all helps me, navigating by my moral compass. She can't treat men the way she has. She needs punishing. Chapter 4 Thursday the 11th of December in summer, Hove Lagoon, a children's park and playground with two large boating ponds, a skate park and a children's paddling pool, behind the seafront promenade, lined with gaily painted beach huts, would be teeming with people. Children, under the watchful eyes of mothers, grandparents, au pairs or nannies, would be playing on the roundabout slides and swings or in the little pool, or sailing their toy boats on one of the two rectangular ponds that gave the place its name, and which they shared with learned dinghy sailors, windsurfers and wakeboarders. Many would be stuffing their faces with ice creams or sweets purchased from the big beach cafe, its utilitarian whitewashed walls, blue windows and steeply pitched roof belying its uber-cool cocktail bar and diner interior, the inspiration of its latest owner, big beat musician Norman Cook, a.k.a. Fat Boy Slim. But in the gloom of this foul December Thursday afternoon, with cold rain pelting down and a strong gusting wind, the whole place was forlorn and cheerless. A solitary elderly lady in a see-through sou'wester walked a reluctant dog the size of a large rat on a lead attached to a harness. A group of workmen in fluorescent jackets, hard hats and ear defenders working overtime beneath floodlights were drilling open the path in front of the cafe. One, 
The foreman stood away from the group, head bowed against the weather, holding up a tablet in a waterproof case, taking measurements and tapping them in. A cluster of cars and a van were parked nearby, as well as a noisy yellow mobile generator. As his drill bit broke through a fresh strip and he levered it out of the way, one workman suddenly shouted out in a foreign accent, Oh God, look! He turned anxiously towards the foreman. Wesley, look! Hearing his cry above the din of their machines, all the other workmen stopped too. The foreman stepped forward and peered down and saw what looked to his untrained eye like a skeletal hand. Is it an animal? asked the workman. Dunno, the foreman said dubiously. Nor could he tell how old it was. It could have been there decades. But he couldn't think of any animal that had a paw or claw like this, except a monkey, possibly. It looked human, he thought. He instructed all three men with the drills to concentrate on the immediate area around the hand and to be careful not to drill deeper than necessary. More chunks of the black asphalt were levered away and a skeletal arm appeared, attached to the hand by black tendrils of sinew. Then part of a ribcage and what was, unmistakably, a human skull. OK the foreman said nervously. Everyone stop now. Uh, go home, and we start again in the morning, if we are permitted. Uh, see you all at 8am. Wondering whether he should have stopped the men sooner, he went over to the van, opened the rear doors, then climbed in, rummaged around, and pulled out a tarpaulin. He laid it over the exposed parts of the skeleton, weighing it down with chunks of rubble. When he had finished, he unholstered his phone and dialed his boss to ask for instructions. They came back loud and clear. He ended the call then, as he'd been told, immediately dialed 999. When the operator answered, he asked for the police. Chapter 5 Thursday the 11th of December Shaking with fear, Jamie Ball pulled his golf over onto the hard shoulder of the motorway, halted, and dialed Logan's number again. The phone rang, six times, and then he heard her voicemail message. Hi, this is Logan Somerville. I can't take your call right... He ended the call and immediately redialed. Answer, darling Logan, answer. Please answer, please answer. Again it rang six times, and her message started up. A lorry thundered past inches from his little car, shaking it and spattering it with spray. He closed his eyes, thinking, feeling close to tears. He could call the caretaker, Mark, or their next-door neighbour, who had a key to their flat. But he had heard her scream. Something had happened. His car shook again as another juggernaut thundered by far too close. He ended the call and immediately dialed 999. Chapter 6 Thursday the 11th of December some idiot, an hour or so ago, had mentioned the Q word. Just as in the theatre world, where there was a deep superstition about mentioning the name of the play Macbeth, all thespians only ever referred to it as the Scottish play, so in the police world it was considered a jinx to say that a day was quiet. And sure enough, within minutes of the tubby, fully kitted constable breezing into the communications department of Sussex Police Headquarters to have a word with his wife, who was one of the radio controllers, and letting slip that Q word, it had all started kicking off, it seemed right across the county. There was a sudden spate of three separate serious road traffic collisions, an armed robbery in Brighton a man threatening to jump off the notorious suicide beauty spot Beachy Head, and a missing four-year-old boy in Crawley. The comms department, which was housed in a very large open-plan room on the first floor of a modern block on the sprawling HQ campus, handled all emergency calls made to Sussex police throughout the county, and housed the CCTV system. It was presided over by Ops 1, the call sign for the duty inspector in charge, among the responsibilities of these inspectors was the granting of authority for use of firearms in a spontaneous incident and running and controlling any vehicle pursuit in the county. 
This afternoon and evening's Ops 1 was Andy Kill, a tall, strongly built, former British parachuting champion in his early fifties, with a handsome face etched cynical from almost thirty years of police service and topped with a thin fuzz of close-cropped greying hair. Dressed in uniform dark trousers and a short-sleeved black top with police embroidered in white on the sleeves, his inspector pips on his epaulets and his ID card hanging from his neck on a blue lanyard, he currently sported a substantial and uncharacteristic pot belly, the result of recently having given up smoking and compensating by binge eating. Kill sat at his desk in a cubicle-like space at the rear of the room, surrounded by an array of computer screens and monitors. One displayed a map of the county. Another constantly updated him on all the incidents currently running. A third, with a touchscreen, operated as his eyes and ears on the department he presided over. On the wall at the far end of the room were monitors that displayed the performance statistics whilst over his desk a separate screen showed images from four of the 500 CCTV cameras around the county, as well as monitors displaying the current news. With the aid of his different and separate keyboards and a toggle lever, Kill could rotate and zoom any of the cameras within seconds. Thirty people worked in this section, most of them civilians, identified by the white embroidered words police support on their sleeves, and royal blue polo shirts as opposed to the black ones of the police. Several were former police officers. At busy times, there could be the best part of 100 people working over the two levels. At a row of desks beneath the CCTV cameras sat the radio operators, each, like almost everyone else in the room, wearing a headset. These were the people who liaised with the police officers who had been dispatched both in vehicles and on foot. Most radio operators had a CCTV screen for the cameras on their particular area when needed. Alongside them sat the emergency call handlers. Emergency, 999 calls, were signalled by a low klaxon, so that in the rare instances all the call handlers were occupied, others in the room, also trained, would be alerted to answer. Amy Wood, a placid, motherly, dark-haired woman had twenty years of service answering emergency calls and was one of the most experienced in the room. She loved this job because you never knew what might happen in just ten seconds' time and if there was one thing above all else she had learned it was that whenever you thought you'd seen it all you were always going to be in for another surprise. She never cared for cue days so she was always secretly glad when things kicked off and how in the past hour. She had answered calls from witnesses to two different road traffic accidents, a man whose girlfriend had been bitten by a neighbour's dog, someone in Bognor Regis who had just been dragged off his bicycle and seen it ridden away, and someone who sounded off his face on drugs, complaining that a neighbour across the street kept photographing him. The bane of her and her colleagues' work was the constant stream of hoax calls, and the even larger volume of calls from mentally ill people around the clock. One particular elderly lady with dementia called 15 times a day. It was a fact that 20% of all 999 calls for immediate police response were mental health issues. She had one on the line right now. A young man, crying. I'm going to kill myself. His hysterical voice was barely audible over the crackling roar of wind. Can you tell me where you are? He was phoning from a mobile phone, and the location of the cell tower receiving and transmitting his signal showed up on her screen. It was in the town of Hastings, and he could have been in any of a dozen streets. I don't think you can help me, he said. I've got problems in my head. Where are you? she asked him calmly and pleasantly. Rigor Road, he said and began blubbing. No one understands me yet. As she spoke, she was typing out a running incident log and instructions to a radio dispatcher. Can you tell me your name? There was a long silence. She heard what sounded like Dan. Is your name Dan? No, Ben. The whole tone of his voice was worrying her. She completed her instructions with grade one, which meant immediate response, and to be there within a maximum of fifteen minutes. So what's been happening this week to make you feel like this, Ben? I've just never fitted in. 
I can't tell my mum what's wrong. I'm from Senegal. Came when I was ten. I've just never fitted in. People treat me different. I've got a knife. I'm going to cut my throat now. Please stay on the line for me, Ben. I have someone on their way to you. I'm staying on the line with you until they get to you. A reply flashed back on her screen with the call sign of a police response car that had been allocated. She could see on the map the pink symbol of the police car no more than half a mile from Rigger Road. The car suddenly jumped two blocks nearer. Why do people treat me different? He began crying hysterically. Please help me. Officers are very close, Ben. I'll stay on the line until they get to you. She could see the pink symbol entering Rigger Road. Can you see a police car? Can you see a police car, Ben? Yeah. Will you wave at it? She heard voices. Then the message she was relieved to see flashed up. Officers at scene. Job done, she ended the call. It was always hard to tell whether would-be suicide calls were real or a cry for help, and neither she nor any of the others here would ever take a risk on a call like this one. A week ago, she'd taken a call from a man who said he had a rope round his neck and was going to jump through his loft hatch. Just as the police entered his house, she heard him gurgling, and then the chilling sound of the officers shouting to each other for a knife. Amy looked at her watch. 5.45 not halfway through her twelve-hour shift yet, but time to grab a cuppa and see how many others in the department fancied ordering in a curry tonight from a local, rather good Balti house, which was fast turning into their latest canteen. But before she could remove her headset and stand up, her phone rang. Sussex Police Emergency, how can I help? she answered, and immediately looked at the number and approximate location that showed on the screen. It was in the Crawley area, close to Gatwick Airport. She guessed from the traffic noise the caller was on a motorway. An RTC, she anticipated. Most calls from motorways were either reporting debris lying in one of the lanes or else road traffic collisions. As was so often the case, at first the young man seemed to have problems getting his words out. From her long experience, Amy knew that for most people the mere act of phoning 999 was nerve-wracking, let alone the effect that the emergency they were phoning to report was having on them. Half the people who called were in some kind of red mist of nerves and confusion. She could barely hear the man's voice above the roar of the traffic. I just phoned, you see. Look, the, the thing is, I'm really worried about my fiancé, he stuttered finally. May I have your name and number, caller? she asked, although she could see his number already. He blurted them out. I think my fiancée is in trouble. I was just on the phone to her as she was driving into the underground car park beneath our flat. She said there was a man lurking in there. He scared her. Then I heard her scream and the phone went dead. Have you tried calling her again, sir? Yes, yes, I have. Please send someone over there. I'm really worried. All Amy's experience and instincts told her this was real and potentially serious. What is your name, please? Jamie. Jamie Ball. Despite the background roar, he now spoke more clearly. Once again, she was typing as she spoke. Can you give me the address, her name, and a brief description of your fiancé? He gave them to her, then added, Please, please, can you get someone there quickly? Something's not right. She looked at her screen, then at the map, searching for the pink car symbol, then spotted it. Officers are being dispatched now, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. She could hear his voice cracking. Please stay on the line for a moment, sir. Sir? Mr. Ball? Jamie? My name is Amy. I'm sorry, he said, sounding more composed. Can you give me your fiancé's mobile and home phone numbers and car registration number? Ball gave the details, but suddenly could not remember the entire registration number. It begins GU10, he said. Please ask them to hurry. Do you have any idea who the person in the car park might be? Have you or your fiancé seen anyone suspicious in the car park before? No, no, but it's dark down there and there's no security. Some vehicles were vandalised there a few months ago. I'm on my way home now, but I'm a good half an hour away. Officers will be there in minutes, sir. 
Please, make sure she's okay. Please, I love her. Please, make sure she's all right. Please. I'm giving the officers attending your mobile number, sir. They'll contact you. I heard her scream, he said. Oh, God, I heard her scream. It was terrible. They've got to help her. She typed the details out and sent them by flum, a flash unsolicited message to Andy Kill. He immediately alerted the duty force gold commander, Chief Superintendent Nev Kemp, and the duty critical incident manager, formerly known as the Silver Commander, Chief Inspector Jason Tingley, that they had a potential abduction. Chapter 7 Thursday the 11th of December PC Rain, officers called this kind of weather, only partially in jest. Scroats didn't like getting wet, and accordingly the crime levels almost always went down in the city of Brighton and Hove whenever there was heavy rain. Six o'clock on a dark, chilly Thursday evening in December, PC Susie Holiday, with her crewmate, the older and more experienced PC Richard Kirk, known as RVK, and famed within the police for his photographic memory, were heading west along Hove Seafront in their Ford Mondeo estate patrol car. They were passing a succession of handsome Regency terraces to their right and the deserted lawns, with rows of beach huts to their left. Further away, beyond the throw of the promenade street lighting, the stormy water of the English Channel tossed and foamed. They were approaching the end of their shift, with just an hour till the 7pm changeover, and it had been a quiet day. So far, they'd attended a minor RTC, a rider knocked off his motor scooter by a van, but without any injury, a call to a chemist near the Seven Dials roundabout where a man had collapsed in the doorway from a suspected drug overdose, and, as there was almost without fail on every shift, a call to a domestic incident, which they had sorted and arrested the live-in boyfriend. It was the fourth time the woman had called the police after being assaulted by this man in the past 18 months, Perhaps now she would throw him out for good. But Susie Holliday doubted it. The true tragedy for many victims of domestic abuse was that they became so demoralised, losing all their confidence, that they rarely had the courage to chuck their partner out or to leave, or the ability to believe they could make a life on their own. In a few hours, the downtown area around West Street, with its bars and nightclubs, would, inevitably, turn into a potential war zone, as it did every Thursday, Friday and Saturday night, kept mostly under rigid but friendly control through Operation Marble, a massive police presence late into the night. But luckily, on their current shift pattern, they would escape these nights of dealing with constant fights and with drunk, abusive chavs, although, in truth, some officers enjoyed getting in a good bundle, as they called it. It was one of the adrenaline rushes of the job. Susie Holliday was driving in the stop-start traffic, the wipers struggling to clout away the rain, the brake lights of the car in front flaring against their rain-soaked windscreen. RVK was engrossed in a text he was sending. They were both off for the next two days, and Susie was looking forward to a quiet time with her husband, James shopping for stuff for the new flat they had recently moved into in nearby Eastbourne, where the property prices were substantially lower than Brighton. "'What are your plans for your days off, RVK?' she asked her colleague. "Uh," he said and raised a finger, signalling he needed to finish his texting task. "'Taking Joey to the football,' Joey was his twelve-year-old son, whom he doted on. "'Then we're going to the outlaws after. You?' Their radios crackled. Then they heard the female voice of a resource room supervisor. Charlie Romeo 4? RVK answered. Charlie Romeo 4? Charlie Romeo 4, we have a report of an incident in the underground car park of the Chesham Gate Flats at the corner of Stanley Rise and Briars Avenue. A woman may have been attacked by an intruder. Can you attend? Grade 1. Chesham Gate? Kirk replied. Yes, yes, we're on our way. Then he turned to Susie. Spin her round. Susie Holliday switched on the blue lights and siren and, adrenaline pumping, made a U-turn straight out into the opposite lane and accelerated. Like most of her colleagues, she always got a massive buzz out of responding to a grade one shout. 
Along with getting in a bundle, driving on blues and twos was one of the great kicks and perks of the job, and a big responsibility. The lights and siren were, in law, a request to be allowed through, not an automatic right, and with what seemed like half of all drivers on the road either deaf, blind, or just plain stupid, all blue light runs were fraught with hazards and heart-in-the-mouth moments. She had one now, as a Nissan Micra in front, with apparently no rear-view mirrors or indicators, suddenly switched lanes right into her path as she bore down on it at over sixty miles per hour. Asshole, she hissed, missing its rear bumper by inches and undertaking it. As she drove, Constable Kirk was taking down details from the supervisor, who read out the make and partial index of the woman's car and a description of her. Ninety seconds later, they tore over the roundabout by Brighton Pier, thanks to an intelligent bus driver stopping for them, and on up Marine Parade. They made a left, blazing up past the bed-and-breakfast hotels of Lower Rock Gardens. Less than two minutes later, driving up the steep hill before the hospital, they saw the apartment block, Chesham Gate, ahead to their left. They pulled up beside the closed entrance to the underground car park, climbed out, and walked up to the full-height gates. They peered through the bars of the grill into the darkness below. Susie Holliday took out her torch, switched it on and shone the beam through, but could see little other than a row of parked cars, some beneath fitted covers. Any idea how we get in? she asked her colleague. I'll see if there's a caretaker's flat, he said, and sprinted off towards the main entrance. Suddenly she heard a clank, and the gates began to open. Moments later, she was lit up by the glare of headlights and heard the roar of an engine behind her. She turned to see a small BMW convertible driven by a young woman. Raising her arm, she walked towards it and told the driver she wouldn't be able to enter the car park at this time because of a police incident. She hurried down the ramp, triggering the automatic lights, and could now see much of the interior, switching her torch off to conserve the battery. She was looking for a white Fiat 500, index beginning GU10, and a slim woman in her mid-twenties with long brown hair. There were about sixty or so parking spaces, most of them occupied, as well as several motorcycles and a cycle rack. But there was no sign of life. She began working her way along the rows of parked cars, breathing in the smells of dust and engine oil, and all the time keeping a wary eye out for anyone else who might be down there. She reached the end of the row and turned left towards a darker section. One light above her flickered intermittently, emitting a loud buzz, and she switched her torch back on. She passed a bike rack with several heavily padlocked bicycles and a beautiful old convertible Mercedes caked in dust and sitting on four flat tyres. Then she saw, neatly parked, a white Fiat 500. The first digits of its index were GU-10. The car looked wet, as if it had only recently been driven in here. She stopped and radioed her colleague. I think I've found the car, she said. I'm on my way down with the caretaker, he responded. She approached the car cautiously, then shone her torch beam in through the side window. The interior was empty. A discarded chewing gum wrapper lay on the passenger seat, and there was a ticket sitting on the dash. She looked at it closely and saw it was a pay and display from a car park in nearby Lewis. She checked both driver and passenger doors, but they were locked. The car bonnet was warm. Just then, PC Kirk appeared, accompanied by a short man in his fifties, wearing chinos and a fabric bomber jacket, and holding a mobile phone. This is Mark Schultz, the caretaker for this block, he said. So, uh, what exactly is the problem? the caretaker asked. We need to ensure the owner of this car, Miss Logan Somerville, is safe, she said. Have you seen her since she arrived back? He shook his head. No, I finish at half past five. Do you have CCTV here? He raised his hands with a gesture of despair. It's not been working for six weeks. I told the management company, but nothing happens. He shrugged. What can you do, eh? Then he hesitated as they walked towards the stairs. Shall I phone her? Yes, please. Very nice lady, he said. Nice boyfriend. Nice people. He held his phone up, scrolled through the display, then dialed. After some moments, he looked at the two officers and shook his head. No answer. Do you have a key to her flat? Yes. Give me a few moments to find it. 
I'll stay down here and have a look around and stop anyone else from entering or leaving, Kirk said. You go up to the flat. Susie Holliday went up the internal staircase to the ground floor, then waited in the corridor while Schultz went into his flat. He came back out holding a bunch of keys, like a jailer, and led her into the lift. At the ninth floor, they stepped out into a gloomy corridor with a badly worn carpet and a musty smell. Somewhere, music was pounding out insanely loudly. Susie Holliday recognised it as Patient Love by Passenger. She followed the caretaker along the corridor till he stopped outside a door and pressed the bell. After some moments, he rang again. Then he knocked hard. He waited several seconds, then looked quizzically at the police officer. No answer. Could you open it so I can check if she is there? I don't really like to go in, you know. We're very concerned about her safety. We need to know if she is all right. He shrugged. OK, sure, no problem. He opened the door and called out, Hello, Miss Somerville. Hello, it's the caretaker. I have the police with me. They were greeted with silence. The place had a deadened, empty feeling. Do you mind if we go in? P.C. Holliday asked. He rolled his mouth pensively, then gestured with his hand. No, uh, do go in. They entered a small hallway, with two mountain bikes leaning against the wall, and a cluster of coats and anoraks hung above them, and then walked through into a bright, airy, but untidy living dining room. It had a modern feel, with a cream carpet, beige sofas, and a breakfast bar, dividing the room from the small kitchen, on which lay a copy of the independent newspaper and the week magazine. At the rear of the bar was a tropical fish tank, immaculately clean and brightly illuminated, with several tiny fish swimming around. There were a number of framed photographs, which Susie Holliday looked at with interest. One showed a good-looking young couple, both in cycling gear, posing with muddy bikes against a rugged, mountainous landscape. Another was of the same couple, lying on a beach, looking up and grinning at the photographer. Another showed them in ski gear. There were several large, colourful, abstract prints depicting deck chairs on the beach, the skeletal remains of the Old West Pier, and a row of beach huts, and a spaniel, which looked like it was by an artist she really liked, a Lewis-based painter called Tom Homewood. They checked the bedroom, which contained a double bed with a neatly folded duvet and plumped pillows, a television and a table with a lamp by the side of the bed. A stack of books lay on one table, and a woman's magazine and a partially empty water glass on the other. Susie Holliday noted a boot lying on the floor, and then saw what looked like a small blood stain at the bottom of the ensuite bathroom door, and some tiny drops on the floor. The bathroom was tidy and dry, with a wicker laundry basket, on top of which lay light recycling shorts and a vest. The shelves were lined with shower gel, shampoo, body cream and other unguents, male and female razors and several bottles of perfume, cologne and aftershave. It seemed as though no one had been here for a few hours, at the very least. Susie Holliday radioed in her report and stated that whilst there was no sign of a struggle, she had seen a small amount of blood. The controller told them that the woman's fiancé was now just minutes away and to wait at the scene. Chapter 8 Thursday the 11th of December Jamie Ball, normally a careful driver, tore like a man possessed along Edward Street, peering through the windscreen blurred by the pelting rain, weaving in and out of the heavy rush-hour traffic, flashing his lights and hooting and ignoring the angry horns and waved fists that came back at him. His entire body was pulsing with fear. A speed camera flashed him, and he didn't care. He was oblivious to everything but the desperate need to get home, to make sure Logan was OK. He turned sharp left, the car skidding on the wet surface, the tyres juddering for traction as he accelerated up the hill, then made a right into their street. Ahead, he saw a police patrol car parked close to the entrance to their apartment block. He pressed the clicker, waited impatiently for the electronic gates to swing open, then started to drive down the ramp. Almost straight away he was stopped by a uniformed police officer who ran up out of the car park. He identified himself and was directed into an empty bay. Immediately he jumped out of the car, leaving the door open, and to his immense relief saw her little white Fiat neatly parked in its usual space. She was okay, thank God, thank God. 
Then he turned to the police officer and asked, Where's Logan? My fiancée. What's happened? Is she okay? I think it would be best if you go and speak to my colleague who's gone up with the caretaker. He felt a sudden chill of fear. Why? What's happened? They'll be able to update you upstairs, sir. Jamie raced along to the lift and rode it up to the ninth floor. As the doors opened, he stepped out and saw a uniformed police officer, accompanied by Mark, the caretaker, emerging from their flat. Hi, he called out. Is everything okay? Hello, Jamie, the caretaker greeted him. Logan? Is she okay, Mark? She phoned me. She said she saw an intruder in the car park. I haven't seen her, Mark said. She's not home yet, Jamie. Yes, she is. Her car's downstairs. He looked at the police officer, ignored her quizzical stare, and eased his way past her and into the flat. He strode down the hallway, past their mountain bikes leaning against the wall, turned left into the small anteroom which they had lined floor to ceiling with bookshelves, housing his entire collection of Lee Child novels and many of their other favourite crime, horror and sci-fi writers, and into the large, untidy, square, living dining room. No sign of her. Logan, he called hurrying back into the hallway. He checked their bedroom. The boot Logan had tripped over earlier still lying by the bed, the ensuite bathroom, the tiny guest bedroom, the kitchen, the guest loo, and shower room. He went back into the living dining room and opened the door to the small balcony. Sometimes she went out there for a cigarette, despite his attempts at getting her to quit. But the two plastic chairs and little white table sat there, forlornly drenched in the rain, the soggy stub of a cigarette lying in the ashtray in a pool of water. He stepped back into the living room and closed the door against the elements. The police officer had returned with the caretaker standing behind her. I'm PC Holiday, she said. My colleague and I attended at the underground car park of this building following your call earlier. So far, we haven't found anything suspicious. Logan's Fiat is parked and locked in its allocated space downstairs, and there's no sign of any disturbance in your flat. She phoned me from the car park. She drove in. Then she screamed, and her phone went dead. Have you tried her again, sir? Yes. I've been calling her constantly all my way here. He tugged his phone out of his trouser pocket and dialed her number again. Six rings, and it went to voicemail. Darling, he said, call me, please, as soon as you pick this up. I'm really worried. He ended the call and looked back at Susie Holiday. She always calls me back within minutes. It doesn't matter what she's doing, she always calls me back, and I always call her back. She definitely drove to work herself, sir? She didn't get a lift from a colleague, which could explain why her car is here? No, for God's sake. She called me from her car, down in the car park. She said she'd seen a man down there and screamed. It was a terrible sound. It wasn't like her. Can we go back down to the car park and take a look? Jamie pleaded. The officer's radio crackled. Jamie heard a disembodied female voice say something he couldn't discern. Charlie Romeo 4, Susie Holiday answered. We're still attending at Chesham Gate. Thank you, Charlie Romeo 4. Let me know when you stand down. Yes, yes, she replied. Then she turned to Jamie Ball. Did you and your fiancé have any kind of argument today, sir? Susie Holiday asked. Argument? No, why? I noticed blood on the bottom of your bathroom door earlier. Oh, that. She tripped, getting out of bed and gashed her toe on it. She was going to go to the hospital this morning to get it looked at. The hospital would be able to verify that, would they, sir? Yes, of course. Then Jamie Ball hesitated and stared at the officer. Oh, God. You think I did something to her? For Christ's sake! I'm afraid we have to ask these questions, sir. Jamie grabbed the spare keys to Logan's car, and then they took the lift back down to the car park to join Kirk, and the three of them headed over to the Fiat. One thing I should add, Ball said, is that Logan's diabetic. She's type 2, needs to keep her sugar levels up, otherwise she can risk a hypo. The officer nodded. Where do you work, Mr Ball? In Croydon, Condor Pet Foods. We've got two Rhodesian Ridgebacks. P.C. Kirk said, walking over and joining them. The wife swears by Condor. Condor vital life. Good to hear that, Jamie said without enthusiasm. It's an excellent product. Better than raw meat, he shrugged. From what I know, it's more of a balanced diet than raw meat. They reached the Fiat. She was down here when she called you? P.C. Holiday asked. 
She held up her iPhone. It's a very poor signal. Jamie nodded. He pulled out his phone again. The signal veered from one dot to zero to two. He dialed Logan's number again and, moments later, heard it ringing. Very faintly. They all could. For an instant, the caretaker and two officers looked at him. Frowning, he fumbled with the key, then opened the car door. Instantly the ringing was louder. Her phone was lying in the footwell, almost under the passenger seat. He started to lean across to pick it up, but was held back by PC Holiday, who reached past him with a gloved hand. The ringing stopped. Holiday knew that recovered phones were normally retained for forensic digital evidence, but as a life was potentially at risk, she decided to check the phone immediately. She held it up and asked him for the code, which he gave her. She tapped it in and stared at the display and saw nine missed calls from Jamie Mop. She asked if it was him, and he confirmed it was. He looked at the two police officers. She'd never... She'd never leave her phone. She wouldn't go anywhere without it. But although he could see sympathy in their expressions, he could also see they were a tad sceptical. I'm afraid all of us leave our phones behind sometimes, PC Holiday said. Done it myself. Me too, the caretaker chipped in. I couldn't find the thing for two days. Something's happened to her. Please believe me. Something's happened. I heard her scream for God's sake. Their radios crackled again, and once more he heard a female voice. Charlie Romeo 4, PC Kirk said, tilting his head and speaking down into the radio clipped to the left of his chest. Serious RTC at the A23-A27 junction. RPU needs some assistance. Can you advise me when you're free to attend, Charlie Romeo 4? Yes, yes, Kirk said, but I think we're going to be a while. Then he turned to Jamie Ball. Excuse me being personal, sir, but was everything all right between you and your fiancé? No arguments or anything like that? Nothing. We bickered like every couple, but we've never had a real argument in all the time we've been together. We love each other so much. Susie Holliday stepped away from the others, feeling increasingly concerned about what she had heard. She radioed control and requested that the duty inspector attend urgently. Chapter 9 Thursday the 11th of December Roy Grace arrived home shortly after 6.45pm on Thursday night. The detective superintendent had three and a half more days to go as the on-call senior investigating officer for Surrey and Sussex Major Crime Team before the buck got passed to another senior detective at 7am on Monday for the following seven days. The county of Sussex averaged 12 homicides a year, and it was around 10 in Surrey. In the whole of the UK, there were about 650 a year. Every homicide detective hoped to get a challenging murder, not that they were bloodthirsty people, but it was what they trained for, and what challenged them the best. And it had to be said that a high-profile homicide raised your own profile, and promotion prospects. Not that Roy Grace ever wished anyone dead. Over the past few years, weekends had been jinxed for him. On each occasion that he had hoped for a quiet one, because of a social engagement, or more recently wanting to spend time with his wife, Cleo, and their five-month-old son, at the last minute he had been called to a homicide investigation. He was really hoping for a peaceful weekend so that he could focus his energies on helping Cleo to sort her possessions in preparation for the move next week from Cleo's house which they were sharing, to the cottage they had bought together near the village of Henfield, eight miles north of Brighton. Cleo stood up, carefully removing a large book of fabric swatches from her lap and placing it on the coffee table, on top of a pile of other fabric and wallpaper sample books. Grace turned to his eleven-year-old goldfish, Marlon. You're going to be moving to the country next week. How do you feel about that? We're going to have hens. You've never seen a hen, have you? other than on television. But you're not that big on watching television, are you? Cleo slipped an arm around his waist and kissed him on the neck. If someone had told me a few years ago that one day I would be jealous of a goldfish, I wouldn't have believed them. But I am. Sometimes I think you care more about Marlon than me. Marlon opened and shut his mouth, looking as ever like a grumpy, toothless old man on his never-ending circumnavigation of his round tank, 
passing through the fronds of green weed and over the submerged remains of a miniature Greek temple, which Roy had bought some years ago after reading an article in a magazine on the importance of giving goldfish things to interest them in their bowls. But nothing Roy had ever bought seemed to interest this lonesome creature. Over the years, he had attempted on several occasions to provide Marlon with a mate, but every companion he had bought had ended up either gulped down by this mini-monster or floating dead on the surface, while Marlon continued, day in, day out, his eternal circular motion. He had won the fish at a fairground stall all those years back with his long-missing first wife, Sandy, who, after ten years' absence, had recently been declared legally dead, allowing him and Cleo to marry. He'd carried the fish home in a water-filled plastic bag, and, according to Sandy's research, the life expectancy of fairground goldfish was less than a year. Now, eleven years on, Marlon was still going strong. In the Guinness World Records, which Roy had recently consulted, the longest-lived goldfish in the world achieved forty-three years. Still some way to go. But for sure, Marlon showed no signs of pegging out any time soon, and secretly Roy was glad about that. In a strange way, one he would never tell Cleo about, Marlon provided a link back to Sandy. He knew that he would be sad when he eventually died. And indeed, every morning when Roy came downstairs, the first thing he did was to look at the bowl, hoping that Marlon would not be floating lifelessly on the surface. As we're moving, darling... I think Marlon should move too. I've just read on the internet that goldfish need a bigger tank than people realise. Oh? How big? Like an Olympic-sized pool, Cleo said. He grinned. No, but big enough to stretch their legs. Or rather, fins. Just so long as it's not bigger than our new house, or I would be getting extremely jealous. And in which case, sushi, my love. He looked at her quizzically. Don't even go there. Love me, love my fish, right? He put his arms around her. God, I adore you. She stared into his eyes. And I adore you. I love you more than anything I could ever have imagined, Detective Superintendent Grace. She kissed him. Then his work phone rang. It was Andy Anakin, the Golf 99, the term for the divisional duty uniformed inspector at Brighton's John Street Police Station, which had the somewhat unwelcome reputation as the second busiest police station in England. Unlike most of his colleagues, who had the ability to remain calm in any situation, this particular inspector had acquired the nickname of Panicking Anakin. He sounded like he was panicking now. Sir, he said, seemingly out of breath, the DI's dealing with another urgent situation and asked me to call you to give you the heads up that we have a possible kidnap or abduction. A young woman has gone missing after screaming down the phone to her fiancé that there was an intruder in an underground car park in Kemptown. What information do you have on it? Roy asked, immediately concerned. Very little, sir. You see, that's the thing. Very little so far. I've units doing a house-to-house -house in the area, and a distraught boyfriend who believes his fiance has been abducted. We're doing all we can, but it's not looking good, sir. Really, it's not. Ops One has alerted the duty gold and critical incident manager. Grace's heart sank. It didn't sound or feel good. What do you know about the couple? Her name's Logan Somerville, 24, recently qualified as a chiropractor, works at a practice in Portland Road, Hove. His name's Jamie Ball. He's a marketing manager for the pet food division of the Condor Food Group. Works at their offices near Croydon. We're checking him out further. With 80% of victims of violence harmed or killed by an immediate member of their family or someone close to them, Grace was well aware that loved ones were always people who deserved close investigation. He had been called, he knew, not solely because he was the on-call senior investigation officer, but also because he was a trained kidnap and hostage negotiator. But if this did become an active investigation, he wouldn't be carrying out both roles. I think we need to seal off the county, sir, Anakin said. Roadblocks on all major roads, sir. Put out on all ports. I've requested n 15 on standby. n 15 was the call sign for the helicopter shared between Sussex and Surrey police forces and now based at Redhill. Hold on, Grace said. This is bad, Roy. I'm telling you, this is bad. Andy, calm down. Wind your neck in. Grace retorted. What checks have you done to verify she is missing? Local. Presumably there's CCTV in the car park? Yes, but it's not working. 
Great, he grimaced. Have you got any local officers searching around the immediate scene, seeing if anyone's seen or heard anything? I have two there. Not enough. Get more there right away. Have you spoken to the boyfriend? Officers are talking to him at the moment. I'm at the scene myself. I've asked for divisional CID to attend and thought you needed to be aware, Roy. I understand the woman screamed and mentioned a man lurking in the vicinity who has not been traced. Grace frowned. It didn't look good, but equally Anakin seemed to be rushing in before he had all the facts. What do we know about the missing woman, Andy? Does she have anything that would make her a potential kidnap target? Is she an heiress, or does she have rich parents? I'll find out all that. Right. Update me in thirty minutes, please, if not before. Yes, sir. Roy Grace stared at Marlon's bowl, his brain racing. Mobile phones dropped connections constantly, and sometimes made odd noises. A squeal of car tyres, or the scrape of a metal gate, or just some interference on the line could have been misinterpreted as a scream but twenty years as a police officer had given him a rich amount of that instinct they call copper's nose, and this one did not smell good. And the grim truth was that in abduction cases, the victim was often killed very quickly. With every hour that passed, the chances of finding the victim alive lessened. He reflected on what he had been told so far. The man who called it in, Jamie Ball, worked at Croydon and was on his way home. That would be easy enough to verify. A combination of ANPR, number plate recognition cameras, sighted strategically along the M23 and triangulation of his mobile phone would pinpoint his approximate position at the time he claimed to have received the call from his fiancée. Likewise, it would be an easy job to verify that she had made the call and where she was at the time. But with luck, it wouldn't come to that. Maybe she'd arrive back with a load of grocery bags, having gone foraging in the nearby Sainsbury's local. He hoped. Noah began to cry. He saw Cleo rush dutifully up the stairs. Life was complicated, so damn complicated. He suddenly envied Marlon the simplicity of his existence. Did the fish have to worry about anything? Did he fret about food being put into his tank daily? Or did he assume its delivery? Marlon would never be robbed, conned out of his life savings, abused. He was unlikely to be murdered or mutilated by a terrorist attack. His mind drifted back to the evening before, when he had travelled to Worthing with Norman Potting to speak to Bella Moy's mother. He had wanted to see her in advance of her daughter's funeral, to discuss with her the details of the service, and if there was anything in particular she wanted him to say. Bella, who had been engaged to Norman, and was one of his core team, had tragically died in a fire. Then his phone rang again. Chapter 10. Thursday the 11th of December. Shortly after 7.15pm, Roy Grace and Detective Inspector Glenn Branson hurried, heads bowed against the driving rain, towards the battery of bright lights illuminating the small crime scene investigation tent that had been erected a short distance in front of the Big Beach Cafe at Hove Lagoon. It was surrounded by two cordons of fluttering blue and white crime scene tape. To the right, Inside the inner cordon was a second similar-sized tent. So much for a quiet weekend, Grace was thinking. First a possible abduction, and now this. If the abduction was real, and he was increasingly certain that was the case, he would have to delegate one case, as he couldn't run two simultaneously. One particular thought had been troubling him since panicking Anakin's call thirty minutes earlier. He remembered that a couple of weeks ago, on a different senior investigating officer's watch, another young woman had disappeared in the nearby seaside town of Worthing. Her name was Emma Johnson, and she was twenty-one years old. She had come from a troubled background with an alcoholic mother and had disappeared many times before. On one occasion, she had surfaced several months later, living with a small-time drug dealer in another coastal town, Hastings. Her mother had reported her latest disappearance, and this one had been carefully risk-assessed by the police. Emma had been recorded as a misper, and inquiries had been made. The assumption was that she would reappear at some point, so it had not been treated as a major inquiry. But nonetheless, a case officer had been assigned. Grace had checked the serial on her case just before leaving home to see what, if any, developments there had been. 
As a rule of thumb, Grace knew that most missing persons turned up within a few days. If they were gone for a month, the chances were they were gone for good. Emma Johnson had now been missing for 15 days. During this time, no calls had been made from her mobile phone and no payments taken from her credit card, and the case officer had reported growing concerns for her safety. The circumstances regarding Logan Somerville were very different. Grace and Branson could see the white major incident van parked a short distance away and a miserable-looking PCSO scene guard, and they could hear the sound of a generator. Two marked cars were parked close to the van, along with a plain silver Ford estate car. They were greeted by the tall, friendly figure of the duty CID inspector, Charlie Hepburn, in a blue hooded oversuit and protective shoes, and the uniform duty inspector, Roy Apps, with rain dripping off his peaked cap. Nice weather for ducks, Apps said. Yeah, well you should know, quipped Brunson. Apps had been a gamekeeper in his former life before joining Sussex Police. Ha <laughs> ha! Nice to see you, Charlie, Roy Grace said. How are Rachel, Archie and my namesake, Grace? All good, thanks. Archie and Grace are getting very excited for Christmas. I would be too, Grace replied, if I'd done any of my bloody shopping. Anyhow, what do we have? A uh, pretty good mess, Hepburn said. Why the hell didn't they stop the moment they uncovered the bones instead of carrying on? Want us to suit up? Grace asked. I suppose you'd better, so Dave doesn't get even more pissed off. He jerked a finger at the tent over the path, right behind him. Grace and Branson went into the second tent, out of the rain. Chris G., a crime scene investigator, formerly known as a scenes of crime officer, handed them each an oversuit and shoes and offered them tea or coffee, which they both declined. They struggled into the suits, pulled on the shoes, went back out and signed the scene log. Then they followed Hepburn into the brightly lit tent covering the exposed parts of the skeleton. There was a smell of damp earth and another more unpleasant smell of decay. The crime scene manager, Dave Green, was in there on his hands and knees studying the exposed remains. He stood up and greeted them. I did a bit of checking before we got here. This path was laid twenty years ago when there was some renovation work done on the cafe, long before Fat Boy Slim bought it. Grace peered down at the skeletal arm, the partially exposed ribcage and the skull with fragments of rubble lying on them. He knelt, pulled out his torch and studied them more closely in the beam of bright light and noticed a small area of desiccated skin attached to the skull bone and a few small fragments of fabric here and there. From what little he could see of the body, it looked like it had been buried intact. Surely whoever laid this path must have seen the body. Glen Branson said. Not necessarily, the crime scene manager said. We're below the water table here. It could have been buried deeper and covered in earth and slowly been pushed to the surface, then stopped from rising any higher by the path. Grace stared thoughtfully, trying to remember what he had learned a year or so ago from the local forensic archaeologist Lucy Sibbon about identifying age and sex from skeletal remains. Female, he ventured. That's my opinion from the shape of the skull, Roy, but I can't be sure. We might be lucky and get DNA from the body. The teeth are intact and look relatively young. Maybe dental records? There's a good chance of dental records if she's local, Green said. But only, Grace knew, if they were reasonably sure who she was. Grace stared hard at the U-shaped bone at the base of the jaw. The hyoid, if I remember correctly he said, pointing with a gloved finger. It's intact. A break would have indicated strangulation. Reckon we need to call out a police surgeon to certify death, Glenn Branson said. Both men looked up at him and returned his grin, but he had a valid point. The coroner for Brighton and Hove was a doughty lady who was a stickler for protocol. There had been past occasions when the police had received a flea in their ears from her for not having death formally certified, regardless of the state of decomposition of the corpse. Call the duty coroner's officer, he instructed Glenn Branson. Tell them what we have. We certainly can't remove anything without their consent, and they need to know my plan to call for a forensic archaeologist and a home office pathologist. He glanced at his watch. But I don't think we need to worry about any golden hour. 
The golden hour was the term given to the time immediately following the discovery of a suspected murder victim. But in this instance, where it was with little doubt a crime scene more than twenty years old, and already partially contaminated by the workmen who had drilled it open, time was less urgent than in the case of a fresh body. He looked at Dave Green and Glenn Branson, who both nodded in agreement. He stared back down at the bones. Who were you? What happened to you? Who loved you? Who killed you and why? Did they think they would get away with this? Are they still alive? We're going to find out everything. I promise you. Glenn pulled out his phone and slipped out of the tent. Grace smelled the sweet whiff of cigarette smoke. Someone outside was having a crafty fag, and he could have done with one himself. Anything to take away the noxious reek inside this flapping, plastic-sided cocoon. It was one of the many things he loved about Cleo, that although a non-smoker herself, she never objected when he smoked the occasional cigarette or cigar. There's little wear in the teeth, Dave Green said. That indicates the person died young, teens or early twenties. How sure are you about that? Grace asked. I'm pretty sure about that, but not much else. We need to get the rest of the body exposed, then let the forensic archaeologist go to work. Lucy Sibbon would be my first choice. I suggest we leave the scene secured overnight and ask her to come first thing in the morning if she's free. Grace nodded at the remains. I don't think she, if we're right and it is a she, is going anywhere in a hurry. Dave Green nodded. It's my wedding anniversary. I'd be earning myself a pink ticket with Janice by getting home in time to celebrate it. Happy anniversary, Grace said. Glenn Branson came back into the tent. Yeah, he said. I just spoke to Philip Key, the on-call coroner's officer. He thinks we should get the death certified just to be safe. For fuck's sake, it is such a ridiculous policy, Green said exasperatedly. He jerked a finger at the skull. How much more sodding dead does she need to be? Outside, they heard the yap of a dog. Moments later, the tent flap opened, and CSI Chris G. peered in. Sir, he said, there's a gentleman walking his dog across the lagoon who saw the police vehicles and asked if he could help. He said he's a doctor. Grace and Branson looked at each other. A doctor? Roy Grace said, well, how convenient is that? Yes, ask him if he would be willing to confirm a death. A few minutes later, a short, fit-looking man in his mid-fifties, in a protective suit, mask and shoes, entered the tent. Hello, he said cheerily. I'm Edward Crisp. I'm a local GP. I was just walking my dog. Your colleague at the barrier is kindly looking after him, and saw all the activity. I just wondered if I could be of any help. I used to serve Brighton and Hove Police as one of your on-call police surgeons up until about fifteen years ago. Grace nodded. Yes, I remember your name. Well, your timing's impeccable. He pointed down at the exposed remains. Some workmen uncovered this earlier today. I know it sounds a little strange, but we need a medical person to confirm life extinct. Would you be able to oblige? Dr. Chris peered down, then knelt and stared for some moments at the skull, then at the rest of the exposed bones. Well, he said, I really don't think there's much doubt about that. Poor woman. Woman, Grace said. Definitely. The doctor hesitated. Well, it's a long time since I was a medical student, but from all I can remember, I'd say from the shape of the skull it's female, and from the condition of the teeth, late teens or early twenties. Any idea how long she might have been here? Glenn Branson asked. He shook his head. I couldn't begin to hazard a guess. You'd need a forensic archaeologist to give you that kind of information, but yes, indeed, there's no question of life here. I would be happy to confirm that I can see it is a skeleton and there is no life. Was that helpful? Extremely, Roy Grace said. Is that all? Leave your details. I'll send someone round to you tomorrow to take a formal statement. Absolutely. No problem at all, he smiled. Bye for now. Chapter 11 Thursday the 11th of December Jamie Ball sat perched on a stool at his kitchen breakfast bar, drinking beer after beer, phone in his hand, calling each of their friends in turn, his back to the rainy darkness beyond the window. 
He focused first on Logan's girlfriends, then her sister, then her brother, then her parents, asking if by chance, slim chance, she had gone over to see them. As he spoke, he stared either at the tropical fish in the tank or at the photograph on the bar counter of the two of them in their ski suits, taken on top of the Kleiner Matterhorn at Zermatt last March, with snow-capped peaks framing the horizon. They were laughing at some joke their mate, John, who had taken the picture, had just cracked. John, who had introduced them a year earlier, had a simple philosophy that they had both often joked about. Get up, have a laugh, go to bed. But Jamie wasn't laughing at that now. With tears streaming down his face, he stared at the woman he loved more than he could ever have imagined loving anyone, who he still hoped would become his wife. She was twenty-four, with long brown hair and an infectious smile that showed her immaculate white teeth. The first time he had seen her, she had reminded him of a younger Demi Moore in one of his favourite movies, Ghost. She told him he reminded her of a younger Matt Damon, in an un-Matt Damon kind of way, whatever that meant. She was like that, quirky and oblique at times. God, he loved her. Please be okay, my darling. Please come home. Please come home. Every time he heard a sound out in the corridor, he turned and waited expectantly for Logan to walk in through the door. He turned to PC Holiday, who was sitting on a sofa making notes, and asked if there was any update. Chapter 12 Thursday, the 11th of December Logan's head was pounding. She was lying on her back, totally disoriented, and with no idea where she was, shivering with cold. She was light-headed and giddy, and experiencing a faint swaying sensation, as if she were on a boat. And she badly needed to pee. Desperately. She fought against it. There was a vile smell in her nostrils, of mildew, and something much stronger, a smell that reminded her of the time she and Jamie had come back from two weeks on the Greek island of Spetsis last summer to find the mains fuse in their flat had tripped and the fridge and freezer had been off for many days during an August heat wave. They had opened the freezer door to find two steaks crawling with maggots and a chicken that had turned bright green and almost luminous. The smell of the decaying flesh had made them both gag, and it had taken days of keeping the windows open, burning scented candles, and constantly spraying the place with air fresheners to finally get rid of it. Was she having a nightmare? But her eyes were open. She could see a faint green glow of light. She was lying in some enclosed container, hemmed in on both sides so tightly she could not move her elbows. Her eyes were blurred, as if they had some kind of drops in them, and her mind was fuzzy. She tried to sit up, and something hard dug into her neck, painfully, almost choking her. She cried out. What the hell? Where was she? It was coming back now, and with it, the terror. She felt a dark feeling of dread deep inside her. Driving down into the underground car park, someone in the shadows... Then suddenly the hooded figure looming above her window, her car door being yanked open. The hiss of gas. Her eyes stinging, agonizingly. Then nothing. Chapter 13 Thursday the 11th of December I really like this Pharaoh and Ball paper for the dining room, Cleo said. What do you think? The question took Roy Grace back almost twenty years to when he and Sandy had bought their house. But the big difference was, he realised, that Sandy had got on and made all the decorating choices herself without asking him his opinion in the way Cleo was doing. Roy had just dropped in on his way to Chesham Gate to update Cleo and keep his peace with her. He stood over the sofa and peered down at the grey and white zigzag pattern. It looked busy and a complete contrast, he thought, to the kind of paper Sandy would have chosen. She liked minimalistic, plain. Yes, he said, a little abstractly. The coffee table and most of the floor were scattered with fabric swatches and sample books. To their irritation, Humphrey kept moving around restlessly, sitting on different books. 
It was as if the dog sensed that change was happening and was unsettled. Grace would have loved a drink right now, a really stiff vodka martini or a large glass of cold white wine. But being on call, and with all that was going on, he did not dare. It was twenty past eight. Panicking Anakin had phoned him earlier to say that Logan was neither an heiress or came from a moneyed family, and he was going off duty. He'd briefed his replacement, Golf 99, who was now the duty inspector for Brighton and Hove Police for the next twelve hours, and who Roy was due to meet shortly at the Chesham Gate car park. Roy continued to stare at the wallpaper sample. It was rather elegant, he thought. It's fun, he said. You don't think it's too busy? I'd like to put in a dado rail and have plain white above it. I think we can bring a lot of colour in with the curtains and... Cleo was interrupted by his work phone ringing. Apologetically, he retrieved it and brought it to his right ear. Roy Grace, he said in a formal tone. It was the replacement Golf 99, Inspector Joseph Webben. Sir, he said, I know we're due to meet soon, but things are not looking good on this Miss Burr Logan Somerville. There has been no communication from her since the last update. We've checked with ANPR and their camera picked up Ball's car in several locations consistent with the journey he claims to have made from his workplace in Croydon and south to Brighton. Grace thought hard for some moments, weighing the options. But when people disappeared, they had often been abducted or harmed by someone they knew, frequently their partner. Or they had run away from an abusive relationship, gone off with a lover, had an accident, or, in some cases, committed suicide. A huge amount of police time got wasted on missing persons, particularly youngsters who turned out to be in the next-door neighbour's house watching television with a friend. But it didn't appear to be the case on this occasion. Panicking Anakin had gone almost straight into abduction mode. It might turn out the inspector had made the right call, although Grace hoped not. Was there anything he was overlooking here that could point a finger at the woman's fiancé? It did not seem so. So we can eliminate Ball as a suspect, for now at any rate. Webben sounded hesitant. The officers attending reported some blood at the scene, a small amount, but reasonably fresh. When questioned about it, Ball said she had stumbled getting out of bed and gashed her toe on the bathroom door, and subsequently had to go to hospital to have it sorted. We've checked with the Royal Sussex County, and they have no record of her having been in accident and emergency this morning. Domestic violence? Yes, CID here feel that's a possibility, sir, but we have a development. We've been going to all the flats in the building, asking if anyone was in the car park around the time she made a call. We found one lady who was driving in and had to brake hard to avoid an estate car with darkened windows that came out at high speed and drove off. Did she get the registration, or see the driver's face? Unfortunately, not a good look. She says she was too startled, and she thinks he was wearing a hat pulled down low over his face. All she can say is that he was white, middle-aged, clean-shaven, with a round face and glasses. She's not very good on car makes, but she says it was a medium-sized car in a dark colour, possibly an old Volvo, navy blue or charcoal. Have you given that to CCTV in the control room? Yes, sir, they're on it. What's the woman's name? Sharon Pavoni. Doesn't necessarily mean anything, but we should get a cognitive interview as soon as possible to see what else she can remember. Cognitive witness interviews were a highly specialised field of their own, involving trained interviewers who could obtain recall from witnesses of things they had seen or heard that they were unaware they had remembered. He looked at his watch. Realistically, it would be too late tonight by the time it could be set up. We'll arrange it for first thing in the morning, assuming Logan Somerville hasn't turned up. Let me have the witnesses' contact details and the boyfriend, fiancés. I want them both interviewed. Webben gave them to him and Grace noted them down. Then Grace said, Have the whole underground car park sealed off. Nothing to go in or out, which I believe has already been put in place. I want Somerville's fiat removed for forensic examination, but first get a police search advisor and team down there as fast as possible to do a fingertip search. I'm treating this as a crime in action. Trained members of the specialist search unit would work on their hands and knees. If there was any evidence, such as a speck of blood or a discarded cigarette butt, they would find it. As soon as he had ended the call, Roy Grace phoned both the Force Gold and the critical incident manager before he made another call to his new boss and former adversary, Assistant Chief Constable Cassian Pugh. 
It was protocol to notify the chiefs of any impending major inquiry, so they didn't hear it first from a journalist and find themselves in the embarrassing situation of sounding uninformed. Pew answered almost immediately, his voice smarmily pleasant. Roy, very good to hear from you. How are things? Grace could hear heavy opera music playing loudly in the background, a deep, sonorous dirge. A year and a half earlier, on a temporary posting from London's Metropolitan Police, Pew had made Roy Grace's life hell for some weeks when he had taken it upon himself to order the garden of the home Grace had shared with Sandy to be scanned and dug up in a search for her remains. It had started a bitter feud between the two senior detectives, which had culminated first in Grace saving the man's life, reluctantly, after a cliff-top car chase, and then in Grace accusing him of tampering with evidence. Pew, with his tail between his legs, had applied successfully for a transfer back to the Met. What Roy Grace hadn't known then, and still did not know, was that many years back, Cassie and Pew had had a brief affair with Sandy. Now, to Grace's utter horror and disgust, Pew had returned to Sussex Police as the assistant chief constable to whom he had to report. The soon-to-be-retiring chief constable, Tom Martinson, had done his best to assure him that Pew had no animosity towards him, and to be fair, so far so good. But Grace felt that lurking behind the phony bonhomie, Pew was itching for revenge, and subtly biding his time. Grace had to make damned sure he did not screw up. He informed Pew of the missing woman and what they knew so far and the actions they were taking, and, separately, told him about the body at the lagoon. As he hung up, he heard Noah crying upstairs. Cleo signalled for him to carry on and hurried across the room. He stood still, thinking for a moment. Two totally different cases slung his way in the space of a few hours, the skeletal remains at Hove Lagoon, and this potential abduction. He could not deal with them both. He needed to delegate one to another detective. The remains had been there since before the path had been laid, some twenty years ago, so there was less urgency. Right now, the absolute priority was to find Logan Somerville. His next call was to D.I. Glenn Branson, updating him and appointing him senior investigating officer for the remains at the lagoon. The police computerised operations naming system, working through famous paintings, had allocated the case the name Operation Mona Lisa. Branson would ensure the remains were recovered by the forensic archaeologist to the mortuary tomorrow. Then he made a call to D.S. Guy Batchelor, asking him to assemble a major inquiry team for the newly named Operation Haywain the investigation into the disappearance of Logan Somerville. Not an entirely stupid name. Looking for a missing person was akin to searching for a needle in a haystack, with one proviso. First, you had to find your haystack. Chapter 14 Thursday the 11th of December The steady drip of water from somewhere near. Where was she? Was it raining outside and was water leaking in? Plock. 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 Each drip echoing as loudly as if the ground it struck was a drumskin. For something to do, something to concentrate on, Logan counted in her head the gaps between each drip, shivering constantly from cold and terror. One hundred and one, one hundred and two, one hundred and three. Pluck. Fifteen seconds. She was parched, desperate for water, and she felt clammy and jittery, the deep, destabilising sense of unease that always spread out through her stomach and up through her body when she was low on sugar. She was very low now, and she was still very badly in need of a pee. Her eyes felt swollen, and all she could see was a green haze. It was as if she was wearing someone else's glasses, someone who had very poor vision. But she wasn't wearing any glasses, so far as she could tell. Her nose was itching like hell, and she was desperate to scratch it, but her hands were pinned either side of her. There was nothing she could do. She was close to passing out, she knew. 
It was her anger that was keeping her going. Her anger and her terrible fear. Hello, she called out. Her voice sounded deadened, as if absorbed straight into cotton wool. Hello, she called again, louder. She must be asleep, having a nightmare. A lucid dream? Yes, a lucid dream. She'd read stuff about lucid dreaming, where you could become aware in a dream that you were dreaming. She willed herself to wake up, but nothing changed. Then suddenly the light brightened. The green flared into brilliant white, hurting, burning, as searing as a blowtorch. Hello, she said. Jamie, is that you? Jamie, please, let's talk this through. Please, I know you're upset with me for breaking you off, but please, this is enough. Please, please. There was a long silence. She heard a sliding sound, felt cold air on her face. Someone was standing over her. Her skin was pricked with goosebumps. Jamie, she cried out. What do you want? What the hell are you doing? Let me go. For God's sake, get me some sugar. Chocolate, I'm going to hypo, Jamie. Jamie. Jamie, is it you, Jamie? You know what happens if I get too low? Get me some sugar urgently, please. Please. Jamie. The sliding sound again. The cool breeze stopped. Could it possibly be Jamie, angry at her for calling off the wedding? Had she missed something in his character? Had he set this up? The bright light moved away, accompanied by the faint shuffle of footsteps. She heard a door close, then a click nearby. Moments later, she heard the sudden, tortured cry of a female voice. Help me! A slick of terror slid through every cell in Logan's body. Help me, she heard again. Then an even deeper cry of anguish. No, no, please, no, no. It was followed by the most pitiful scream. And suddenly she could not contain her need to pee any longer. Embarrassed, she let go, fully expecting to feel the warm stream between her legs. But as she emptied her bladder, something seemed to be absorbing the urine. Now she knew for sure this wasn't a dream. Chapter 15 Thursday the 11th of December At twenty past ten, Jamie Ball's entry phone buzzer rang. He ran over to the front door, realising he was a little drunk, and saw on the fuzzy black-and-white screen a man's face above a turned-up collar. Hello, he said. Mr. Ball? Yes, he blurted anxiously. Detective Superintendent Grace, may I have a word with you? Please come up. Ninth floor. Two minutes later, Jamie opened the front door to see a pleasant-looking man of about forty, with a rugged face beneath short, gelled fair hair, a nose that looked like it had been busted, possibly more than once, and sharp, alert blue eyes. He held up a police warrant card. Detective Superintendent Roy Grace, Surrey and Sussex Major Crime Team. Have you heard from your fiancé? No, not... not anything, not a word. Please come in. Thank you for coming. Can I offer you a glass of wine? No, thank you, I'm fine. Grace could smell alcohol on the man's breath, and he looked a little unsteady. He was a burly, bearded man with a rugby player's build and with a stacked-up modern hairstyle, dressed in jeans and a v-neck cardigan over a white T-shirt, shoeless, in red socks. He led the detective through into a living room with a kitchen area partitioned off by a bar on which stood a beer glass and several empty cans of lager. He ushered him to one of two small sofas either side of a glass coffee table where copies of Sussex Life and Latest magazine lay. Susie Holliday, on the other sofa, stood up and greeted Grace with a respectful, Good evening, sir. Roy Grace removed his coat, folded it, and laid it beside him. Then he studied the man carefully. Can you give me your full name, Mr. Ball? Yes, Jamie Gordon Ball. Still watching the man intently, he asked, When did you last see Logan? This morning, about seven o'clock. 
She tripped getting out of bed and gashed her toe open on the bathroom door. I would have driven her to the hospital on any other day, but I had a very important early meeting at work. Grace noted his reply, but made no comment. She gave you no indication that she was going anywhere tonight? No, none. We'd made plans to have a Chinese tonight. There's a place nearby that delivers. We have it regularly, and we were going to watch a couple of episodes of Breaking Bad. We're working our way through it. Great show, Grace said. It is, we're totally hooked. Where does Logan work? In Hove. She's a chiropractor. She works in a clinic on Portland Road. So far, the man's body language indicated he was telling the truth. How would you describe your relationship? Ball was quiet for a moment. Then he said, We love each other. For the first time, the man's demeanour indicated that he might be lying. Have you set a date for your wedding? Grace pressed. He looked even more uncomfortable now. Yes. Well, not exactly. Not exactly. We're sort of discussing it. Sort of? Yes. He shrugged awkwardly. Grace looked at him even more intently. Has Logan ever done this before? Not come home? Never. Look, I heard a scream. I don't know if you've been down there, but the car park here is really creepy. There's been a raft of car break-ins and thefts. The management of this place don't give a toss. She phoned me to say she'd seen someone as she drove in. Then she screamed. Then I... He covered his face with his hands. Grace watched him. His distress seemed genuine. Yet at the same time he was uncomfortable about the way Ball was describing his relationship with his fiancée. Something was not ringing true. Something's happened to her, Detective Superintendent. Something's happened to her. This is just not like her. Something's happened. She's a strong person. I've never heard her sound afraid before. The fear. The fear in her voice. Tell me what you think has happened to her. Jamie Ball shook his head wildly. I don't know, but I think she's been abducted, kidnapped, taken. You're watching Breaking Bad? Yes. Do you watch a lot of cop programmes, crime series? Quite a lot, yes. Are you sure you're not being influenced here? Are you 100% convinced that Logan has been abducted and not gone somewhere of her own free will? Yes. He fixed his eyes on Roy Grace's. Roy Grace left. Ten minutes later, unsure about everything except for one certainty. Logan Somerville was missing. The ANPR evidence seemed to eliminate Jamie Ball, but his body language made him appear guilty. Of something. What was he lying about? As Grace drove away, he made a mental note that he needed to appoint a family liaison officer first thing in the morning, someone who might be able to shed more light on the relationship. Chapter 16 Thursday, the 11th of December I keep my projects in their own private cubicles, in what I like to call my correction chamber. Tanks, all plumbed in, my projects kitted out with adult disposable nappies. Cleanliness is so important for morale. I keep them healthy, plenty of vitamins, nutrients, Electrolytes. I want them to live as long as possible, so that I can make the choices about when to say goodbye. It's all about power. Power is hugely exciting. I don't like to call them my victims. I prefer the term projects. I'm not a violent person. Really, I'm not. Once, when I was a kid, I hit a sparrow with a pebble I fired from my catapult. I can still remember that bird spinning round and round like a helicopter, plummeting to the ground. I never really expected to hit it. I just fired at it for fun. I picked it up, its feathers all soft, and its body so warm. And I was crying, trying to breathe life back into it through its little beak. 
I dug a grave for it, laid it in the bottom, apologized, covered it with earth and said a prayer. I felt like shit for days after. But at the same time, it wakened something inside me. Every time I looked at a bird for the rest of my childhood, I would think to myself about the power I had. The power of death. Killing things makes me feel strong. Some people will say that's evil. Here's the thing. Does evil exist? Surely only if you believe in God. Otherwise you believe in the survival of the fittest. Which means I survive and others I choose to kill don't. Today I've chosen to kill. Been looking forward to this moment for days. Well, actually for weeks. But of course you are not capable of ever knowing the pleasure this is going to give me. Chapter 17 Thursday the 11th of December Water had been steadily filling the tank for the past hour. Restraints across her neck, wrists, stomach, thighs and ankles kept her secured to the bottom of the tank, unable to move. The water was now brimming over her chin. In a few minutes it would be covering her mouth, then her nose. He stared down at his project through his night vision goggles and saw the terror in her face in the monochrome green light. He liked to keep the correction chamber in darkness so that his projects could not see one another. He kept them in the dark, so to speak. That term was his little private joke. Her brown hair floated all around her face. It was a very beautiful sight and he took an infrared photograph of her. She was staring up at him, looking as if she was ready to scream again at any moment. Some of his projects had beautiful screams that sent a surge of longing deep through him. But not this one. She had a really ugly scream. Strange that such a beautiful woman, with quite delicious-looking lips, could produce such a hideous sound. He raised a finger to his lips, then leaned down and kissed her, pressing his own lips hard against hers, forming a seal. At the same time he pinched her nostrils tightly closed with his surgically gloved hand. He kept his lips to hers as she struggled, sucking, sucking, Sucking the very last breath from her, feeling the water rising up against his face, still sucking. Then he released her nostrils, let go of her lips, and stood up. He watched the bubbles rising. Not many at all. He'd taken that very last breath from her. Now he possessed her. Forever. Soon, while she was still warm, he would make love to her. She could never reject him. Chapter 18 Friday the 12th of December Logan Somerville was still missing in the morning, and that knowledge weighed heavily on Roy Grace, who had come straight from a briefing of his team in the incident room at Sussex House. The rain had stopped during the night, and the patches of sky in the gaps between the swift-moving clouds above Hove Lagoon were a stark, cold blue. There was an inner and outer cordon, marked off by blue and white crime scene tape, each cordon protected by a PCSO scene guard. A knot of onlookers stood just beyond the outer cordon, several of them taking photos with their phones. Inside the inner cordon, there were now four blue CSI tents rippling and crackling in the strong, salty wind coming in straight off the channel, the guy ropes tugging at their pegs. It looked like an entire army of people had moved in since he and Branson had been here last night, Grace thought. The Surrey and Sussex police helicopter, NPAS-15, hovered overhead, 
taking photographs to map the scene, and added to the feel of a military operation. A cluster of cars and vans and a small mechanical digger were parked nearby. There was a marked police car, the major incident van, another van belonging to the construction company, and several private cars. One of these, a yellow Saab convertible, Roy Grace recognised to his relief, as belonging to Home Office pathologist Nadiuska de Sancha. Out of the two specialist pathologists covering this area, who could be called in to investigate suspected homicides, all the SIOs in Surrey and Sussex much preferred the pleasant, easy-going Nadiuska to the pedantic and arrogant Dr Fraser Theobald. De Sancha was popular because not only was she good at her job, she was a fast worker and good-natured with it. A CSI scene sketcher was making a detailed plan of the entire site, and another CSI, like all the others wearing a disposable scene suit, gloves, face mask, hairnet and overshoe protectors, was scanning the area immediately around the scene with ground-penetrating radar, searching for any other bodies that might also be here. Several workmen in high-vis jackets were hanging around close to the construction company van, some drinking tea or coffee, and one struggling with the flapping pages of the Sun newspaper. A crime scene photographer, James Gartrell, whom Grace had worked with many times, was busy taking photographs of the whole scene and making a digital recording of the events. Grace glanced at his watch as he strode with Glenn Branson through the onlookers beyond the outer cordon towards the uniformed PCSO scene guard who was rubbing her hands against the cold. Several gulls bobbed like marker boys on the near lagoon, and on the far pond a windsurfer in a wetsuit, under tuition, wobbled on his board, bent over, struggling to bring the sail up out of the water. As they reached the PCSO and signed in, Grace heard a female voice call out behind him, Detective Superintendent! The two detectives turned to see a young, attractive, fair-haired woman in a bright red Macintosh hurrying towards them. Siobhan Sheldrake, a recent addition to the Argus newspaper reporting team and a replacement for their previous crime reporter, Kevin Spinella, who had been the bane of Grace's life. The relationship with the press was a vital one for the police to manage well. The press needed sensational stories, which often entailed having a go at the police from many angles. But, equally, in major crime investigations, the press could be crucial in public appeals for witnesses to come forward. He was hoping for a better relationship with this new reporter. Good morning, he said pleasantly, raising his voice against the loud thwock, thwock, thwock of the helicopter. You've met my colleague, D.I. Branson? Yes, she shouted back, grinning at Glenn almost mischievously. Nice to see you again, Detective Inspector. And you too, Siobhan. How are you? Glenn said. Well, a little bird told me you two gentlemen haven't come to a children's playground to have a go on the swings, nor the slide or roundabout, and you don't look like you're dressed for a windsurfing lesson. Glenn cocked his head sideways, and Grace noted the chemistry between them. Very astute, Branson said. You could be a detective. She laughed. So, do I have to wait for a press conference to find out what's going on here, or can I get a scoop on the dead body unearthed by workmen last night? Well, at this point, Roy Grace said, you appear to know as much as we do. Is it male or female? Do you know the age? How long has he or she been here? She pointed. You have a fairly big CSI presence, and a home office pathologist, and I understand you have a forensic archaeologist in there too, so I would say you're spending serious money at a time of major budget cuts for the police, which means you have a crime scene you consider worth investigating. We're not talking historical relics, are we? She was smart, Grace had to concede, and he had to stop himself grinning back at her. Not only was she attractive, she had an infectious smile. Glenn Branson jerked a thumb at his colleague and best friend. I hope that comment isn't referring to this old relic here. He grinned at Grace. Sorry, old-timer. Very witty, Grace retorted. The reporter smiled. I won't print that, she said. There was something about the reporter that Roy Grace warmed to. She seemed a lot more sincere than many journalists he had encountered. And hell, she had made the effort to get here early and was well informed. She deserved at least a tidbit. D.I. Branson will be holding a press conference, Siobhan, as soon as we have sufficient information. What I can tell you so far is that workmen digging up this path yesterday exposed human remains, which have been tentatively identified as female. We don't know the age, and we don't know how long they've been here, other than that they predate this path, which was laid approximately twenty years ago by the council. I hope to have more information as the day progresses. 
Any chance I could have a quick peek inside the tent? Glenn Branson gave Roy a quizzical look. I'm afraid not at this stage, Grace replied. Is there a coroner's officer attending? You mean there's something you don't know? Glenn teased her. She grinned back. Yes, I am just a rookie, sir. Philip Key is on his way, but I don't think he'll have anything for you. I think you're going to have to wait for the press conference. She shrugged. OK, I'll just hang around for a while if it's OK with you guys. It's a public park, Glenn said. Feel free. But I tell you what, if I wanted a good story, I'd go and doorstep Norman Cook. Ask Fatboy Slim how our local rock star feels having a crime scene outside his cafe. Her face lit up. You're right. That's exactly what I'll do. Thank you. Let me know if you need an agent, Glenn replied. My terms are very reasonable. She turned back to Roy Grace. Separately, is there any news on the MISPA from last night? Logan Somerville? Operation Haywayne? Grace stared at her, momentarily thrown by her knowledge. Her predecessor had been fired from the Argus for illegal phone tapping after constantly coming up with information the police had not yet released. Was she doing the same now? Or did she have a source within the police? He had just come from the first briefing and was due to head over to the car park where Logan Somerville had apparently disappeared as soon as he had checked out the situation here. He was guarded in his reply. What information do you have? he asked her. I heard she'd broken off her engagement with her boyfriend recently. Does that make her disappearance suspicious? I understand there is a manhunt underway. Grace clocked that piece of information about the engagement to his memory bank. We're in the process of gathering information at this point, he said. The press office will be able to update you later this morning, but so you know, we have every available officer and PCSO out looking for Ms. Somerville, and they've been looking through the night. Thank you, Detective Superintendent. I have your mobile number, Glenn Branson said. I'll call you if there are any developments. She thanked him and headed off across the lagoon. As they ducked under the tape, they were greeted by Dave Green, also fully suited in protective clothing. How's it going? Grace asked. We found a cigarette butt with the remains, he said. I'm sending it off for analysis, but that's all I'm sending so far. As they sat down inside the changing room tent, and pulled on their protective oversuits, Grace said to Branson, Are you a bit sweet on that Argus reporter? Just trying to cultivate the local press? Like you always taught me. He gave him a mischievous grin. There's a big difference between cultivate and shag, mate. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot more vowels in cultivate. Just don't go there, Grace said. I'm serious. If you're ambitious, keep the press at arm's length. Not at Dick's length. Also, think about your kids. It's not that long since their mother died. Yeah, but plenty long enough since she kicked me out and brought in a new bloke as their substitute dad, Branson said grimly. The D.I., struggling to pull his suit over his hips, gave his friend a sideways glance. You've recently married one of the most beautiful women on the planet. I never put you down for someone with penis envy. I sod you. You've got to admit, Siobhan's well tasty. So was the apple on the tree in Genesis. Chapter 19 Friday the 12th of December Dr Edward Crisp was a short, toned man with a bald dome and neat, greying hair at his temples. He wore fashionably modern glasses that were too big for his face, giving him a quizzical expression as if he were peering out at the world through goggles. A fastidious dresser, he was attired today in a handmade charcoal suit from Brighton Society tailor Gresham Blake, a pale blue shirt and a pink silk tie, both from German Street, and shiny black Chelsea boots from Crockett and Jones in London's Burlington Arcade. His scruffy black and white dog Smut, which most of his patients were fond of, slept beside his desk on a cushion inside a wire-framed basket. Although the modern trend for family doctors was to work with a group in a medical centre, he preferred to work alone, in the same office he had occupied for over twenty-five years. It was a spacious, imposing consulting room on the ground floor of a rather ugly Victorian terrace close to Church Road in Hove, with a tiny adjoining room for his secretary, Jenny Acton. She was fifty-seven, unmarried, and had worked for him with slavish devotion for twenty years. 
The room, as did his immaculate outfit, reflected his particular passion for neatness and order. His qualifications hung in a row, uniformly framed and uniformly impressive. In addition to being a general practitioner, he held qualifications in immunology from the Pasteur Institute in Paris, homeopathy, Chinese medicine and acupuncture, as well as being a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons. He had, in fact, qualified as a surgeon before deciding that working as a family doctor with an exclusive private practice suited him better. And his legion of private patients were glad about that, because he was widely liked and popular, to the extent that his list had been closed for many years, and he would only take on new patients by very special criteria. One such new patient, Freya Northrop, perched nervously on the edge of one of the two oak and leather chairs in front of his tidy leather-top desk, while he talked, very charmingly and calmly, to someone called Maxine on the other end of the phone. She was clearly distressed about her mother, who sounded, from what Freya could glean, terminally ill and in her last weeks. The only clue about the doctor's private life was a silver frame on his desk containing a posed studio photograph of an attractive brunette in her mid-forties with mirror-image beautiful teenage daughters on either side against a sky-blue background. All of them were laughing at some joke cracked, presumably, by the professional photographer. While he continued talking, making a promise to try to get the woman's mother admitted into the Martlet's hospice, Freya Northrop stared around the room. Most doctor's offices she had been in before were pretty nondescript, but this one was really rather grand, and it had more the feel of museum than a workplace. The wall, just to her left, displayed photographs and portraits of great medical pioneers, one she recognised as Alexander Fleming, the discoverer of penicillin, and another, the pioneer of X-rays, Marie Curie, with all their names and brief bios in small frames at their bases. Further along was a row of framed copies of Leonardo da Vinci's anatomical drawings. There was a display case full of model human skulls. Next to them, and standing tall and proud as if presiding over the room, was a human skeleton on a plinth. It partially blocked the view from the office's one window, with Venetian blinds that were open, looking out onto a parking area at the rear of the building. The doctor made a note on a pad on his desk with a black Monte Grappa pen, then typed something on his computer, all the time continuing to try to reassure the woman called Maxine on the other end. There were several busts on plinths around the room, adding to the museum-like feel. Freya gazed at one a man with a curiously elliptical-shaped bald dome and a beard that looked like flames. First, do no harm. The doctor's tone had changed. Startled, Freya looked around and saw he had his hand cupped over the mouthpiece of the phone and was addressing her with an almost childlike twinkle of humour. Do no harm, she replied. Hippocrates, the fellow you're looking at. Bit of a wise old owl, the Hippocratic Oath all medics around the world take, swearing to practice medicine honestly, and all sorts of related stuff. Actually, it wasn't Hippocrates who said do no harm, it was a nineteenth-century surgeon, Thomas Inman. Oh, won't keep you a second, he pointed at the phone. I have a very worried and upset lady, just need to wait for her to speak to her mother. Yes, Hippocrates. The doctor while he continued with his phone call, was studying this new young patient in front of him. Conservatively dressed, in her twenties, she had a classically beautiful face with deep brown eyes framed by long hair parted down the centre. She reminded him of the actress Julie Christie, whom he'd had the hots for when he had been a teenager. She reminded him of someone else too, but that was painful, and he pushed the memory aside. Finally, ending the call, he gave her a broad smile. So, I haven't seen you before, have I? He glanced at her name on the computer screen, having to make a real effort to focus. Freya? No, I've not come to you before, Freya Northrop said. Interesting name, Northrop. Hmm. Northrop Fry. Ever read him? She shook her head blankly. Wonderful literary critic. Wrote some brilliant essays on T.S. Eliot. Really helped raise his profile. Milton's, too, especially Paradise Lost. Ah, she said, equally blankly. His first name was Herman. Ah, she said again, a little disconcerted by the curious conversation. Her best friend, Olivia Harper, had said that Crisp was a wonderful doctor, and so jolly. 
but he seemed more odd than jolly to her. She felt as if she was irritating him with her ignorance. T.S. Eliot, I've heard of him. The Waste Land? Okay, right. You know the poem? I don't, no. Edward Crisp's mind went back to last night, walking smut across Hove Lagoon. You could walk dogs along Brighton and Hove seafront in winter without them having to be on a lead, and sometimes, in the evening, when it was dark enough, he could let smut his white mongrel with a black spot either side of her tummy, who he'd acquired as a rescue dog ten years ago, shit anywhere she liked without having to stoop and pick up the mess with a plastic bag, or, like some cretinous dog people, with a pooper scooper. He was thinking about that terrible image of the skeleton, lying exposed in a ragged hole in the path. He could not get her out of his mind. The wasteland? The young patient's words jolted him back to reality. I grow old, he said. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Freya Northrop frowned. The love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, he said, and beamed. But enough of that. I'm sorry if I'm not totally with it today. I saw a terrible thing last night, and I'm a bit upset. I'm a doctor. I try to make people better. I couldn't help that poor woman. But that's enough about me. Let's talk about you. Tell me why you're here. Olivia Harper recommended you. I've just moved to Brighton, from London. Ah, yes, indeed. What a lovely lady Olivia is. Quite a delight. Yes, of course. Forgive me, I'm very discombobulated this morning. But of course you don't want to hear that. Tell me what brings you here. He smiled, his eyes suddenly alive and twinkling with humour. He held his elegant black pen up in front of him and stared at her, as if through it. Well, she said, I don't feel ill or anything. Of course not. Why would you want to see a doctor if you were feeling ill, eh? He grinned, and it was infectious. She grinned back, relaxing a tad. Totally, she replied. Why would anyone? Exactly. I only like to see patients who are feeling well. Who needs sick patients? They take up far too much time, and they reflect badly on me. He tapped his chest. Always come and see me any time you are feeling well. Yes? She laughed. It's a deal. Right. Well, nice to meet you, Freya. He feigned standing up to say goodbye, then sat down again, chuckling. So, tell me. Now she got him. Well, she said, I met this guy. That's why I've moved down here. I've been off the pill for a while, but I'd like to go back on it again. There was a long silence. He peered at her, and his demeanour seemed to have stiffened, and suddenly she felt a chill of unease. Had she touched some kind of nerve in him? Then he smiled, a big, warm, friendly beam that lit up his entire countenance. The pill? That's all? Yes, she said. You're planning to have sex with this guy? Well... We are already having sex, but... He raised his hands in the air. Beware! Too much information. You want the pill? I'm your dealer. No problem. You are a very delightful young lady. Anything you want, just come and see me. So, OK, let me take some details about you. Then I'll give you a check-up. Tell me first some of your medical history. She recounted, as best she could recall, her appendectomy at the age of thirteen, her broken shoulder from snowboarding at sixteen, her chlamydia at eighteen, and, blushing her recurring thrush more recently. He tapped it all into his computer, seeming to take a particular delight, unless she was mistaken, in her venereal disease history. He then directed her behind the screen to remove her clothes. While Freya Northrop was undressing, he tapped notes into his computer. Then he stared across the room at the green screen. He twisted the barrel of his pen so that the rollerball tip appeared, then retracted again. That body in the lagoon was really playing on his mind. I'm ready, Freya said. He continued to stare at the tip of his pen. Freya Northrop, he said, almost silently to himself. He liked her name. Nice lady. He liked her. Bye for now, he said a little while later as she left. He liked everyone to leave him with a smile. Chapter 20 Friday the 12th of December 
The forensic archaeologist, Lucy Sibbon, was a professional-looking woman in her early forties, with neat brown hair and square, modern glasses. She was accompanied by two juniors, here to learn from this rare scene. At this moment she was on her knees, studying the remains intently. Most of her face was hidden behind a gauze mask secured by tapes, and the rest of her slim figure was parceled unflatteringly in a baggy white crime scene oversuit and clumsy-looking overshoes. It was just past 10 a.m. Under the watchful eyes of the similarly suited forensic pathologist, Nadiuska de Sancho, the coroner's officer, Philip Key, and crime scene photographer, James Gartrell, the whole skeleton had now been exposed. It lay, facing up at the bright, jury-rigged overhead lights from its jagged-edged shallow grave. There were fragments of fabric and mouldy dark stiletto-heeled shoes lying by the foot bones, which would appear to confirm the assertion by the doctor, who had appeared out of the blue last night walking his dog, that it was female. The most immediate question Roy Grace had for Lucy Sibbon was the age of the remains. A key factor in a discovery like this would always be how long the remains had been here. Was this sufficiently recent that the offender or immediate relatives might still be alive, or were these the bones of someone who had died so long ago that anyone connected would now be long dead? in which case a homicide inquiry would be much more challenging. He turned for guidance to the archaeologist. She was shaking her head, looking angry. Why didn't the workmen stop last night the moment they saw the bones, Roy? By carrying on, they could have destroyed crucial evidence for us. So you think this might be relatively recent? No. The path was laid around twenty years ago. I'm speculating that whoever killed this woman was aware the path was going to be laid and buried her a short while before, knowing she would be covered. The remains must predate the laying of this path, just like the Mafia reputedly bury bodies beneath motorways under construction. Maybe it was even one of the workmen who laid the path. One thing I'm pretty sure about, this is the deposition site. But I don't think it was the murder scene. The body has been dug up and reburied. Why do you think that? The archaeologist pointed at several barely visible marks on the bones. I think these were made by a tool like a spade. She was buried somewhere else, in a temporary grave. Then she was dug up, clumsily, probably by someone nervous and in a hurry, who nicked her bones in several places during the process. Grace had a lot of respect for this woman's expertise, which had been proven to him on several previous occasions. Anything else that makes you think that, Lucy? Yes. Although this path was laid twenty years ago, I think she's been dead for closer to thirty years. For starters, the shoes are a good indicator. I had a pair like these in my teens, but let's ignore them for the moment and focus on the human remains. She pointed at a small bone fragment suspended from a tiny strip of desiccated skin. See that U-shaped bone? It's the one that keeps the tongue in place. It's often an indicator of the cause of death— the hyoid often gets broken during strangulation, but it's intact here. There are a number of indicators that this was a woman aged about twenty. There is little wear on the teeth, but wisdom teeth present. The pelvis shows auricular surface phase one and pubic symphysis phase one. Grace tried to follow where she was pointing. See the wide sciatic notch, triangular-shaped obdurator foramen, the long pubic bone and the wide subpubic angle, the subpubic concavity? He nodded, although he did not fully understand. Then she pointed at the skull, which was partially on its side. Less prominent supraorbital ridges, sharp superior orbit, more upright frontal bone, small mastoid process, small rounded nuchal crest. It's definitely female. There's a lot of water under here. If she had been buried ten years before the surface was laid, I think she would have risen towards the surface and it would have been noticed by the original workman. I've already tasked an officer with finding out who laid the path and to see if any of the council workmen are still around. It's quite possible they are. Do you have anything that might tell us who she is, was? Glenn Branson asked. Lucy Sibbon pointed at the jaw. There's a deciduous tooth and several fillings that could give us dental identification if she was local, she said. DNA's a possibility. She looked up at Nadiuska de Sancha. There might be more you could get from a full post-mortem. As the strong wind shook the tenting above them, the pathologist nodded and turned to Roy Grace, then to the coroner's officer. Yes, I think that would be best. 
Can we recover the remains to the mortuary, please? I have to go, Grace said. I'll leave D.I. Branson here. He went back to the CSI tent and pulled off his protective clothing, then hurried towards his car. Before driving off, he sat and made more notes. Dental records were a possible method of identification, with a big but. There were thousands of dentists throughout the UK, but unlike fingerprints or DNA, there was not, as yet, a central dental records database. You needed to have an idea who someone might be, and know who that person's dentist was. And if she was from overseas, there was no chance at all. DNA wasn't a great prospect either. Going back twenty or so years, it was highly unlikely, even if she had been arrested for an offence, that her DNA would have been taken and logged. If it was thirty years ago that she had died, there was no chance of DNA. Their best hope, he decided, would be the lengthy process of a trawl through all the female missing persons within the time frame that Lucy Sibbon estimated. To be on the safe side, that would entail checking all female mispers aged 15 to 30 from 15 to 35 years ago. There were many thousands of people on the current missing persons register of people who had been gone for over 30 days. It would be a massive task, and the only way would be to start local. Assuming the remains were of a local person. He started the car and headed off towards Kemptown to the apartment building underground car park from where Logan Somerville had disappeared. Chapter 21 Friday the 12th of December How long? How long are you going to keep me here? How long, whoever the hell you are? Let me go! Logan shouted out into the green-tinged darkness. I need sugar! I need water, please. The sheer terror of her situation had made her forget about her toe until now. It was throbbing painfully. The restraints across her stomach, wrists, thighs and legs felt as if they were cutting into her flesh. Her right leg was cramping and she desperately needed to stretch it. But she could not move. She tried again to lift her head, but immediately something cut into her neck, choking her. Her mouth was dry and her lips were sticking together, but her body was clammy. She recognised the signals that she was desperately low on sugar. Soon she would have a hypo and pass out. Who had screamed earlier? Was there someone else in this place with her? Anger had momentarily replaced the deep, sick sensation of fear inside her. How long had she been here? Wherever here was, was it Jamie doing this? What was he going to do? Keep her here until she agreed to marry him, after all. That sure as hell would be a great start to a life together. Yeah, she broke it off, so I drugged her and locked her in a cellar and starved her and refused to give her any sugar or let her pee until she agreed to marry me. Two weeks till Christmas. Two crucial weeks for her, for Christ's sake. She was really starting to contribute to the clinic's profits, and being able to put aside a little money to top up her savings would allow her to buy a small property for herself after she and Jamie parted. But every day counted. She had no idea of the time, nor how long she had been here. It was her mother's birthday today, if today was Friday, and she had planned to call her in advance of driving this weekend to see her parents. Compared to her previous boyfriend, who was serially unfaithful, Logan had found Jamie, initially, a breath of fresh air. He was kind and gentle, a good cook, and she liked his humour. It had only been as she got to know him better that she began to understand quite how limited Jamie was. In the first few months of dating, they did everything together. Drinks, meals, walks, movies, watching stuff on television. It was very gradually and subtly that she began to realise he really didn't have many interests of his own, beyond watching sport on television and occasionally going to the Amex Stadium to watch Brighton and Hove Albion home games. He was like a chameleon fitting into her life by adopting everything that she liked to do. Last year, when she had begun training for the Brighton Marathon, he took up running for a short time to train with her. She loved road cycling, so he bought a fancy road bike himself to accompany her. In those early days, she'd been all for it. It was nice to have companionship. Not many of her friends were that sporty. But gradually, she had started to miss her solitude. 
A big irritation had been three months ago when she had joined a book group and immediately, although he rarely read books except genre thrillers, he asked to join too. After the first meeting, at which he'd insulted everyone present by calling them pretentious knobs, he'd abandoned the idea. He had taken it hard and been tearful when she told him she had decided she did not want to marry him and they should go their separate ways. But never in her wildest dreams did she imagine he would do this to her, kidnap her and keep her prisoner. If it was him. It had to be him, surely. Jamie was not a violent or cruel person. It didn't make any sense. Was there something deeper in his character she had missed? Was he going to keep her down here until she agreed to marry him? She saw a light moving, a faint green glow, coming closer. Jamie, she said. Jamie, please, let's talk. She heard something sliding above her head. Then a beam shone directly in her eyes, momentarily dazzling her. The beam moved away for a moment. Someone was standing right above her, their face obscured by what looked like a gimp mask. Then she felt something pressed against her lips, something sweet. She tasted honey and gulped it down. Then two capsules were placed in her mouth, followed by water from a plastic cup. She heard the sliding sound again above her, then muffled footsteps receding. As the sound faded, she had a ghastly thought and a terrible slick of fear slid through her. Was she being illogical in her thinking? What if it was not Jamie? Where did the man in the car park fit in? Were they working together? What if this was a total random stranger? Chapter 22 Friday the 12th of December Jacob Van Damme, seated behind his desk in his Harley Street consulting room, peered like a wise owl through small, round, tortoiseshell spectacles. A diminutive figure, with large patches of liver spots across the top of his head and on the backs of his bony hands, the psychiatrist was dressed in a grey pinstriped suit that seemed a size too big for him, as if he had shrunk in the years since having it made, and his collar, knotted with a club tie of some kind, hung around the loose, wrinkled flanges of his turkey-like neck. During many years of practising forensic psychiatry, dealing with a wide range of violent criminals, he had been assaulted on a number of occasions, and these days preferred to keep the barrier of his desk in front of him, for safety. At seventy-seven, he was long past the age at which he could have retired, but he loved his work far too much to ever consider that. Besides, what the hell would he do if he did retire? He had no hobbies. His work had always been his life. He held an endless fascination with human nature, which he saw daily with his patients. The walls around him were lined with books on medicine and on human behaviour, quite a few of them bearing his name on the spine. His published works, lined along one shelf, included a book on why the public had adored Princess Diana, and another which was considered the definitive analysis of the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, who had been convicted of murdering thirteen women. Further along were the three volumes of which he was most proud, which came out of his time working as a psychiatrist within the high-security psychiatric hospital Broadmoor, where one of the criteria to be an inmate was to be diagnosed criminally insane. What had always intrigued him from his earliest student days was the whole notion of evil. Were some human beings born evil, or did something happen to turn them evil? And first, of course, you had to define evil. That was the topic he had explored in these three volumes, without coming to a conclusion. In forty-seven years in psychiatry, he had not yet found definitively any of these answers. He was still looking for them, which was why he still came here every weekday morning and saw patients until the early evening, thanks in part to the understanding of his beloved wife, Rachel. He was writing up his notes on the patient who had just departed from his office, an actor almost as old as himself who was unable to cope with the fact that women no longer threw themselves at him, when his secretary buzzed to announce that his next patient had arrived, Dr. Harrison Hunter. 
Hastily, he looked up the man's name and the referral letter from his family GP, a Dr. Edward Crisp, in Brighton. The letter was short and terse, and the first referral he'd ever had from this doctor. Harrison Hunter was suffering from anxiety, with frequent panic attacks, and Dr. Crisp believed him to be delusional. Van Damme pressed his intercom button and asked his secretary to show him in. Instantly, for reasons the psychiatrist could not immediately define, this new patient simultaneously both excited and intrigued him, but also sent a wintry chill through his bones. Van Damme stood up to shake his hand, then ushered him to sit on one of the two hard, leather-cushioned antique chairs in front of his desk. For a moment they were forced into silence, as an emergency vehicle siren screeched by outside. As the siren faded, the only sound for some moments was the hiss of the gas fire in the grate. Harrison Hunter's body language was extremely awkward. Fifty-five years old, according to the referral note, he looked pleasant enough, conservatively dressed, in an off-the-peg business suit, dull shirt and clumsily knotted tie, tinted aviator glasses, and sporting a mop of floppy blonde hair, rather like the style of the politician Boris Johnson. The hair did not match the man's eyebrows, and he wondered if perhaps it was a wig. His new patient moved his hands from his thighs to his knees, scratched both of his cheeks, then the tips of his ears, then patted his thighs and shrugged. So, how are you hoping I can help you, Dr. Hunter? May I call you Harrison? the psychiatrist asked. It was his customary opening line for his first consultation with any new patient. He glanced briefly down at his notes, then, placing his elbows on his desk, he steepled his hands, rested his chin on them, and leaned forward. Harrison is fine. Good. Are you a doctor of medicine? I'm an anaesthetist, but a rather unusual one. Hunter smiled. He had a dry, slightly high-pitched voice that sounded distinctly neurotic. They were both forced into silence as another siren screamed past, followed by a third. When it faded, the psychiatrist asked, Would you like to tell me in what way you consider yourself to be unusual? I like to kill people. Van Damme stared at him with an expressionless poker face. Anaesthetists could occasionally be quite spiky, believing their role was as important as the surgeon's, yet they were getting paid less. He'd had one tell him that it was the anaesthetist who held the power of life over death in the operating theatre and who described surgeons dismissively as nothing more than butchers, plumbers and seamstresses. He had heard most things during his career and patients often said things calculated to shock him. He remained silent, studying the man's face and body language, then looked straight into the man's eyes. Dead eyes that gave nothing away. He held his silence. Silence was always one of his strongest tactics for encouraging people to talk. It worked. The thing is, you see, Harrison said, I work in a busy teaching hospital and I'm expected to lose an average of eight to nine patients a year through adverse reactions to the surgery or anaesthetics from syndromes such as malignant hypothermia. I'm sure you're well aware of the dangers of anaesthesia. Van Damme continued to fixate on him. Yes, very aware. The anaesthetist finally cast his eyes down for some moments. Every now and then, I kill an extra one. And sometimes two each year. For fun. For fun? Yes. How does this make you feel? Happy. Satisfied. Fulfilled. And this is fun. Would you like to tell me about the kind of fun you experience when you kill someone? Harrison Hunter balled his fists and raised them in the air. Power, Dr. Van Damme, it's my power over them. It's an incredible feeling. There isn't any greater power a human being can have than taking the life of another, is there? Not such fun for your patients, though. People get what they deserve, don't they? Karma. Some of your patients deserve to be killed. This is what I need to talk to you about. It's why I'm here. Are you a religious man, Dr. Van Damme, or a Darwinian? The psychiatrist stared back at him in silence for some moments, blinking. 
another emergency service siren dopplered past. Heading to a crime scene, one of this strange man's victims. He picked up his pen and held it with the forefinger and thumb of each hand, focusing on the black barrel and silver cap for some moments. This consultation is about you, Harrison, not about me and the views I hold. I'm here for you. And before we go any further, I must remind you that I am bound by the requirements of the General Medical Council. I'm not bound to protect a patient's confidentiality if I believe him or her to be a danger to society these days. The reverse is, in fact, the case. I am duty-bound to report that person. So, from what you are telling me, I am duty-bound to inform the police about you. But first, Dr. Van Damme, you would have to get out of your office alive. Yes? Van Damme smiled back at him. He tried not to show his discomfort, but there was something intensely creepy about this man, although at the same time fascinating. He exuded a deeply troubled darkness. On occasions in his past, working at Broadmoor, he had encountered similarly disturbing people, but he could not remember the last time he had felt himself in the presence of such feral evil. Dr. Crisp had written that his patient was delusional. Was this one of his delusions? True, Harrison, he replied, with a half-hearted laugh. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. You are not going to go to the police, Dr. Van Damme. Firstly, I think you would hate to lose me as a patient. And secondly, I sense that, although the law has changed, you don't agree with the change. You're a pretty old-fashioned guy with old-fashioned views about the sacrosanct right of confidentiality between a doctor and patient. I read a paper you published in The Lancet over a decade ago. You put forward a very cogent argument for maintaining it. I wrote that a doctor should not be under a legal obligation, only a moral one. But. Let's talk more about you. Why are you here? What are you expecting from me? How are you hoping I might be able to help you? His patient looked at him with a curious expression. It felt to the psychiatrist that the man was staring right through his soul. I need to cope with my guilt. A number of thoughts went through the psychiatrist's mind. People did die every year from allergic reactions to anaesthetics, a tiny percentage of all those who had operations. It was a tragic fact that every anaesthetist would lose a few patients over the course of his career. Was this simply Harrison Hunter's way of coping with his guilt? To confess to killing them deliberately? Or was Hunter a fantasist? Or was he, as he said, really a killer? The psychiatrist decided to humour him. I'm not sure I believe what you told me about you killing people deliberately, Van Damme said. When you qualified as a doctor of medicine, surely you agreed to be bound by the basic ethics of medicine. Do no harm. So tell me, why are you really here? I've just told you. He was silent for some moments. Then he said, there's... A local newspaper published in the Brighton area called The Argus. Take a look online later. You'll see a story about skeletal remains of a woman discovered yesterday in a small park close to the seafront called Hove Lagoon. Why do you want me to look at this story? Because I know who killed her and why. The psychiatrist studied him for some moments, watching his chaotic body language. Then he said... Have you told the police? No, I haven't. Why not? Because, Dr. Van Damme, you and I need each other. Do we? Can you explain that to me? There's another story in the Argus today. It didn't make the printed edition this morning, but you'll be able to read it online. You have a niece, Logan Somerville. Van Damme stiffened visibly. What about her? Are you very fond of her? I don't discuss my private life with my patients. What does my niece have to do with this? 
You haven't heard, have you? Heard what? About Logan. She disappeared last night. Van Damme blanched. Disappeared? There's a manhunt going on all over Brighton for her. For your niece, Logan Somerville. You need me very badly. Why is that? Because I'm the only person who may be able to save her life. Chapter 23 Friday the 12th of December Roy Grace pulled up outside the Chesham Gate apartment building, behind a white crime scene investigation van, a marked police car, and two unmarked police vehicles. A short way along, the silver specialist search unit van was straddling the curb in order not to block the narrow street. A small knot of curious onlookers was standing around watching, and a youth was taking pictures with his phone. On his way here from the lagoon, he'd had an idea for the brief but very emotional speech he had to make on Monday at Bella's funeral. He jotted it down, then he climbed out into the cold, blustery wind. Fluttering crime scene tape sealed off the entrance to the car park. The gates were open, and a PSCO scene guard stood in front with a clipboard. She directed Roy Grace to the van to suit up. He entered and shared some banter with two search officers, the highly experienced pulser, Sergeant Lorna Dennison Wilkins, and a recent recruit to her team, Scott, he had not met before, who were having a coffee break. As he wormed his way into a protective oversuit for the second time this morning, he asked Lorna what was happening and where the crime scene manager, John Morgan, was. Lots of pissed off residents who can't get their cars out, sir, and another bunch who can't get their cars in. You might like to have a word with some of them. John Morgan's in a stroppy mood this morning, and not being at his most diplomatic. Morgan was good at his job, but not always known for his tact. Protection of a crime scene was vital to prevent contamination, but when it inconvenienced the public, as was often the case, it required a delicate hand to explain the reasons. Mostly the public were understanding and helpful, but some were anything but. Those who hated the police, and those who were just plain selfish or bloody-minded. He signed the scene log and walked down the ramp into the underground car park in his clumsy, ungainly, protective blue oversuit and shoes. A wide variety of cars were parked in the bays, including several sleek shapes beneath covers. There was a sharp, dry smell of engine oil, paintwork and dust. Several search officers, similarly clad, were on their hands and knees, shoulder to shoulder inside a taped-off area. Further along, he saw another officer from the unit on top of the SSU's portable scaffolding tower, checking behind a roof light fitting. The stocky figure of John Morgan appeared from around a corner and greeted him with a surly but polite, Morning, boss. What do you have, John? The crime scene manager shook his head. Something that might be of interest. A footprint in a patch of engine oil. He led Grace over to an empty parking bay next to where the Fiat had been parked, where there was a small pool of black sludge on the ground. Looks like a male because of the size. There are several weaker prints heading across towards the far end of the car park, but that's it. Then he pointed up at a CCTV camera. If that had been working, we might have got a lot more that could be useful. Accompanied by Morgan, Grace walked around the entire car park, noting the fire escapes, the lift, and the main steps up beside it. Plenty of ways in which someone could enter pretty much unnoticed, except by cameras. Then the caretaker took them to the couple's flat, where Grace had met the boyfriend last night. Morgan told Grace that Logan Somerville's laptop and mobile phone had been taken across to the high-tech crime unit for a high-priority examination. In particular, they'd be looking at recent calls, her emails, and social networking sites to see if there were any clues to her disappearance there. The boyfriend was lined up for a 1pm appeal on the local news with Grace. Meanwhile, the police CCTV camera footage around the city was being examined for any sightings of Logan Somerville or the estate car that had been seen in the area. The good news was that most of the MISPAs reported annually in the UK turned up within a few days, and there was always a raft of different explanations for their absence. Was Logan Somerville going to turn up within a few days? with a perfectly plausible explanation for her absence. He had a bad feeling about this particular young woman. 
the report by her fiancé of her screaming, the vehicle coming out of the underground car park at high speed around the same time. Despite Jamie Ball's alibi that would appear to eliminate him from suspicion, Roy Grace was not happy about this man. No one at this stage would be eliminated entirely. He'd be in a better position to decide on the young man after he'd been interviewed, and in particular, after his performance at the televised appeal later. Would he be shedding real or crocodile tears? He looked at a photograph of the pair in cycling outfits, then at another of them lying on a beach. A young, attractive, happy-looking couple, like a thousand other young lovers, seemingly without a care in the world. Except, in his jaded cynicism, he didn't believe there were many people who genuinely could say they didn't have a care in the world. Everyone had some kind of a problem they had to deal with. His phone rang. He answered it, looking down at the signal on the display which showed just one dot. Roy Grace. It was Glenn Branson, his voice crackly, sounding excited. Hey, boss, are you very tied up for half an hour? We're at the mortuary. There's something I think you should see. Grace looked at the time on his phone. 10.55 a.m. At midday, he was due to attend a meeting with ACC Cassie and Pugh to brief him on Logan Somerville. He needed to prepare for it and ensure that there was no missing persons procedure he had missed out that Pew could trip him up on. And he wanted to be in time for the 1pm appeal, as well as to observe the interview due to be taking place later with Logan's fiancée. But he could watch the recording if he missed it. I'll be over as soon as I've finished here. Chapter 24 Friday the 12th of December Jacob Van Dam and his patient stared at each other across what felt to the psychiatrist a dark void. Just who the hell was this creepy fellow, and what was going on inside his head? May I take a moment to verify your story about my niece, Dr. Hunter? Be my guest, provided I can see what you're doing. The psychiatrist turned his computer screen sideways so that Harrison Hunter could see it. The Argus Online, you said? Hunter nodded. Van Damme opened Google, then typed in the words Brighton Argus Online. Moments later, the Argus homepage appeared, and he saw the headline. Abduction fears over missing woman. Both men read the story printed below. Logan Somerville, 24, of Chesham Gate, Kemptown, has not been seen since she left the chiropractic life clinic premises in Portland Road, Hove, where she worked at 5.15pm yesterday afternoon. Her fiancé, Jamie Ball, 28, a marketing manager, reported to police that she had phoned him, concerned about a stranger in the underground car park of the apartment building where they live, at around 5.30pm yesterday, which was the last communication from her. Her car was subsequently found in the car park. A police spokesperson said that her disappearance is being treated as a possible abduction, and Detective Superintendent Roy Grace of Surrey and Sussex Major Crime Team is in charge of the investigation, Operation Haywain. A television broadcast by her fiancé is being made at 1pm today, which will be followed by a press conference, at which more details will be given. Police are appealing for anyone who might have seen anything suspicious in the vicinity or a dark-coloured estate car possibly an older model Volvo, being driven erratically or at high speed around that time. The driver is described as male, middle-aged, clean-shaven, wearing glasses. The psychiatrist was visibly shaking as he looked back at his patient. You know where she is, he said. I didn't say that. I said I'm the only person who may be able to save her life. What do you need? the psychiatrist said sternly. Money? How much money? This is not about money. Then what is it about? Harrison Hunter stood up abruptly. I have to go now. Wait, Van Damme said. You can't go now, for God's sake. Tell me where she is. What's happened to her? Who is she with? Has she been hurt? But his patient had already reached the door. As he opened it, Hunter turned and said, Don't go to the police, Dr. Van Damme. If you do, You'll never see her again. I can help you. You'll have to trust me on that. Please, how exactly are you going to help me, Dr. Hunter? By you helping me. The door closed behind him. 
Wait! Van Damme shouted, pulling the door open. But the man had gone past his secretary and out of the far door. As Van Damme reached it, he could hear the man's footsteps heading down the stairs. He stumbled down after him, but long before he reached the front door, calling out, Please, wait! He heard it slam. He returned to his office, out of breath, looked at the phone number on Crisp's referral letter and dialed it. After a few rings, it was answered by a cheery recorded voice. Hello, this is Dr. Crisp's surgery. Please leave a message and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. Bye for now. Chapter 25 Friday the 12th of December Deep in thought, Roy Grace drove around the Lewis Road gyratory system. It was coming up to 11.15am, around 18 hours since Logan Somerville had vanished. If she had been taken, as he feared, rather than simply gone of her own volition, then with each passing hour the chances of finding her alive diminished. That had long been his grim experience. But he was curious about why Glenn Branson wanted him to come over so urgently. He turned left, in past the wrought iron gates attached to brick pillars, and the sign in gold letters on a black background which said Brighton and Hove City Mortuary. He was confronted with death constantly in his work, and whilst crime scenes and deposition sites often yielded vital clues for inquiries, the mortuary, combined with the associated pathology and DNA labs, had become, in many ways, the crucible of murder investigations. Whilst he preferred not to dwell too much on his own mortality, this place always made him think of it. Not many people, other than tragic suicide victims, actually expected to end up here, and he wondered just how many of those, even, had really wanted to be spending the night in a cold refrigerator, rather than in their beds. He'd interviewed a number of survivors from suicide attempts over the years, and a high percentage of them had told him, and colleagues, that they were grateful to have failed and to still be alive. This was something that had been backed up by a recent conversation he'd had with a police sergeant who was a regular crew member of the police helicopter. Part of her duty was to do a weekly check while flying along near the bottom of Beachy Head. The beauty spot, a chalk headland a few miles to the east of Brighton, had a dark side to it. With its 531-foot sheer drop onto rocks at the edge of the English Channel, it was a notorious suicide spot, claiming victims most weeks of the year and vied with California's Golden Gate Bridge and Japan's Aokagara Woods for the dubious status of the world's most popular suicide destination. There was a permanently manned chaplaincy post there to help to try to talk desperate people around. The sergeant had told him that a significant number of victims they recovered from the bottom of the cliffs had chalk under their fingernails, indicating horrifically that they must have changed their minds on the way down. Every sudden death that Roy Grace encountered, whether an accident, suicide or murder, affected him. Death was something that everyone liked to believe happened to other people, other, less fortunate people. Not many people set out to become victims, and this place haunted him with its sadness. He and Sandy had had no children. If he had died during the time they had been together, Sandy would have coped fine. She was a strong person. Cleo would cope too, if anything ever happened to him. Her family were comfortably off, and, additionally, he'd made life assurance provisions for her, and for Noah. But the recent birth of his son had made him think about his death in a way that he never had before. Cleo would always be a brilliant mother to Noah, but as a young, very beautiful woman, she would almost certainly marry again one day. And that person would then become Noah's father a total stranger. It was an odd thought to be having, he knew, but now that he was a father, he valued life more than ever before. He wanted to be around for his son, to be a good father to him, the way his own father, Jack Grace, had been there for him, to try to help prepare him for the world out there, a world that was rich and beautiful, but constantly lay in the shadow of evil. Even though he had some good associations with the mortuary, it was where he had met Cleo after all, the place still made him deeply uneasy, as it did most people who came here, and that included police officers. The gates here were always open, 24-7, always ready to receive the newly dead, 
and, like the skeletal remains of the as yet unknown woman at the lagoon, sometimes the long-term dead. Roy Grace always felt that the blandness of the exterior of the building, which looked like a suburban bungalow, added a curiously stark contrast to the grim tasks that were performed inside it. It was a long, single-story structure, with grey pebble dash rendering on the walls, overlooked by a row of houses, and with a covered drive-in on one side deep enough to accommodate an ambulance or a large van. On the other side was a huge opaque window and a small, very domestic-looking front door. He drove past a line of cars parked against a flint wall at the rear and halted in the visitor's parking area. Then he walked around to the front door and rang the bell. It was answered by Darren Wallace, in Cleo's absence, the acting senior anatomical pathology technician. He was in his early twenties, with fashionably spiky dark hair, and dressed in blue scrubs with a green plastic apron and white boots. He greeted the detective superintendent and led him through into the changing room. As he gowned up, Roy wrinkled his nose, trying not to breathe in the all-too-familiar smell of the place, a combination of Jay's fluid, trigene disinfectant and decaying human bodies, a smell that stayed with you long after you left, as did the feeling of cold from the chilled air. Then he went through into the post-mortem room itself, and all the smells became stronger, and the air even colder. The room was divided into two working areas, separated by an open archway, the walls lined with grey tiles and with stark overhead lighting. There was a wide, tall fridge with a row of numbered doors accessing it. Behind each of them, four bodies could be stacked one above the other. The spaces that were occupied were indicated by a buff handwritten tag jammed in the metal frame holder on the door. Accommodation here was stark and functional, Grace thought. It didn't matter whether you were a billionaire or a homeless person. You'd be rubbing shoulders, or at least body bags, in the void behind these doors for however long it took for the coroner to release you. He shuddered, trying not to think about it. It didn't matter, did it, if you were dead? You'd vacated your body. It was just an empty shell, a husk. Wasn't it? That was how he'd felt seeing his dad's body, years back, laid out in a funeral parlour. There were six stainless steel post-mortem tables in the two areas, and scales with whiteboard charts on the walls above them, labelled name, brain, lungs, heart, liver, kidneys, spleen. The weights of each of the organs would be marked up here during a post-mortem, except in the rare cases, such as the one now, where there was nothing left of them. Three of the steel tables were bare and gleaming. On another two, bodies were laid out beneath white plastic sheeting, the foot of one visible, a buff tag hanging off the big toe. Out of curiosity, as he walked past, Grace read the name Bob Tanner and wondered what was his story. Then he nodded a greeting at the others in the room, similarly gowned, who were gathered around a table on which lay a grubby-looking skeleton, some parts of it held together by desiccated sinewy tissue, the remainder laid out separately like a painstakingly partially completed puzzle. It was the skull that drew his eyes. Small, with a full set of immaculately shaped teeth, if badly in need of some whitening, a white ruler had been placed across the left cheekbone by James Gartrell, who was standing by the skull taking a set of photographs. Near him stood the tall figure of Philip Key, talking into a handheld dictating machine, and beside him was Glenn Branson, having a conversation with Deborah Morrison, the assistant technician. Lucy Sibbon was studying one of the leg bones and making notes. Nadieska de Sancha was bending over the skeleton, carefully probing with a thin steel instrument. A striking-looking woman in her early fifties, the pathologist had high cheekbones and clear green eyes that could be deadly serious one moment and sparkling with humour the next, beneath fiery red hair, which, at this moment, was pinned up neatly. She had an aristocratic bearing, befitting someone who was, reputedly, the daughter of a Russian duke, and always wore a pair of small, heavy-rimmed glasses that gave her a distinctly studious appearance. She turned and greeted Roy Grace with a friendly smile. Thanks for coming over, Roy. There are a couple of things that Glenn felt you ought to see. She replaced her tool with a pair of tweezers from a tray of instruments, walked over to the skull and studied it for some moments. Then she pinched something that was almost invisible at first, 
and raised the tweezers above the skull. Grace followed her over and saw for himself. It was a single strand of brown hair, about eighteen inches long. This might be helpful in establishing her identity, she said. It's one of the few remaining strands of the hair left on her scalp, but from its length it would indicate that at the time of death she had a full head of brown hair this length. Grace stared at it. His thoughts went to the photographs he had seen of Logan Somerville, who had similarly long brown hair. So, he remembered, had Emma Johnson, who had disappeared from her home in Worthing, turned up in Hastings some while later, then had recently been reported as having disappeared again. Could there be a connection? It seemed unlikely, but possible, even allowing for the gap of decades. He always kept an open mind in any inquiry. It was easy to dismiss something as coincidence, and in doing so, potentially overlook a vital clue that might one day come back to bite you. He turned to the forensic archaeologist. Lucy, you said you estimated the woman's age to be around twenty at the time of death? She turned to look at him. Yes, everything points to that. And I would estimate that she died around thirty years ago. I'd like to get soil analysis done on a number of spores I've found so far on part of the remains, because to me they don't look like they come from the sandy soil in the lagoon vicinity. They appear to be clay deposits, more likely found some distance inland. Quite a lot of the interior of Sussex farm and woodland is on clay. This makes me even more certain that the lagoon wasn't the original crime scene, but merely the deposition site. It'll take me some days, possibly a week or two, to get this confirmed. Grace frowned. Why would someone move her to the lagoon from an inland burial site? To such a public place? Possibly because they knew the path was being laid, boss, said Glenn Branson, and that then her remains would never be discovered. Grace stared down at the remains pensively. What about, Branson went on, the possibility that the offender was part of the crew laying that path? Grace nodded. Yes, it's a possibility. You're on to that, aren't you? Yes. Grace looked at his watch, conscious of the need not to be late for Pew. Anything else that you have for me? Branson nodded with a wry smile. Yeah, there is something else. He exchanged an almost conspiratorial glance with Nadyuska de Sancha. Then he jerked a finger towards the front of the skull. The pathologist went over to the work surface by the large opaque window, picked up a magnifying glass and brought it over. Take a close look, Roy. Peering hard with his naked eye on the front of the skull, where he estimated the top of the forehead would have been, he could just see what looked like a mark, about two inches wide by half an inch high. Then he raised the glass and looked through that. He could make out, very faintly, letters. You are dead. He turned back to Nadyuska de Sancha. Strange tattoo to have. Might you have been a goth, or whatever it was back then? It's not a tattoo, Roy. She shook her head. It's not? So what is it? I think it burned through the skin. It must have been done with a branding iron. Chapter 26 Friday the 12th of December Logan grew up on a small farm near Ripe in East Sussex. Her parents were third-generation tenant farmers, and as the EEC regulations gradually bit deeper, their income dropped progressively. They needed to make savings, and the only real ones they could make were staff. They had to let two of their farmhands go, and a few months later their herdsmen, who had been working for their family for thirty years. From the age of eleven, Logan had to take turns with the rest of her family to get up at five a.m. and milk the cows. It was a daily routine seven days a week, every day of the year. Cows didn't understand things like Christmas Day. They just wanted to be milked. Her father was a committed green environmentalist who did not believe in mod cons. The only heating in the house was supplied by a coke-fired Essie oven in the kitchen that was kept going all year round and a wood-burning stove in the hall that was unlit during the summer months. Years later, although she now lived in a centrally heated flat in Brighton, she still woke up some nights with the smell of burning coke in her nostrils. She could smell it now. Sharp. Acrid. 
Was she hallucinating? Then she opened her eyes and realised she was not. She could smell it clearly, burning coke, tickling her nostrils. She saw a blurry, diffused red glow above her, and pinpricks of green light beyond, then the familiar sliding sound and musty-smelling air on her face. Now she could see the red glow much more clearly, directly above her. Someone was standing over her, someone holding something that was glowing bright red. Who are you? she said, trembling with fear, her voice quavering. Who are you? Suddenly she felt a gloved hand clamp her throat, forcing it down against the hard surface she was lying on. Then the red glow descended towards her midriff. An instant later she felt an agonising burning sensation on her right thigh. She howled, crushing her eyes shut against the pain, writhing, trying to move away, but she was pinioned down. She screamed, heard the hiss of burning flesh. Her flesh. No! It was like being stung by a swarm of hornets. She screamed again. Shh, a muffled voice said. Shh, it's okay, babe. She writhed in agony as far as she could move. It was burning, stinging, hurting like hell. She tried to bite into the glove holding her down. The pain was getting worse, more intense. Oh, oh. It was burning right through her as if her entire leg was on fire. Oh. Then she felt something cold and soothing on her thigh for a brief instant. But rapidly the excruciating pain returned. She saw the red glow rising above her. The hand released her. She gasped. The pain was unbearable. She vomited. Moments later a cloth, wet and reeking of some vile disinfectant, was wiping her mouth. The pain in her thigh felt as if it was burning right through to her bone, like corrosive acid. Then the muffled voice again. You'll be okay. The pain will go. No harm done. You'll be fine. What have you done, you bastard? Is this how you get your kicks? The sliding sound above her. Then silence. Through her tears of pain, she shook in terror. Chapter 27 Friday the 12th of December at four o'clock in the afternoon, Roy Grace sat in his office on the first floor of the CIDHQ with its view out across the road. The glistening, wet, grey slab of the Hollingbury Asda Superstore sat in the foreground in the fading light with the rainy landscape of the city beyond. He slipped the DVD of the interview with Jamie Ball, which he had just been handed, into his desktop computer. The burly figure of the young man, in a grey suit, shirt and tie and black shoes, was seated, looking awkward, in one of the three red chairs in the tiny witness interview room. Two detectives, D.S. Guy Batchelor, in a sports jacket and black trousers, and D.C. Liz Seward, a petite woman with short, spiky blonde hair, dressed in a white shirt and dark trousers, sat with him. Above their heads, the lens of a wall-mounted camera stared down at them. Grace watched the formalities of today's date and time being announced, and Ball acknowledging he was aware that the interview was being recorded. Bachelor asked Ball to outline the circumstances of his fiancée, Logan Somerville's, disappearance. Ball related the events in a precisely identical manner as he had to Roy Grace the previous evening, and that struck Grace as a little strange. Was it rehearsed, he wondered. How would you describe your relationship with Ms. Somerville? D.C. Seward asked. Grace watched the man carefully. He was replying in a calm voice, but he looked anything but calm. We were deeply in love and planning our wedding. I thought everything was great. Are you sure about that? Guy Batchelor pressed. And that she felt the same way? I thought so. Ball looked even more uncomfortable. He stared up for some moments at the camera, then scratched his right ear before checking the knot of his tie. Do you know a lady by the name of Louise Bryce? D.C. Seward asked. Yes, very well. How would you describe her relationship to Logan? The D.C. asked. She's Logan's best friend. They go back to nursery school days. They're very close. How close, would you say? They spoke or texted each other all the time, several times a day most days. So Louise Bryce would be likely to know quite a lot about her. 
He hesitated. Grace noted his expression change. Yes. The thing is, Jamie, one of my colleagues spoke to Louise Bryce earlier today. I have the transcript of the conversation in front of me. She looked down for some moments at a sheet of printout. Louise Bryce told her the same thing she had told a reporter on the Argus newspaper who contacted her, that Logan had broken off your engagement. Can you comment on that? Again, Ball looked uncomfortable for some moments. We were very deeply in love, he said, with a tinge of defiance in his voice. But recently there's been some friction, as Logan was suddenly unsure. Why do you think her best friend would have said that to a newspaper reporter? Liz Seward asked him. Ball shrugged. I don't know. Louise Bryce and I never got on that well, if you want to know the truth. She runs Bryce's estate agency. She told Logan she thinks I'm a bit of a loser and that she could do better. Better than what? Guy Batchelor asked. Me. How did Logan react to her friend's view? He asked. Ball was silent for some moments. She told me what Louise had said. And how did you feel when you heard that? Bachelor stared at him intently. Ball touched his beard, then his stacked hair. I told her that was very hurtful. I spoke to Louise Bryce earlier today, D.C. Seward said. She told me that Logan had a number of concerns about the relationship. Do you want to comment on that? Ball's temper visibly flared. That's just bullshit. Louise is a snotty bitch. She never liked me. She was always trying to undermine me. Logan and I had disagreements like any couple. What about? Logan can be a loner at times. I felt we should develop interests that we could do together. Did Louise Bryce succeed in any way? The DC asked. Logan told me she loved me. So is there any truth that she broke off your engagement? Again, Jamie Ball fell silent for several moments. Then he said, Yes, well, the thing is, we were going through a bit of a bad patch but it was all starting to come good again. I mean, what I mean is, you know, we talked through it. All couples go through rough patches, don't they? I also spoke to Mrs Tina Somerville today, Liz Seward said. That's Logan's mother, correct? Yes. She told me that Logan spent last weekend with her and her husband, alone, without you. That she had spent much of the time in a state of some distress, telling them that you would not accept that the relationship was over. Would you like to comment on that? Again, he shrugged. I'm surprised, but not surprised. She always told me there was friction with her parents. They're tenant farmers. I don't know if you understand how that system works. Would you like to tell us? The female detective said. Much of farming in England works on a strange, quite feudal system. The aristocratic landowners own most of the land in this country, with their vast estates. Historically, they've given farming families three-generation tenancies on fairly low rents. The deal is, in return, the farmers look after the land and make their money out of what they earn off the land. So, in one way, it's a good deal for the farmers. They get substantial acreages of arable or dairy or sheep farming land. But the downside is, they don't own their farms or their land. At the end of the third generation, they have to renew their tenancies. It only works if that generation is happy to take on the same deal, as I understand it. Her parents were not happy that I had no interest in farming. They'd hoped Logan would marry someone who was. So their tenancy was under threat? Yes. They're in their sixties and have never bought a property of their own. So they're faced with the possibility of losing their home. They're angry at her for not finding a potential husband willing to carry on. But the truth is that Logan is not interested herself. Farming is a tough life. Grace continued watching the recording. But there was nothing further that Jamie Ball said of any significance. He'd said enough already. Logan Somerville had broken off the engagement and Jamie Ball had not accepted it. His position was they were on the verge of getting back together again. Not a view shared either by her best friend or by her parents. Was he behind her disappearance? Grace did not have enough information to make a decision either way. Yet. Chapter 28 Friday the 12th of December 
Edward Crisp said goodbye to his last patient of the week, Rob Lowe, an elderly property developer who is convinced, just as he had been on a regular basis for the past 25 years, that he was terminally ill. Lowe had been one of the patients he had taken on when he had first set up this practice. Referred to him by his then GP who was retiring, the man had initially come into his office complaining of a recurrent sharp pain in his neck, which had convinced him he was suffering from cancer of the throat. Crisp had been able to calm him down by establishing that it was neck strain from tennis. Since then, there had seldom been two consecutive months when Lowe, sometimes accompanied by his wife Julie, had not turned up in his office with a fresh imagined terminal illness manifested through some other pain in his body, chest pains, lumbar pains, groin pains, loss of appetite, weight loss. One day, of course, if a heart attack, a stroke, an accident or pneumonia didn't carry him off first, Rob Lowe would be right. Almost everyone who lived long enough would eventually be diagnosed with some form of cancer, but at 83, Lowe was still going strong, and his latest imaginary terminal illness, a brain tumour causing him blurred vision, had turned out to be no more serious than a need for a cataract operation. Crisp's secretary, Jenny, popped her head in through the door to say good night, then stood in the doorway, lingering, giving him the same curious, almost expectant stare she always gave him. What are you up to this weekend? he asked, out of politeness rather than interest. Taking my niece and nephew, Star and Ashton, to Thorpe Park tomorrow, she said. Otherwise I don't have any plans. Her stare was irritating him intensely tonight. Although, at the moment, everything was irritating him. Why was the bloody woman staring at him? Was she expecting him to suddenly leap out of his chair and declare his love for her? A handsome woman, with a classic English rose face, framed by short, elegantly cut brown hair, she was a sad and slightly tragic figure. He knew all about her private life, because she had confessed to him some years ago, when he had taken her out for their traditional pre-Christmas lunch, that she had been having an affair with a married man with three children, a prominent solicitor in Brighton, who had been stringing her along for years. One day, he had promised, when the kids were old enough to understand, he would leave his wife. But Crisp had always sensed that was never going to happen. He'd tried on more than one occasion to tell her to dump him, to join a dating agency while she was still young enough. She'd ignored his advice. But he had been right. The man's children had long left home, and the spark had faded in their relationship. All Jenny had now were her teenage niece and nephew, and she probably would not have them for much longer, once they started to date. What are your plans? she asked. Taking smut for a long walk tomorrow, then I've been invited to a dinner party in the evening with a bunch of medics, a proctologist, an oncologist, a dermatologist, and an anaesthetist, with their other halves. They're trying to fix me up with a woman. Sounds like fun she said brightly, but with a disappointed look in her eyes. Huh, he responded dismissively. Well, call me if you need me. He smiled thinly. She said the same thing every Friday evening. Thanks, will do. In twenty years, he never had. She closed the door behind her, and he sat still, alone with his troubled thoughts. High on the list of these was his bitch wife, Sandra. She was screwing a smug, smooth plastic surgeon, Rick Maranello. A medic friend had told him the news as if doing him a favour some months ago. It wasn't a big surprise to him. She had gone off sex around that time, and probably longer ago if he cared to think about it. She'd pretty well gone off it after the second of their two children had been born but he had bigger problems on his mind than thinking about his wife in bed with a creepily narcissistic plastic surgeon. His whole livelihood was under threat at the moment, thanks to new government regulations coming in. Until recently, working as a sole practitioner had been an option for all family doctors in the UK, but ever since another sole practitioner, Harold Shipman, had been sentenced to life imprisonment for killing 15 of his patients, and his true death toll, though never established, was estimated to be several hundred, regulations for GPs had been changed. For national health family doctors, revalidation had been brought in. Their practices had to be scrutinised. They had to have annual appraisals by both professionals, peers or associates, able to monitor their work, and by patients. 
half had to be medics, half non-medics. As a result, almost all national health doctors now worked in medical centres with a number of other doctors. Private general practitioners like himself were so far exempt from this, so he had been able to carry on unhindered. But now he'd read that was about to change. All private GPs were soon to come under the same regulations. Why? Who were these moronic civil servants and elected creeps who had decided, because of one bad egg a decade ago, that family doctors were no longer able to be trusted? In short, he was going to have to produce printouts from large numbers of patients and from medics testifying to his abilities. How demeaning was that? How sodding bureaucratic! The only option would be to join a bloody medical centre of some kind and risk his patients, whom he cared about deeply, seeing some possibly incompetent doctor when he wasn't available, instead of the reliable locum of his choice. It was bloody ludicrous. All his patients loved him, and he loved them back. The ones at the start of their lives, the pregnant ones full of hope and joy, and the terminally ill ones who he helped through their prognosis and cared for all the way to their final days, and then attended their funerals. Medicine was an inexact science. No one knew this better than he did. It was an established fact that one of the most effective of all drugs was a placebo. There were many occasions when he had cured patients of a range of ailments, from depression to more serious illnesses, by telling them to take some long walks in the countryside or along the seafront. Now, these so-called health experts were making ludicrous demands, calling his ethics and every doctor's like him into question. Well, fuck them. Fuck them all. Fuck his wife, who was already being well fucked by Rick Marinello. Fuck his kids, arrogant, ungrateful little bastards, both of them. Fuck the world. Because it sure as hell was fucking him. Chapter 29 Friday the 12th of December Jacob Van Damme's last patient of the week sat in front of him now. Neil Fisher an army captain who had been given an honourable discharge after suffering a nervous breakdown after his third tour of Afghanistan a year ago. During an assault on an enemy position, the officer's best friend, running alongside him, had been hit in the midriff by shrapnel from a shell. Fisher had carried the screaming, newly-wed man on his shoulders, with half his intestines uncoiled around his face, into the safety of a shell hole where he had died, sobbing for the arms of his bride. Captain Fisher was now suffering severe post-traumatic stress disorder. But the elderly psychiatrist was unable to focus on what the former soldier was saying, just as he had been unable to concentrate on any of his patients since his encounter with the strange anaesthetist, Dr. Harrison Hunter. His mind was a turmoil of conflicting thoughts. After phoning his distraught sister Tina to verify that Logan was still missing, he had spent his lunch hour on the internet frantically searching first the medical register, then googling the doctor's name. The only Harrison Hunter he had been able to find was the chief executive of the Canadian Pacific Railway, and that man's photograph didn't bear any resemblance to his new patient. Dr Crisp had phoned him back, but wasn't able to provide any real insights into Harrison Hunter beyond his views that the man was delusional and needed psychiatric help. He suggested that Van Damme contact the police. After Fisher departed, clutching a new prescription for antidepressants that the psychiatrist had written out for him, Van Damme sat in silence, thinking hard. Should he phone the police? But to do that, he had to be sure he believed Hunter, whoever he really was, and he had a strong feeling the man might be delusional. He'd had patients in the past who had confessed to imaginary crimes they had committed— on one occasion, he had called the police after a confession to murder, only to discover that no such crime had been reported, and in a subsequent session, this patient had admitted to making it all up. Was Hunter, as Dr Crisp believed, really delusional? If he were to phone the police, giving them false information supplied by Hunter, might it actually harm or slow down the investigation? Logan was a lovely girl, bright, warm and natural. His desperate sister had told him what he had already read about the manhunt that was taking place to find her. He noticed the winking light on his phone. An incoming call. 
His secretary had left a couple of hours ago. He lifted the receiver and pressed the button to answer it. Dr. Van Damme? Yes. He recognised the man's voice. Dr. Hunter? It's not looking good for Logan Somerville, is it? The psychiatrist had prepared himself for a further conversation with the man. He'd lined up a number of questions to test him. How well do you know my niece? he asked. I don't know her at all, Dr. Van Damme. I only know the man who has taken her. Is that so? He's very deeply disturbed. We are going to have to tread very carefully if we want her to be safe. Tell me why I should believe you. Well, it's because I can tell you something about her that the police don't know. What's her middle name, Dr. Hunter? I wouldn't know that. Perhaps you can tell me her birthday. What are we doing? Playing some kind of trivial pursuit, Dr. Van Damme? I wouldn't say there was anything trivial about a young lady who might have been abducted. Hunter's voice sounded almost gleeful. You see, you don't even know for sure she has been abducted. She might have just run away to safety, to get away from her boyfriend. Sorry, her fiancé. Van Damme was jolted by this. It was what his sister had told him earlier, when he had called her to ask if it was true that Logan had disappeared. What was his connection? Can you shed some light on how you know that for me? It's on her Facebook page. I'm afraid I'm not up to speed on social media. Well, Logan has put a couple of recent posts up on her Facebook page. The first says that she had broken off her engagement to Jamie Ball. The second, a few days ago, says, quoting Henry the Second, Will no one rid me? Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? Van Damme said. You're on the money. Van Damme frowned. Are you saying the reason for her disappearance is to get away from her fiancé? You're meant to be the expert on the human psyche, Dr. Van Damme. The lady changes her mind, and her fellow doesn't accept it. Perhaps the smart thing is to disappear. Lie low for a bit. Let him calm down. Jacob Van Damme suddenly found his entire thought process in a tangle of confusion. Was this true? Had Logan engineered her disappearance to get away from her fiancé? But before going down this route, he needed to be sure this man was real and not, as he had originally feared, delusional or a fantasist. How well do you know this man who you claim has taken my niece, Dr. Hunter? Well, that's a difficult question. How well do you know any of your patients, I wonder? You will only ever know what they let you know. How well do we really know ourselves? Do you know yourself? I doubt I know myself. Remove my face and my name, and I doubt I would recognise myself if people were talking about me. How about you? I don't think this is an appropriate time for philosophical discussions, Dr. Hunter. My niece is missing, and there are people who believe her life is in danger. If you have information to the contrary, I would really appreciate you sharing that with me. You sound... Very sceptical, Doctor. I don't like people who play games with me. It's six o'clock on a Friday evening. I'm tired and I want to go home. I expect Logan would like to go home too. You've just told me she might have run away, and I told you earlier today that I'm the only person who may be able to save her life. The psychiatrist took his time before answering. All his years in medical practice had not prepared him for someone as odd as this character. Was Hunter the man who had taken Logan? Was he actually a friend or associate of the man who had taken her? Or was the real reason for Logan's disappearance, as he had suggested, altogether less sinister than everyone thought? All right, he said. If Logan has run away to get away from her fiancé, what does she do next? I wouldn't want to speculate on that. This is what I'm saying. There was something in the man's voice that deeply perturbed Van Damme. It was as if he was gloating about something, some superior knowledge that he held. He decided to push him. Would you say that you know my niece quite well, Dr. Hunter? I wouldn't say so. 
But you know her. There was a long silence. Van Damme sensed the dynamics had changed. He needed to get a conclusion, and he was still far from one at this moment. He decided to push further. There is very little you have told me, Dr. Hunter, that gives me any indication that you know Logan or anyone associated with her. It's my view that you are a very disturbed man, trying to fulfil some deep inadequacy, so I'd appreciate it if you would either tell me something significant about Logan Somerville, or else crawl back into your hole and go pick on someone more gullible. You really want to blow the opportunity to save your niece's life? Not at all, but I don't believe you are the man who can save her. Answer the question I just put to you. Tell me something significant about Logan that will enable me to believe you. Okay, Dr. Van Damme. Listen up. I'm going to tell you something. If you go to the police about me, I'll never speak to you again, and no one will ever see her alive again. So just keep this to yourself. Your niece has a mark on her right thigh. Does she? What kind of a mark? Three words. Two of them abbreviated. What do they say? They say, you are dead. Chapter 30 Friday the 12th of December at 6.15pm, carrying a mug of coffee, Roy Grace left his office and made his way through the security door and along the labyrinth of corridors, past the major incident room, MIR-1, which his Operation Haywain was sharing with Glenn Branson's Operation Mona Lisa, the body from the lagoon. As was the Sussex CID tradition, still maintained, although they were now merged with Surrey, some wag on each team had stuck pictures up on the inside of the door. His operation was denoted by a photograph, torn from a magazine, of a reproduction of Constable's Haywain painting, as might have been interpreted by Banksy, with a supermarket trolley sticking out of the stream, and Glenn Branson's by a cartoon of a smiling Mona Lisa holding an iPad. Suddenly he heard a familiar voice behind him, sounding distraught. Chief, can I have a quick word? He stopped and turned to see the forlorn figure of Norman Potting, the 55-year-old detective sergeant's comb-over looking even more ragged than usual, dressed in a shabby tweed jacket, crumpled shirt, tie askew, and badly creased grey trousers. Sure, Norman, he said with a kindly voice. How are you bearing up? It's hard, especially when I'm here in Sussex House. Are you sure you're up to it? I've got to keep busy, Chief. I can't just sit at home. On Monday was the funeral of Potting's fiancée, Bella Moy, who had died bravely rescuing a child, then a dog, in a house fire in Brighton several weeks earlier. I understand, Norman. There's something else. I need your opinion. Yes? Three members of his team filed past them, nodding at Grace respectfully, and one of them patted Norman on the shoulder. When they were gone, Potting said, It's about my prostate cancer. I have to make some decisions. Now, you know, now that keeping my winky action is not so important anymore. I've got all the options from the medics. I'd appreciate the chance to sit down with you and go through them. I don't have anyone else I can talk to whose opinion I would respect. Do you want to do it next week? Sometime after the funeral, Norman? Or is it more urgent? Next week would be fine, Roy. Thank you. Tears welled up in Potting's eyes and he walked on hastily. Grace stood for some moments watching him with deep sadness. God, people got dealt shitty hands at times. Norman Potting's private life had been a never-ending disaster. He had been through three, or was it four, failed marriages, but just recently had finally found what really seemed to be true love, only to have it snatched away. And on top of that, the poor sod had recently been diagnosed with cancer. And that cancer was really worrying Grace now. He'd read that trauma could seriously affect people's immune systems. He'd heard of several people who had suffered severe traumas in their lives and who, a short while after, had developed aggressive cancers. He hoped so much that Bella's death wouldn't do the same to Norman. 
quite apart from the fact that he was a very fine detective, over the years he had known him, he had developed a soft spot for the man. He switched his mind back to the immediate and seriously pressing task of finding Logan Somerville. As he walked along the corridor towards the conference room of the major crime suite following potting, he glanced at one of the flowcharts that were pinned on the row of red notice boards lining the walls. The charts were there to serve as a reminder to senior investigating officers and their team members of the procedures and protocols of major crime investigations. Most of the time, everyone strode past them, barely noticing them. But every now and then, Grace liked to stop and reread them. It was all too easy to get complacent, and that's when you made mistakes. He stared up now at the murder investigation model with all its flowcharts then up at the fast-track menu. He was looking for one that related to mispers. He didn't find a specific one, but cast his eye down standard analytics. 1. Victim association. 2. Sequence of events. 3. Timelines on suspects. 4. Case comparison. He stopped at that and thought hard for some moments. Case comparison. Then he read on. 5. Mapping. 6. Scene assessment. 7. House to house. When he had finished the entire list, he made his way through to the conference room. He had decided to hold the briefing here, partly to contain the large number of team members he had assembled, and partly not to disturb Glenn Branson and his team. Although he had a feeling, which he could not explain or rationalise at the moment, that the two inquiries might not be as disconnected as the three decades span between them suggested. Most of the 25 members of his team were already seated around the large rectangular table when he entered the conference room. Several whiteboards, brought along from MIR-1, were up on easels. On one were two photographs of Logan Somerville, one just of her, the other with her fiancé on a beach. There were also two CSI photographs of a very dark footprint. The first was of the whole print, the second a close-up showing a distinctive zigzag tread pattern. On another board was an association chart, with representative male and female figures labelled Logan Somerville and Jamie Ball. On the third was a timeline chart. Grace took his place at the far end of the table, with his back to a row of blue screens bearing the Sussex police crest, nodded at several of his regular members, and welcomed the latest member of his team, a stocky 45-year-old BS with whom he had worked before, Kevin Taylor who had just served a two-year stint away from major crime on professional standards. He stared down at the notes his management support assistant, Tish Hannington, had prepared. He waited until 6.30pm, when the rest of the team had arrived and seated themselves. Then he began. This is the second briefing of Operation Haywain, the investigation into the disappearance of Logan Somerville. According to her fiancé, or, as we have subsequently learned, her former fiancé, Jamie Ball, Logan has been missing since around 5.30pm yesterday evening. It is still too early to conclude that she has been abducted, although the evidence points that way. Ball may be an unreliable witness. Both her best friend and her mother have informed us that although Logan broke off their engagement, as we've seen ourselves from her Facebook post, Ball was reluctant to accept this. Whatever the truth, we have grave concerns for her safety, and I'm unhappy that over 24 hours have now elapsed without any word from her. It is unlikely that she has been kidnapped, her family aren't well off, and I would have expected to have received a ransom note or some demand or communication by now, so abduction, quite possibly sexually motivated, is the most likely scenario. He paused and sipped his coffee. I want to make one observation at this point, which may or may not have any relevance. Logan Somerville is 24 years old. As you can see from her photographs, she has long brown hair. Two weeks ago, another young woman in West Sussex, Emma Johnson, a regular misper, disappeared again. She is 21 years old, and the reason I'm mentioning her is that she is of a similar age and appearance with an almost identical hairstyle. This may not take us anywhere, but there is an historic pattern of women being abducted who have similar looks. The victims of American serial rapist and killer Ted Bundy, who was executed in 1989, all looked similar, with identical hairstyles. I was at the post-mortem of the victim found at Hove Lagoon last night, and it seems she also had long brown hair. I'm not jumping to any conclusions here, but I want a search done. Start with Sussex, and then the South East for outstanding mispers with a similar appearance, 
age and hairstyle to Logan Somerville, begin with the last 12 months and then back five years. He turned to the researcher, Annalise Veneer. I'm giving you that as an action, Annalise. It was a huge task. Yes, sir. Then he turned to D.S. Batchelor. Guy, Glenn Branson is the SIO on the case of the skeletal remains of a young woman found at Hove Lagoon yesterday. I want you to liaise with Glenn and see if we can eliminate this woman from any connection with our current inquiry. What makes you think there might be a connection, boss? Little more than a hunch at the moment, Guy. It would be helpful if you could report back on her identity as soon as it is known. Then he turned to Potting, mindful of the man's current mental state, but wanting to give him a task he could get his teeth into and his head around as a distraction from his current woes. Norman, I want you as an action to get me full details on every reported female misper once Annalise has given you the names. Start with those in the age group 16 to 45. Suddenly, the James Bond theme played. Norman Potting dug a hand into his pocket and pulled out the phone. He gave Grace an apologetic nod, stood up and stepped away. Moments later, he returned. Sorry about that, Gov. The Undertaker. About the music from Monday. There was a respectful silence. Then Potting sat back down, seemingly consumed by his inner thoughts. Grace waited several moments, as Potting settled, before moving on to DC Jane Wellings, who had been allocated the CCTV work. Have you come up with any more on the Volvo from CCTV and ANPR, Jane? We're still finalising the footage to see if we can find a match for that time and area. The crime scene manager, John Morgan, then pointed at the two photographs of footprints on the whiteboard. The two images are the same footprint, one showing it in entirety, the other showing the detail of the tread pattern. I've sent copies to the National Footwear Reference Collection, who should be able to give us the manufacturer. And size? asked D.S. Exton. We might get that from the manufacturer, Roy Grace replied. That zigzag pattern is probably a different number of them on each shoe sole, according to the size. Are you going to bring in the forensic gate analyst again? D.S. Batchelor asked. Hayden Kelly? Grace nodded. I've emailed the pictures to Kelly to ask him if he thinks he can get anything from the footprint. Do we have enough to question this Jamie Ball character again, boss? D.S. John Exton asked. We do, and I'm still not happy with him, but I'm not convinced he's the offender. The initial search of Logan's social networking sites hasn't taken us any further. His alibi is that he was driving down the M23 close to Gatwick Airport when Logan phoned him. We know from the phone company's records that a call to her fiancé's number was made from Logan's phone, and it was made in the vicinity of their apartment building. We also know that Ball's phone was answered in the geographic location where he claims to have been. But we cannot be sure at this point that it was Logan Somerville who made the call. We only have Ball's word on that. And we only have his word that it was he who answered it and spoke to her. As he looked around the faces of his inquiry team, he felt a sudden, deep pang of sadness at the absence of D.S. Bellamoy, and the absence of the familiar rattle of the box of Maltesers which always sat in front of her, and which she ate constantly. "'You're speculating that Ball may have orchestrated this whole thing?' Guy Batchelor asked. "'That whoever took Logan Somerville made the call, let's for a moment say it was Jamie Ball, and it was an accomplice who answered at the other end, driving Ball's car down the exact route Ball would have driven home from work himself? It's one hypothesis, Grace said. It's most unlikely, but still needs to be checked out. I'm going to speak to one of our source handlers to see if there is any word out on the street about Ball. People who are jilted can get very angry. Let's see if he's been out shopping around for a hitman. Ideally, we want to eliminate him from the inquiry if he's not involved. The youngest member of the team, DC Jack Alexander, raised a hand. Sir, what about getting a warrant and searching the couple's flat again? If we found a shoe with a matching tread pattern, that would put Jamie Ball at the scene, wouldn't it? Grace smiled back at him. He'd made similarly naive deductions in his early days. Not quite sure what that would tell us, Jack, since he lives there. There was a titter of laughter, and the young detective constable's face turned the colour of beetroot. But he persevered and said, Yes, but it would still be interesting if we find one of Ball's shoes in the flat had made the fresh mark in the sludge. Grace nodded. Well recovered, Jack. And also to make sure it doesn't belong to any of our officers. D.S. Tanya Kale, a glamorous new addition to his regulars, who had been brought in to temporarily replace Bellamoy, raised her hand. K. 
Hale had been tasked with running the outside inquiry team. Sir, she said, we have something that may be of interest. A PCSO tipped us off that an elderly lady in Chesham Avenue, five houses along from the entrance to the Chesham Gate underground car park, has a police CCTV camera installed, looking down at the street. She's been having trouble with kids in the area. I gather she shouted at them a few months ago for throwing litter in the street. Since then, they've been making her life a misery by daubing her car with graffiti, as well as on one occasion leaving a dead cat in a front garden with a threatening note attached. Was the camera on last night? Yes, she said. It's aimed low, principally at her little front garden and the pavement beyond, but it picked up the bottom half of a car just after 5.30pm yesterday, travelling at high speed. The image is in black and white, so we're not able to get the colour, but it's a dark colour, and two traffic officers have identified it as an old model Volvo estate, about ten years old. Any view of the licence plate? No, she said. Unfortunately not. Grace felt a beat of excitement at this development, confirmation of a car seen leaving at speed. Good work. OK, I'm giving you an action. Get a list of every Volvo estate between five and fifteen years old that's owned by a Brighton resident, and see what similar cars CCTV might have picked up in the Brighton area an hour either side of this time. Yes, sir, she said. During the course of the next twenty minutes, Grace ran through the lines of inquiry. When he had finished, it was 7.05pm, just over twenty-five hours since Logan had disappeared. Statistics would have her already dead by now. But for Grace, that wasn't an option. He had to believe she was still alive, and he had to find her whilst she was still alive. Quite apart from his own determination, he had pressure from the ACC and from the Police and Crime Commissioner, Nicola Roygaard. And soon, after the impending retirement of the Chief Constable Tom Martinson, which was an open secret, he would be having a new chief putting pressure on him as well. Not to mention all the people with vested interests in this city, such as the head of Visit Brighton, the tourist board, who would be wanting a quick and conclusive result, and not to see this beautiful seaside resort yet again splashed across the national newspapers and television screens for another grim crime. They wanted Logan Somerville back, at all costs. Alive. So did he. He'd never in all his life been a defeatist but the odds of finding her alive, he knew, were not good. Chapter 31 Friday the 12th of December Jamie Ball sat on one of the sofas, laptop open, glass of red wine in his hand, alternating between his Facebook page and staring at the constantly changing images on the digital photo frame. There are a few landscapes, a picture of Logan's parents' dog, a happy-looking black labradoodle, and a photograph taken at their engagement party of both sets of parents and siblings, but most of the pictures were of Logan and himself. He topped the glass up with a shaking hand. His tiredness was really starting to kick in, but instead of calming him, the alcohol seemed to be having the reverse effect, making him increasingly jittery, as if it were strong coffee, shrinking his scalp so tightly around his skull that pains were shooting down it. His eyes were raw and gritty, and he could barely focus. Unconsciously, he drummed the fingers of his left hand continuously on the coffee table. His parents had invited him over, but he didn't want to sit in their gloomy house. Logan's parents and her sister and brother had all been very slightly cold and remote to him, not cold enough to sound actively hostile, but enough to hint to him that they were suspicious. A couple of his mates, concerned for him, had invited him out for company to the coach house in Middle Street for the evening. It was a pub he had been to many times in the past, in happier days, with Logan. But for now, he preferred to sit here alone. He didn't want any company at this moment. He refreshed the Facebook page, where late last night he had posted the message, Please help me find my missing beautiful fiancé Logan, beneath a row of photographs of her. He saw that another fifteen likes had come in during the past half hour, as well as six new friend requests in response to his post. Good, he said, suddenly, to no one. Then his phone rang. He jumped up and grabbed the receiver with his hand shaking so much it dropped and fell to the wooden floor, a piece of the casing breaking off. He knelt and picked it up. I wonder if I could speak to Mr. James Ball. It was the voice of an elderly man, courteous but quite firm. Few people called him James. 
He had been Jamie for as long as he could remember. Yes? Speaking, who is this? He'd already had several crank calls, one from a medium telling him she'd had a vision of Logan in the hold of a ship loaded with timber, another from someone claiming to be a private detective, demanding one thousand pounds up front, but guaranteeing to find her. Yep, right. I'm Logan's uncle. My name is Jacob Van Dam. She may have mentioned me. Oh, yes, he replied. Yes, she has. She had indeed mentioned her uncle, the psychiatrist, to him on many occasions, although she told Jamie she had not seen him for several years. He was the one famous member of her family. I'm going to ask you a rather personal question about Logan, James, but I have a good reason for this, so please bear with me. Ball frowned. Was this shrink about to start playing some clever mind games with him? OK, he said guardedly. Does Logan have a mark, or words, maybe a tattoo, anywhere on her body? He was silent for some moments, wondering where this was going. A tattoo? Yes, a mark or tattoo? No, she doesn't. Are you absolutely certain? Perhaps on her right thigh? Yes, I am sure there's nothing there. What about any writing or script? No. She doesn't have. Why are you asking, Mr. Van Dam? I have a reason. No, she has no tattoo. Okay. The man's insistent voice was irritating him and making him feel even edgier. You've been very helpful. I'm sorry to have troubled you. Thank you. Ball stared into the receiver as the call ended, into the tiny holes in the mouthpiece. What was all that about, he wondered. Jacob Van Dam sat for a long time at his desk, in silence, deep in thought. In his opinion, Ball's reaction had been that of someone distraught because his loved one was missing. Nevertheless, he had the feeling he was hiding something. But what? Chapter 32 Friday the 12th of December after the briefing, Roy Grace went back to his office, deep in thought, needing some quiet time to reflect. On Monday, he had to speak at Bella's funeral, which was going to be emotional, he knew. One of the hardest things he'd ever had to do. Then, on Tuesday, the removals company were due to be delivering all the packing cases, both to Cleo's house and to his own, in advance of their move the following Friday. Somehow, he was going to have to find the time to be at home to help Cleo pack everything up, he was also going to have to supervise the packing of all his belongings in his own house near the seafront, very close to the lagoon, which he had shared with Sandy prior to her disappearance. But all he could think of was Logan Somerville, her long brown hair, and Emma Johnson, who was missing and had a similar hairstyle. Was there a possible link with the body of the woman at the lagoon? with the strands of long brown hair, too. He tried to dismiss that. He didn't want any links. A solo murder victim was a tragedy, but a one-off nonetheless. The victim of a sexual assault, a revenge attack, a random attack by someone mentally ill, a domestic dispute, a robbery or a jealous lover. These were some of the reasons people killed and got killed. Single, brutal, final act. Linked murders could be game-changers. Three or more, in different locations and with time between them, and you had a serial killer by definition. They hadn't had one in this city for a very long time, not in all of his career to date, at least that the police had heard about. Earlier he'd told Cleo there was no way he'd be home early tonight, even though she'd tried to tempt him by telling him she'd been planning some of his favourite dishes, a prawn and avocado cocktail then grilled Dover sole. He was feeling hungry and would have dearly loved to have headed straight back to see Noah, have a couple of glasses of wine and a nice meal, and an evening doing what he loved most, spending time with Cleo. His phone rang. He answered it instantly. It was Glenn Branson. All right, the D.I. said. Not great. You? Well, actually, I've got a bit of a development. Might be nothing, but I wanted to run it by you. 
Tell me. Fancy a drink? I kind of need one. I'm going off duty. Friday night? Grace said. So you don't have a hot date with that Argus report? What's her name? Siobhan Sheldrake? Ha ha, very funny. I need one too. Have to make it quick, and it'll have to be a soft one. Black Lion? Fifteen? Give me three quarters of an hour. I need to swing by my house to pick up some stuff I'm taking to a charity shop. Must be tough for you, Branson said. Yes, Grace replied. Sad, too. But you've moved on now. You're happy, you're in a good place. Life's started all over again for you. And I'm happy, I'm really happy. Thanks, mate. So am I. Yet, as he hung up, Roy Grace had a heavy heart. He went down to the car park and headed into Hove in Cleo's car. She was now driving his Alpha, which had been fitted with a baby seat. He had so much to look forward to, he knew. But clearing his old home, bit by bit, was not something he was enjoying. Ten minutes later, he turned off Newchurch Road and drove down the street towards Kingsway and the seafront, where he and Sandy had once been so happy. Christmas lights shone through the windows of the houses on either side of the road until he reached his own house, a 1930s mock Tudor semi on the right near the bottom, which sat in darkness. He pulled up onto the drive in front of the garage door. Beyond it sat Sandy's car, coated in dust, where it had been for the past decade awaiting her return. He unlocked the front door of the house. It had been over a week since he was last here, and as he went in, he had to push the door hard through the mountain of junk mail and bills and local takeaway menus that had poured through the letterbox in his absence. He switched on the lights, went into the kitchen, and pulled out a roll of black bin liners from under the sink, then carried them upstairs into their bedroom, which was still largely unchanged. He opened Sandy's wardrobe and began to pull out her clothes and stuff them into a bag until it was full. He could smell her scent, faintly, through the mustiness. Or could he? Memories flooded back. He filled one bag, and then a second, all kinds of thoughts of the past being triggered. Empty coat hangers clattered on the rail. He knelt and filled a third bag with her shoes, remembering to go into the downstairs cloakroom and take her coats off the hooks. Then he stood up and looked around the bedroom. There was a chaise long at the end of the bed, which they had bought years ago, in terrible condition, from an auction room in Lewis, and had recovered in a modern black-and-white pattern which Sandy had selected. On it sat the battered, furry toy stoat she had had since childhood. He put that in the bag too, then took it out again and placed it back on the chaise long. He hadn't the heart to give it away. Yet, at the same time, he could hardly take it to their new home. Shit, this was hard. What if... If she ever returned, and wanted it. And suddenly he realised, as he had so many times over the past years, he could not even remember her face anymore. He walked across to her walnut dressing table, and stared down at the framed photograph which sat between her bottles of perfumes. It had been taken in the restaurant of a gorgeous hotel near Oxford, the Bear at Woodstock, where they had celebrated their wedding anniversary, after he had attended a conference on DNA fingerprinting a short while before she disappeared. He was in a suit and tie, Sandy in an evening dress, beaming her constant, irrepressible grin at a waiter they had asked to take the picture. He stared at her crystal-clear blue eyes, the colour of the sky. It shocked him to look at her, realising just how far she had faded into the past. He couldn't give that away, he knew, nor could he throw it away. He would have to pack it in a suitcase and stick it away somewhere up in the loft of his new home. Then he looked at the stack of books, some on her bedside table and others neatly arranged on the mantelpiece above the fireplace that had been boarded over by previous owners, but which Sandy had opened up again and occasionally lit because she thought it was romantic. He picked up one of the books, Anita Bruckner's Hotel du Lac, which she had asked him to buy from her Christmas list. He opened it up, and read the inscription. To my darling Sandy, on our fourth Christmas. To the love of my life. Kiss, 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 kiss. Whatever happened to you? God, where are you now? Resting in peace, I hope. 
He kissed the book, then dropped it, along with all the others, into a fresh bin bag. Chapter 33 Friday the 12th of December Station Schwester Annette Lippert was 75 minutes into the night shift in the intensive care unit at the hospital where she had trained and spent most of her career to date. The Klinikum München Schwabing was, in her view deservedly, reputed to have one of the finest neurological departments in Germany, with a nurse to every patient in the ICU. As the senior staff nurse, she normally took the morning shift because that was when most of the transfers and operations took place, but with an epidemic of flu sweeping the city of Munich, they were currently several nurses down and she was having to work around the clock some days to help cover. The night shift was long and tedious, during which little tended to happen. The unit was kept at a carefully regulated 24 degrees Celsius, which sometimes felt stiflingly warm, although the patients who occupied the 15 beds there never complained. Many of them never spoke. One exception was the comatose, unidentified woman in bed 12, who made occasional confused, sporadic utterings. Stopping to check on each patient in turn and getting an update from their charge nurse, accompanied by two doctors, Lippert reached bed 12. The occupant was a woman in her mid to late thirties, with short brown hair, her face heavily bandaged. She had been semi-comatose since being hit by a taxi a month ago whilst crossing Widdenmeerstrasse, the busy main road that ran through one of the city of Munich's smartest districts, separating it from the River Isa. She had been admitted here as Unbekannte Frau. An eyewitness to the accident had told the police, with disgust, that as she had lain in the road, some helmeted bastard on a motorcycle had pulled up, snatched her handbag from the road, and accelerated off. For forty-eight hours, no one had any idea who she was. Then a young boy, back from football camp in tears because his mama had not collected him on his return from his trip, had been brought in here by the police and identified her as his mother, Frau Lohmann. Yet, despite this, she remained something of an enigma. It seemed, so the police had informed the hospital, that Frau Lohmann had gone to some considerable lengths to erase her past. A search of her apartment, her computer and her mobile phone had revealed no clues as to who she really was. It appeared that she had at least two faked identities, including forged passports and social insurance numbers. Her credit cards were in her assumed names. She had over three million euros on deposit in a Munich bank under one of these names and had managed to open that account some nine years earlier by getting through its money laundering protocols with her false documentation. Interpol would take several weeks before they had results, if any, of fingerprint and DNA tests, but because of the police interest in her, she was due to be moved into one of the private rooms at the side of the ward as soon as one became vacant. Lippert stared at her now. Her eyes were closed, as they had been since she had first arrived here. Her breathing was controlled by a ventilator, and she was catheterized. Fluids containing the various nutrients that kept her alive were steadily pumped into her through the dual lumen central line catheter that protruded from her upper chest. Who are you really? Annetta Lippert wondered. Where were you heading to when you were hit by that taxi? Where had you come from? What have you been running away from? The police were doing all they could. She had various aliases, they had told the hospital. At some point in her life, before her son was born, she had changed her name at least twice, but they could not give any reason why. Perhaps to escape from a nightmare relationship, a criminal past, a terrorist. The police were continuing with their investigations. Meanwhile, Frau Lohmann continued to sleep, kept alive by the tubes cannulated into her body. And Annetta Lippert continued to stare down at her, with a feeling of deep sadness. Someone loved you once. You have a son. Come back to us. Wake up. Your son needs you. Occasionally, Frau Lohmann would take a sharp intake of breath, but her eyes would remain closed. Always closed. 
There were no relatives, at least none that her son Bruno knew of. He was now staying with one of his friends, whose parents brought him frequently to visit. What the hell is locked in your mind? Lippert wondered. How do we unlock it? On the fourth round of her shift, shortly after midnight, when Annette Lippert was once again staring down at her, the woman suddenly and very briefly opened her eyes. Tell him I forgive him, she said, then closed them again. Tell who? But all she got back was the steady puff, hiss, puff, hiss of the ventilator and the beep, 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 beep from the monitors. Locked inside her skull, Sandy heard their voices. She understood what they were saying. But she felt like she was swimming underwater at the deep end of a pool. She could not talk back to them. Tell who? Lippert pressed. But she was gone again. Gone into some deep, inaccessible recess of her brain. Lippert lingered for some while then moved on to the next bed. Chapter 34 Friday the 12th of December The Black Lion pub in Patcham had a background which Roy Grace liked, more than he actually liked the pub itself. In 1976, Barbara Gall, wife of a shady property developer she was in the middle of divorcing, was shot in the Black Lion's car park and subsequently died from her wounds. It became one of the most notorious cases in all of Brighton's dark history, with links to the Craze, the famous London gangster family, and to two of the biggest sex scandals of post-war Britain, the Profumo and Lampton affairs. A shame, Grace thought, that such a colourful but tragic background could not be better reflected in the themed interior of the pub, for a long time now part of the harvester chain bright and corporate. But it was convenient for Sussex House. He sat in a booth in a quiet corner while Glenn Branson stood at the crowded bar, towering head and shoulders over most of the figures there. Grace was on the phone to Cleo, trying to plan a combined housewarming and New Year's Eve party at their new house. As he spoke to her, he glanced down at the thick buff envelope Branson had left on the table. I think we should have the same yummy Ridgeview sparkling wine we had at our wedding, and nice to support a local producer. Yes, great thinking. We'd better order fast. How many people are you thinking of? He asked. Oh, my God, Cleo suddenly said with laughter in her voice. What? Noah's just put his hand in Humphrey's bowl and taken some food out. Humphrey's just standing there. Amazing. Hang on, I'd better rescue your son. Great, he said. We can save a fortune if we wean him on dog food. Yes, good idea, she said, sounding distracted. Text me when you're leaving, and I'll get your dinner ready. So long as it's not from the dog's bowl. That, Detective Superintendent Grace, will depend on how late you are. He grinned. I love you. Love you, she said, but a little more coldly than usual. Again, he felt the slight distance in her tone. Look, I know I'm not being much help at the moment. I'm sorry. I get it, Roy, she replied. I know it's not easy for either of us. Grace looked up to see Glenn holding their drinks. He blushed and said to Cleo, I have to go. He blew her a kiss, but did not get one back. Branson sat down, shaking his head. You'll get over it, mate, one day. He handed Grace a Diet Coke, then sipped the white, creamy head of his Guinness. I don't think so, Grace replied. You will, trust me. You're such a cynic. Yeah, Branson said, then gave a sad shrug. So, you and that Argus reporter, Siobhan Sheldrake? Branson suddenly looked coy. What about her? You fancy her, don't you? Rubbish. I've known you too long. Grace sipped his drink. You play with fire sometimes. I could see you were attracted to that red Westwood on our last case. Just be careful, mate. I'd love to see you with a nice lady, but... But... Police and the press make a dangerous combination. Branson shrugged. I'm having a drink with her tomorrow evening. He shrugged again. She's cool. She and I go back a while, actually, before she joined the Argus. We were just good friends, then after Ari died, we became closer. But we've been keeping it low-key. Grace gave him a quizzical look. 
Just remember that old nautical expression. Loose lips sink ships. Ever see that fantastic submarine movie, Das Boot? Grace nodded. I seem to remember it sank. Branson grinned. Yeah? That's your memory? I think your brain's a bit addled these days. Just make sure yours isn't in your dick. He gave him a cautioning look. Be careful with Siobhan Sheldrake. I'll wear protection. Grace smiled and shook his head. So you dragged me away from my investigation because you have a development. Tell me. You came to the mortuary earlier. Remember that, or is it too long ago for your tired old brain? Very funny. Those words on the dead woman's skull. You are dead? Yeah. The detective inspector tapped the bulky envelope on the table. Take a look at this. Where's it from? Lucy Sibbon dated the age of the dead woman at around twenty years old and estimated she died approximately thirty years ago, yeah? So I understand. I had my researchers check the files on all mispers and cold cases five years either side of that date estimate on females of that approximate age. This is what they found. Fill your boots. He took a large gulp of his drink. I'm impressed. You've been moving fast. On it like a car bonnet, mate. Like a what? Grace looked at his friend quizzically, then picked up the unsealed envelope, which had a musty smell, and pulled out the contents. It contained a batch of documents with several photographs at the back, held together by two large elastic bands. Handwritten in black marker pen on the outside was Operation Yorker. The first document was a Home Office pathologist's report, headed Catherine Katie Jane Marie Westerham. Age 19, she was an English literature student at Sussex University, residing in Elm Grove, Brighton. She had been reported missing in December 1984, and the young woman's remains had been found in Ashdown Forest in April 1985 by a man walking his dog. Roy Grace reflected, ironically, just how big a debt homicide detectives around the globe owed to people walking their dogs. He'd often thought, if he had the time, of one day doing some research on the percentage of bodies discovered in this manner. He speed-read through the document. The body was decomposed at the time it was found, with some bones missing, presumed taken by animals. Fragments of lung tissue and the findings of the pathologist indicated death had been by asphyxiation. But there was insufficient material remaining to provide a conclusive cause of death. Grace then removed the photographs from the paperclip holding them. The first one was a portrait photograph of an attractive girl with long brown hair, unrecognisable from the remains. He stared hard at it for some moments. There was a striking resemblance, more in the hair than anything else, but also the face itself, to Emma Johnson. And she was a dead ringer for Logan Somerville, who had disappeared yesterday. He removed several more photographs, which showed her entire decomposed body in situ, each with a ruler in the frame. Then various close-ups of her skull, her ribcage, and other bones that remained. Then he pulled out the last photo, and froze. It was again a close-up, marked forehead. The pathologist's ruler included in the picture showed the length of just over two inches of what looked like tattooed letters on a fragment of flesh. They were considerably more distinct than on the remains that had been discovered at Hove Lagoon, but they read the same. You are dead. Chapter 35 Friday the 12th of December You're very quiet tonight, darling, Jacob Van Damme's elegantly dressed wife, Rachel, said. Even when they dined alone, they always dressed smartly. It was something they had done all their married life to make it more of an occasion, and the time in the day when they caught up with each other. The psychiatrist sat at the far end of the oval mahogany dining table in the smart dining room of their Regent's Park mansion, cradling his crystal goblet of claret, staring pensively at the light reflecting in its facets from the chandelier above. The grilled lamb cutlets on his bone china plate lay untouched and growing cold, along with the petit pois and gratin potatoes Rachel had lovingly prepared. Yes, well, he said pensively, it's been an interesting day. Would you like to share it with me? Then, after some moments, she said, Dreadful, the news about Logan. I just can't believe it. 
No one has any idea where she might be. The police are doing everything they can, apparently. I spoke to Tina myself earlier. She's in a terrible mess. She said the police don't think it's kidnap, because there's been no ransom demand, and say it's more likely she's been abducted. Apparently, they've said if someone her age is abducted, it is likely to be a sex offender, and the chances of her being alive lessen the longer she's not found. I feel helpless. He barely heard her words. He was so consumed by his thoughts about Dr. Harrison Hunter. Whoever Dr. Harrison Hunter really was. You are dead. The man had lied to him. His niece had no such tattoo. No tattoos at all. She had been missing, possibly abducted, since yesterday evening. So what was the connection with this man and Logan? The proper course of action would be to call the police. But Hunter's threat had felt very real. The only thing that mattered now was finding Logan and making sure she was safe. He needed the man to come back. Then he would find a way of ensnaring him, getting the truth out of him. But how long did he have? The rest of tonight? The weekend? What if Harrison Hunter was just delusional, someone who had read the Argus and was imagining his involvement? and had fallen at the first hurdle. You are dead. Hogan had no tattoos. He sipped some more wine, then sliced into the first cutlet. It was pink in the centre, just how he liked it. Beautifully cooked, my dear, he said. She gave him one of her penetrating stares. Is it something you can tell me about? she asked. Not really, he replied. No. It is so terrible. I mean, what on earth can have happened to her? She'd broken off her engagement. Do you think her boyfriend might be behind this, or involved in some way? He continued to stare at the light dancing off the glass. Then he dipped his fork with a morsel of cutlet into the mint jelly on the side of his plate and began to chew. When he had swallowed, he said, Rachel, have you ever in your life had to make a decision that you don't feel equipped to make? You're talking in riddles again, my love, like you so often do. I apologise. This is delicious, by the way. Good. He dabbed his lips with the linen napkin. Patient confidentiality. He picked up his glass and stared forlornly at it. That's the decision. What kind of a decision? She prompted. Well... Imagine for a moment you are me, in my office. A new patient comes in, who confesses to killing people. My assessment is that he's delusional. But what if I'm wrong, and he has killed? I may have to report this to the police, but if it's merely his fantasy, then I would be failing in my duty of care if I report him. He will never again talk openly with confidence to anyone, he won't trust anyone again. Is that what happened to you today? Yes. Does this have anything to do with Logan? Was he telling you he's the man who abducted Logan? He sliced another morsel of lamb. No, he didn't claim that. He claimed he knew who had taken her. Can you tell me anything about him? He chewed slowly, then sipped his wine. I can't say too much, but this man told me something that he assured me would be proof of his bona fides. I checked it out after he left, part of the reason I was so late home tonight, and it wasn't correct, which leads me to believe he is. I'm not sure. A fantasist? his wife prompted. That would be the easy conclusion, Van Damme said. I'm foxed. Then you should call the police and tell them your thoughts. The psychiatrist sat silently for some moments, then drank another sip of his wine. And risk Logan's life? Why would that risk her life? Because this man told me categorically not to go to the police. That's how seriously you take him? Yes. Then somewhere inside that strange brain of yours that I've never managed to penetrate fully, in all the years we've been together, you must believe, deep down, he was telling you the truth. 
Van Damme smiled at his beloved and wise wife. Yes. Yes, I do. Chapter 36 Friday the 12th of December After leaving the pub, Roy Grace returned to Sussex House, sat in his office, and began to look again at the file Glenn Branson had brought him. He pulled out a yellowing, black and white A4 printed sheet headed Sussex Crime Information Murder. At 8.35 a.m., Saturday the 3rd of the 4th, 85, the body of the after-described was found in Ashdown Forest, Sussex, cause of death undetermined, but believed to be asphyxiation. He looked again at the photograph of the pretty young woman, with poker-straight long brown hair, freckles and glasses, and wondered where the picture had been taken, because she was staring at the photographer with a warm, almost serene expression of trust. He read on down through the sheet. The following property is missing from the body. 1. Pair of black shoes, size 6, label on sole, made in UK, real leather, leather uppers with man-made soles. 2. Bunch of keys with a leather tag bearing the words Chandler's of Brighton BMW, containing one BMW key, one Yale-type key, and possibly one other key. 3. Handbag, contents unknown. The next sheet of paper looked like a blow-up of an ordnance survey map. Up in the top right-hand corner was a circle in red, marking the spot where the body had been found. He turned to the next item, a faded orange book marked Major Incident Property Register. The next was a colour photograph showing a group of men in gumboots, sweaters and jeans, each holding a long pole, standing in a woodland clearing around a dark shadow. He shook his head. God, what a difference. Today, these same people would have been in oversuits to prevent them from contaminating the crime scene. The next photograph showed a dark, human-shaped shadow in deep undergrowth. In the next, he could make out a pair of blue jeans. Then, as he turned to the one after, he took a sharp intake of breath, as he always did when he saw a new dead body. There was something so terribly sad about murder victims. He couldn't help it, but for a few moments he always felt like a voyeur, as if he had gate-crashed some party that no one, ever, would have invited him to. And always he wondered, would he one day be turning up to the bones of his missing wife, Sandy? The dead had no choice in who turned up at their deposition sites. It fell upon everyone present to be respectful. Even now, seated at his desk, with darkness pressing against the rain-spattered window panes, he felt just that staring at the side-on photograph of the blotchy face, as if stage rouge had been applied, with the eyes missing, pecked away by birds, dark brown hair unkempt and straggly in what looked like a home-knitted grey pullover. Who had knitted it, he wondered? Her loving mother? Grandmother? The sweater she had been murdered in. Then another photograph, this time full face, showing dark, marbled skin, and the empty eye sockets, like she was wearing a balaclava. God, he thought, you were at Sussex University. Your dad had lent you his car for the night because he trusted your driving and didn't want some drunken student driving you home. But you never did come home. He phoned a mobile number, thinking it unlikely that Tony Case, the senior support officer, would still be here at this hour on a Friday night, but to his surprise, he caught him just as he was leaving. Case said he had been working late, helping to reorganise the major incident rooms. Five minutes later, he followed the stocky figure of Case down into the basement of Sussex House. Case had been a traffic officer before retiring after thirty years' service and then rejoining the force as a civilian, as was common among many officers. He was holding a massive bunch of keys in his hand. They walked along a corridor, then stopped outside a steel-barred door. Case riffled through his keys, selected one and opened the door, then switched on the lights. Several dusty, bare bulbs, two of them with spider's webs, threw a weak light along the length of the vast storeroom, which was racked out on both sides and at the far end with floor-to-ceiling metal shelving stacked tightly with green plastic crates filled with evidence bags, manila folders and piles of papers. Roy Grace always felt a strange sensation when he entered this storeroom 
as if it were filled with ghosts. He knew it well from the days when he had been put in charge of cold cases, reviewing all the unsolved murders in the county of Sussex to see if advances in fingerprint technology and DNA could help solve any of them. Sussex police never closed the file on any unsolved murder. All of these green crates contain material dating back as far as the Second World War, and a few even further back than that. Each of the cases filled as many as twenty or more crates, and he had felt the burden of responsibility for each case that he re-examined, knowing he might well be the last chance the victims had for justice. He walked along past the handwritten labelled sections, Operation Gorby, Operation Dulwich, Operation Cormorant. Several of them he knew well. He could even recall the stomach contents of some of the victims from the last things they had ever eaten or drunk. Ghosts. They stopped when they reached the section, with 43 crates, labelled Operation Yorker, the unsolved murder of Katie Westerham. Tony Case looked at him. Which ones do you want up in your office, Roy? Grace ran his eyes along the crates. Each of them was filled with dusty folders, with a blue and white label, the serial number written in black ink, and sealed with a tamper-proof cable tie. All of them, please. Finally, close to 11.30pm, having done all he could that evening on the disappearance of Logan Somerville, Roy Grace went home. Cleo had left a cold platter for him on the table, but she heard him come in and came downstairs to join him. Sounds like it's been quite a day, she said. Roy Grace smiled thinly across the dining table at her. You're right, it has been. One hell of a day. Sorry if I'm not being good company. You're stuck home all day with the baby, and then I arrive and you're looking forward to some conversation, and all I do is sit in silence and brood. So share it with me. I have a very bad feeling about the case I'm on. He shrugged and reached for the bottle of sparkling water that Cleo had set in the cooler in the middle of the table and poured some into his glass. Operation Haywain, she prompted. He nodded. Are you worried about Cassian Pugh? And right now he's the least of my problems. Could have done with a couple of really stiff drinks, but he needed a clear head more than ever at this moment, and, of course, he was on call. We've had almost every imaginable kind of crime in this city, but so far we've had precious few, if any, of what could be defined as serial killers. What defines one? Cleo asked. Someone who commits three or more murders on separate occasions? We had a young man back in 1985 who murdered his father, stepmother and stepbrother with a baseball bat at the Lighthouse Club in Shoreham, but that was all on the same night. It was a multiple homicide, but he wasn't a serial killer. Do you think you have one now? He fell silent, picked up his glass, then set it down. I don't know. Yet. But it looks like we might have found a murder from 30 years ago. It's too early to tell for sure. Could he still be around? He said nothing, thinking. Come on, you've got to eat something, darling. He looked at his bowl of avocado and prawn, nodded, and picked up his fork. Yes, I'm ravenous, thanks. But he only swallowed one mouthful before lapsing back into his thoughts. You are dead. Thirty years ago. A double killing? More? Was there a third branded victim out there? A fourth? A fifth? Somewhere else in the UK? From all he had studied in the past on serial killers, they tended to operate in big landscape countries like the US, Australia, Russia, where they could move vast distances without arousing suspicion. But on occasions, they didn't follow that pattern. Time could be a distance too. Catherine Westerham, found dead in 1985, was 19 and had long brown hair with the centre parting. Emma Johnson, who had disappeared two weeks ago, was 21, and also had similar features and long brown hair. Logan Somerville, who was now missing, had long brown hair. Was he just being fanciful? Unknown female, whose skeletal remains had been found in Hove Lagoon, and was as yet unidentified, appeared to have had long brown hair. He realised more and more urgently that he needed to find the lagoon unknown female's identity. Fast. 
Thirty years was a long time, but he knew from case histories of serial killers that he had seen presented at the grandly titled International Homicide Investigators Association's annual symposium in the US, which he attended most years, that there could be long gaps sometimes. Twenty years was not uncommon. Dennis Rader in Wichita, Kansas, self-styled BTK, bind, torture, kill, had a hiatus of around 15 years and had been about to strike again when he was finally caught. The end of Raider's first killing spree had started when his first child had been born. Grace had worked on a case in Brighton a while ago, a serial rapist who took his victim's shoes. He had stopped for many years before starting to offend again. The reason he had stopped was that he had got married. Thirty years. Was that too long? Chapter 37 Saturday, the 13th of December He called it hunting. The word had a nice ring to it. The entire city was his hunting ground. In the summer months, dressed in a blazer, and wearing his straw hat at a jaunty angle, he would regularly stroll along under the arches and then along the pier. Next, he would ride on the Volks Railway, where in the cramped intimacy of its hard seats, he liked to talk to strangers, telling them this was the world's oldest still-running electric drain and boring them with facts about it. All the time, as he hunted, walking along or sitting among the grockles, he was taking surreptitious photographs of those he considered had potential to be a project. Photography had become so much easier these days, thanks to his iPhone camera. His potential projects would just see a man making a phone call. They would never know that they would become part of his Hall of Fame. He liked to spend time studying them all, and planning, pages and pages of notes, filling the filing cabinets in his VSP, his very secret place, where he liked to go sometimes to do his planning, because he could think clearly there, away from the distraction of his current projects, and he enjoyed the fact that it was in such a very visible location. VSP. He liked having a VSP. The potentials he most studied were those who radiated vulnerability. Everyone was vulnerable at some point in their lives, but some were always vulnerable. These were the people who showed the biggest fear, and he wanted them to be afraid of him. Very seriously afraid. Nothing excited him more than seeing fear, hearing fear, touching fear, feeling fear, smelling fear. Tasting fear. He liked to keep his potential projects under observation for long periods of time, months often. He liked to follow them. Of course, a lot merely went to the station to return to wherever they had come from. Some went to their cars. Those he would lose. But some walked home or took buses. They made his life much easier. Thursday, Friday and Saturday nights were his favourite times. West Street in Brighton in particular, where it was so easy to be invisible. This gaudy strip of road, which he called Chav Central, ran from Brighton's clock tower down to the seafront. It was lined with amusement arcades and clubs, and populated with drunken, scantily clad youngsters and boisterous hen and stag parties often in ridiculous costumes, all under the watchful eye of a massive police presence. In his view, it was a sewer of humanity, a cesspit. He was always ready to rid it of one of its occupants. Like the one he saw now, wobbling along on her bike, swinging out with no lights on into the sparse King's Road traffic. It had just gone 12.50 a.m. Her name was Ashley Stanford. She was 21 years old. He had been keeping an eye on her for six months now. She worked Friday and Saturday nights behind the bar in a pub in the lanes. When she had finished, she cycled back home to the flat she shared with her boyfriend in a quiet street in Hove, always looking a little bit drunk. She was studying fashion design at Brighton University. Ashley Stanford was, it turned out from his research, a distant but direct descendant of the dynastic landowning family whose ancestors dated back to the 17th century and had at one time owned huge tracts of land around what was then called Brighthelmstone. He liked her historic connection to his city. 
But there was something that he liked much more about her. Oh, yes. Ashley Stanford was perfect. He started the engine, glanced in his mirrors, and drove the streamlined taxi-liveried Skoda estate he had chosen tonight away from the meter bay very slowly, his lights on dipped beam. He smiled to himself at his cunning. It was important to vary his vehicles. Taxis never looked out of place anywhere, and this model was one of the most commonly used in Brighton. He'd bought the vehicle second-hand from a rural dealer in Yorkshire and had a body shop local to them painted with the distinctive turquoise bonnet. The taxi insignia decals he'd had made to order from a firm on the internet and the roof light had been easy to come by. Ashley, with a small rucksack on her back, was pedalling hard, wobbling and swerving around, heading west. Heading home? He'd find out soon enough. There was something very symmetrical about the number three. Two's company, three's a crowd. Felix would be fine with that. Harrison, as ever, would not be so sure. And bloody pedantic Marcus. He would really be against what he was about to do. And that proved he was right. Two's company, three's a crowd. As his old science teacher at school liked to say, QED, quad erat demonstrandum. He tailed Ashley at such a long distance that his dipped headlamps did not even register on her rear reflector. She pedaled on past the peace statue and swung onto the cycle path alongside the hove lawns. He checked his mirrors and there was nothing behind him. Just himself and his pretty, young project, heading home to her boyfriend. Perfect. She came off the cycle path and onto the road to avoid a detour and went over a red light at the junction with Grand Avenue below the stern gaze of the statue of Queen Victoria. Then, a few minutes later, she shot the lights at the junction with Hove Street. My, you're a reckless one. You need to be taught a lesson in road safety. You're not even wearing a helmet. He was feeling impatient, shaking with excitement. He'd like to have taken her out now, but he was aware that there were cameras along the road here. Then suddenly, without indicating, she swung into the centre of the road and turned right past a block of flats on the corner into Carlisle Road. Oh, yes, baby. Perfect. Thank you. Turning off his lights, he turned right also and accelerated. Then, as he drew close to her, he changed gear into neutral, feathered the accelerator pedal and coasted silently for some seconds, perspiring with excitement. Coming up close to her, so close he could see her long brown hair flailing around behind her in the glow of the street lighting. They were halfway up the road, heading towards her flat, just short of the junction with New Church Road. He engaged a gear, silently, pressed the accelerator lightly, drew alongside her, saw her face through his side window, tight with exertion. He swung the steering wheel over to the left. At the same time as hearing the metallic clang, he felt the impact. He braked hard, without squealing the tyres, not wanting to wake the sleeping street. He pulled the hypodermic syringe out of his pocket, then leapt out of the car and ran towards her. God, he said, I'm sorry, I'm so... But there was no need for any apology. She was lying spread-eagled on the pavement, groaning, in shock. He looked over his shoulder, looked around, up at the windows of the houses on both sides of the street that might have had a view. No sign of any movement. He knelt beside her, as if pretending to check her pulse, then opened her mouth, as if checking her airways, but instead he pressed the needle into her tongue and emptied the entire vial of ketamine. He sheathed and pocketed the syringe, looking carefully around again. Then he half lifted, half dragged her to the rear of his car, opened the tailgate and hefted her in. He already had the rear seat folded flat. Then he opened her rucksack with his gloved hands rummaged in it and pulled out her iPhone. Still looking carefully around, he ran back, tossed the phone into a thick laurel hedge beside a garden path, and picked up her bike. He threw that in the rear also, on top of her, shut the tailgate, climbed in, and drove off. He was shaking in anticipation. This felt so good. It really did. His new project. He felt such a burst of happiness deep inside him that he wanted to sing out loud and share how he felt with the whole world. 
I got you, babe. Oh, yeah. Over his shoulder, he said calmly, You're going to be another great project. You really are. Trust me, I'm on a roll. Chapter 38 Saturday the 13th of December Logan lay in a cold sweat, in a vortex of fear, trying to focus her mind which lurched uncontrollably from terror to anger, then back to terror. Hoping, praying that she would wake from this terrible nightmare. At this moment, terror swirled inside her like cold, heavy darkness. It filled her mind, her heart, her lungs, her stomach. Her mouth was dry, she was shaking and whimpering, blinded by her stinging tears and desperately trying to think clearly, to figure her way out of this. Ever since realising the muffled voice was clearly not Jamie's, her mind had been in a mist. Who the hell was her captor? What was going on? Where was she? How long had she been here? The pain where she had been burned on her thigh was agonising, as if acid were eating through her flesh. The pain in her toe was bad too, a steady, insistent throbbing. But she was trying to ignore all the pain, to blot it out. To think, think. She had to think clearly. She had an itch on her nose that was driving her crazy. It had been driving her crazy for what felt like an age. Surely Jamie would have reported her missing. Wouldn't people be out looking for her? Wouldn't there be police combing the streets, fields, woods, dragging lakes, like she had seen in movies? How long has she been here? How long? No matter how hard she writhed and twisted her head, she couldn't see the face of her watch. She thought back to when she had phoned Jamie. Hours ago? Days ago? Weeks ago? She'd heard the instant concern in his voice, He'd registered that she was frightened in those moments before her car door had been ripped open and she'd seen the masked face above her. A tsunami of fear crashed through her at the memory. Jamie must have tried to phone her back. What happened when he didn't get an answer? He'd have gone to the police, surely. He'd have known she wasn't joking. So what had he done? Who had he alerted? What was happening out there beyond the walls of her prison? Prison. Captor. Her anger flared again. Whoever the hell you are, what gives you the right to imprison me? How dare you do this to me? She writhed and pulled and pushed out against her increasingly painful bonds. Shit, this was ridiculous. She had so much to do. Patients who needed her. A big party on Saturday night that she'd really been looking forward to. A reunion of all the girls from their year in school and their partners. At the Exeter Street Church Hall, they had all helped save from developers. There was going to be a load of people there she hadn't seen in over five years. With a sudden flash of panic, she realised she didn't know how far away Saturday night was, or had it already passed. Her mind kept veering to horror movies she'd seen, crazies who kidnapped people and tortured and then killed them. Hostel, the bone collector, the silence of the land. Was this what had happened to her? Not here, not in Brighton, not in this city she loved and where she always felt so safe, surely not. Then she thought of the screams of the woman she had heard, followed by the terrible gurgling, the rasping sound, like a death rattle. Then the silence. How long ago was that? Who else was in here? Was she going to be next? She was bloody well not going to let that happen. Somehow, she had to keep clear-headed. How did people get out of situations like this? She tried again to move her arms, but they were strapped down too tightly. There was some kind of restraint across her midriff, across her neck, her thighs and her ankles. With all her strength, she tried to raise her head again until the strap cut into her throat too much. What the hell was she in? The burning sensation on the inside of her right leg suddenly became even more acute, as if it had caught fire, but she couldn't even move her arms to touch the area. She lay back in the pitch darkness, her mouth parched again. Her sugar levels were going down again too, she realised, the all-too-familiar jittery feeling starting to return. Then she heard a noise that chilled her. 
despite the sound being muffled. The words were clear. A woman's voice, screaming. Let me go, you bastard! Then the man's voice, shouting out in anger and pain. Ow! Then again, ow! Hope rose inside her. Ah, you bitch! There was a crashing sound. She heard a woman's voice yelling. Get your hands off me, you bastard perv! Go, Logan urged. Go! Then she heard a dull thud, followed by the woman screaming out in pain. Then another thud, like a hammer against a sack. Then another. Then the man's voice in a chilling rage. Look what you've made me do, you bitch. You've spoiled my fun. You realise that? You've spoiled my fun. Then Logan heard the scream again. It was a terrible sound. Deep, powerful, fueled by absolute terror. Help me! Oh my God, help me! Then another thud. Then silence. Logan lay there shaking, waiting. Then the man's voice again. It was followed by another thud. Then another. Then another. Then silence. Logan lay, listening, trembling. But all she could hear was the silence. She was sinking low, she realised, heading into a hypo. Suddenly she heard the sliding sound above her and, an instant later, was blinded by a brilliant beam of light. A lump of chocolate was rammed into her mouth, then the muffled voice again. Eat that. I don't want to lose you too. We're not ready for that yet. Please, please tell me who you are, she spluttered through her mouthful of sweetness. Tell me what you want. Please tell me. I have what I want, he replied. The lid slid shut above her. Chapter 39 Saturday the 13th of December Roy Grace woke at 5am, 20 minutes before the alarm set on the clock and the backup alarm on his iPhone. Cleo was sound asleep, breathing heavily, facing away from him, spooned against him, his right arm beneath her pillow. He could hear rain pelting down outside and listened, as he did every time he woke during the night, for the sounds of Noah breathing through the baby monitor. His son sounded fine. He felt leadenly tired and could easily have lapsed back into sleep, but he needed to energise himself for what he anticipated to be a long and hard day ahead. Trying not to wake Cleo, Noah had already done that twice during the night, he gently, slowly, wormed his arm free. As he did so, she stirred. You're off, darling, she murmured, half asleep still. I'll take Humphrey for a quick run. Love you. He kissed her shoulder. Love you so much, he said. Then he slipped naked out of bed and stood shivering in the chilly darkness. Mind if I put on the light for a moment? I'm awake, she said. He switched on his bedside light, shuffled through into the bathroom, closed the door, then put on the bright light in there and, yawning, switched on his electric toothbrush. Five minutes later, dressed in his tracksuit and a baseball cap and trying to shush an excited Humphrey, who was jumping up at him and barking, he let himself and the dog out of the front door holding the lead in one hand and a plastic bag in the other in case, as was likely, Humphrey decided to have a dump en route. He ran across the cobbled courtyard to the front gates, attached Humphrey's lead, then ran out into the street and threaded his way past the silent houses and closed shops and cafes down towards the seafront. He loved the city at this hour, when it was still mostly sleeping. Loved the feeling of being up ahead of the rest of the world, he had always been able to cope on relatively little sleep, which stood him in good stead in this job, where snatching just a few hours was often the norm, and he had even more sleep deprivation now that he had a restless baby. The rain pattering against his face and the salty tang of the air felt and smelled good. He crossed the deserted King's Road in the misty glare of the street lighting, then freed Humphrey, who bounded off ahead, and ran down the ramp by the arches with the long, dark silhouette of Brighton Pier, or palace pier, as he still preferred to call it, over to his left, and headed west towards the sad, rusted, skeletal remains of the West Pier, 
which had been gutted by a fire over a decade ago, and day by day was steadily crumbling into the sea. As he ran, wide awake and increasingly clear-headed, his thoughts on the day ahead were crystallising. Just before going to bed at midnight, he'd checked his emails and seen that the Sussex Police rugby team, of which he was the president, was a man short, due to illness, for an important fixture this afternoon. Could he play, or find a last-minute substitute? It was a mundane task in the middle of such a critical operation, but he needed to deal with it. So far, there had been no replies from the two possible players he had emailed, hardly surprising, given the early hour. His thoughts focused back on Logan Somerville, who had now been missing since around 5.30pm Thursday, 36 hours. Both the new ACC and the Police and Crime Commissioner had phoned him late last night for updates, telling him how important it was to find her. Neither of them needed to do that. He was motivated enough as it was. Ever since Sandy had vanished over a decade ago, he knew the anguish the disappearance of a loved one caused. He had lived it every single day and despite his deep love for Cleo, the pain of Sandy's disappearance was still there in his heart and in his soul. He had not yet told either Pew or Roygaard of his bigger concerns. Humphrey looked a tad miffed when he stopped opposite the remains of the West Pier and turned around. The dog barked, as if saying to him that normally they would run much longer, towards Hove Lagoon at least. Sorry, boy, I have to get to work. I have to find someone very urgently, OK? Humphrey suddenly bounded ahead and ran onto the beach, crunching across the pebbles, on a mission. What is it, boy? he called. Then, in the faint glow from the promenade lighting, he saw Humphrey stop, lie on his back and begin rolling vigorously backwards and forwards. Grace realised to his dismay what was happening. Humphrey! he shouted. No! No, boy, no! He unzipped his pocket, tugged out his phone, found the torch app and switched it on, then ran, stumbling and unsteadily, over the pebbles, shouting for the dog to stop. Humphrey! He stood over the rolling hound and bellowed again. Contritely, Humphrey scrambled to his feet and stared up at him. Moments later, the sickening, putrid smell hit him. In the bright beam of light, he saw the splayed legs and claws and white belly of the long-dead, busted open crab. He toyed for a moment with dragging the dog into the sea to try to clean him, but the waves were pounding hard and he thought it too risky. So instead, the stench accompanied him all the way home as Humphrey ran alongside him, pleased as punch with himself and mightily proud of the new cologne he was wearing. This is all I sodding need, Roy Grace whispered to the dog, holding him tightly by the collar and gagging as he let himself back into the house. He dragged him, resisting every inch of the way, paws scraping across the floor and up the stairs into the bathroom, shut the door behind them, then lifted him into the bathtub, turned on the taps, picked up the hand shower and washed away, as best he could, the worst of the fetid, putrid mess on the dog's back. Thirty minutes later, having showered, shaved and gulped down a microwave bowl of instant porridge and a few sips of tea, he kissed Cleo, fast asleep again goodbye, then slipped out of the house. Humphrey, lying in his basket down in the living room, did not even raise his head. He opened one eye, dismissively, as if some alien dog turd had just departed from his home. Chapter 40 Saturday the 13th of December Jacob Van Damme had a sleepless night in the spare bedroom across the corridor from his wife's room, where he had spent most nights for the past decade, with a mask over his face, delivering compressed air. He'd suffered sleep apnea for years, snoring heavily and turning restlessly, constantly waking his wife, until she couldn't take it any longer. He'd actually been sleeping pretty well recently, he thought. But the emotional turmoil in his mind, since the strange Dr. Harrison Hunter, if indeed he was any kind of medical doctor, had entered his life and his head, was now keeping him awake. The man was worrying him like hell. Who are you, Dr. Hunter? What sick game are you trying to play with me? He was trying to think clearly through his tiredness. You are dead. What was that about? He'd had plenty of experience in his career of people with sick fantasies. 
They would read of a crime in the media and immediately phone the police and confess to it. Fortunately, most clever senior investigating officers kept back certain bits of information that would be known only to the offender and to no one else, which helped them to eliminate time wasters. Yet there was something about Dr Hunter that prevented him from dismissing him completely. His confidence, his body language, his whole behaviour, erratic though it was, made him feel deeply uncomfortable. Would he be helping to find his niece by calling the police and telling them what he knew, or would he be condemning Logan to death? He felt, and he had been dwelling on this all through the day and night, that Hunter did know something of value. The man had paid his secretary the £500 consultancy fee in cash before the appointment. Would someone who was just a fantasist really have done that? He looked at the luminous digital figures of his clock radio. 6.05am. Logan was beautiful, smart and kind. She had always had a childlike innocence about her. She was not the kind of person to suddenly disappear. What did Harrison Hunter know? Where did his idea that she had a tattoo come from? He drifted into an uneasy sleep. When he awoke a short while later, to Rachel standing over him with a cup of tea in her hand, wishing him a good morning, and reminding him they had to go to the christening of their granddaughter Hannah today down in Chichester, his mind was no clearer as to what he ought to do. Chapter 41 Saturday the 13th of December Logan stood on a white sandy beach, with the flat blue ocean stretching out beyond. She was in a silky, slinky white dress, and Jamie, in a white suit, stood by her side, in front of the chaplain. Everyone she loved and cared about stood all around her in the glorious, warm Fouquet sunshine. Jamie kissed her on her cheek. We've had our differences, but we got through them, didn't we, my angel? She kissed him back and whispered, we have, my darling. You're the one I want. The only one I've ever wanted. I love you so much. You just make me feel so happy, all of the time. Forever. Then the sky clouded over. Her father looked up and said, It's about to rain. The light was fading. No, she said. Please don't let it. Please stop it. Then darkness enveloped her. She woke. Total darkness. She was drenched in perspiration, remembering. Remembering. And began shivering. The sounds she had heard some while ago. Screams. Terrible screams. She squirmed in terror at the memory. Help me, she cried out. Someone please help me. She became aware again of the painful burning sensation on her right thigh. Again she tried to move her arms, then her painfully cramped legs and her throbbing toe. She hadn't prayed since her early teens, maybe even before then. But she began praying now, closing her eyes even though it was dark. Please, God, help me. Please, please help me. Then she lay thinking, what the hell was happening? The man in the car park. Who the hell was he and why was he doing this? She remembered reading about the Stockholm Syndrome. People who bonded with their captors. She had to stifle her fury and bond with this man. Somehow. Hello, she called out. Hello! She took a deep breath and then, with all her strength, shouted out again, Hello! A few feet away from her, in the darkness, out of her line of vision, not that she could have seen anything. He looked down at his project and smiled. Oh, yes, just how I like you. Shout again. Shout as much as you like. As if obliging him, she did. Again he smiled. No one will hear you. No one can possibly hear you. No one even knows that where we are exists. Chapter 42 Saturday the 13th of December 
Roy Grace called the Saturday briefing in the conference room of Sussex House for an hour earlier than usual, 7.30am. He had a lot to get through, and in addition, somehow, he had to find the time to finish writing his eulogy for the funeral. He informed his team that although it was too early at this stage to be certain, there were disturbing parallels between Operation Mona Lisa and Operation Haywain, but he made it absolutely clear no one was to mention this to anyone outside of either operation. Norman Potting raised his arm. He was looking pale and his eyes bloodshot, whether from tiredness or crying over Bella, Grace could not tell. He was aware that the DS hadn't been sleeping. Yes, Norman? Boss, I may have a significant development. I've been in contact with some very helpful people at the DVLA. One was on the phone with me for hours last night, going through Volvo estate cars with registered keepers in the Brighton and Hove area. He's just come up with a vehicle registered to a Martin Horner at an address over in the west of the city in Port Slade. A residential house, 62 Blenheim Street. Looking close to collapsing from exhaustion, Potting covered a yawn with his hand, then continued. I went over to the CCTV room at John Street, first checking the records back on the ANPR cameras. They've plotted this same suspect vehicle on a direct path from Chesham Gate, where the victim was last recorded, along Dyke Road at corresponding times. He yawned again. We then checked the CCTV cameras in the relevant areas and we found the Volvo and were able to read the rear licence plate. It's the same vehicle. Brilliant, Norman, Grace said. You should go home and get some rest. Potting shook his head. I want to see this one through, Chief. You haven't had much sleep. I'll sleep next week after... He leaned forward and buried his face in his hands. After Bella's funeral, Grace knew he meant. He let it ride. Even though he knew the time, he checked his watch. 7.35am. Dawn raids were the best for catching villains at home, but on a weekend, hopefully the offender would be having a cosy lie-in. He waded up for some moments. His prime concern was to ensure Logan Somerville's safety. An unsuccessful or botched raid could greatly endanger an abduction victim's life. But statistics were already long against them. It was over 36 hours since her reported disappearance. He turned to DC Alec Davies. Alec, we need a search warrant application, fast. Go to the on-call magistrate and get it signed. I'll get a local support team unit on standby. Good work, Norman. D.S. Kale raised her arm. Sir, she said to Roy Grace, as you know, and for the benefit of everyone else here, I had a call just before the start of this briefing from the duty D.I. at John Street. There's been another possible overnight abduction of a young woman in the city. Grace's sense of foreboding was growing by the minute. Was his worst nightmare coming true? Tanya, please tell everyone what we know, he prompted. Tanya Kale looked down at her notes. Her name's Ashley Stanford, 21, a fashion design student at Brighton University. She shares a flat with her boyfriend in Carlisle Road. Her boyfriend phoned in at 3am, concerned that she hadn't arrived home. She works Friday and Saturday nights in the Druid's Head pub in the Lanes. Apparently, she's always home by 1am. She hadn't phoned him, and when he tried to call her, it went to voicemail. Maybe she went off with one of the customers, Guy Bachelor quiz. It's possible, Kale said. The boyfriend was concerned because she always cycles home. He'd phoned the Sussex County Hospital to see if she'd been admitted following an accident. When that came back negative, he then phoned us to report his concerns. Grace thought for some moments. Another woman heading home to her boyfriend. Was there something in that? Do we have a picture of her? he asked. No, sir. Get me a recent one, please. Urgently. Chapter 43 Saturday the 13th of December An hour later, Roy Grace, with Tanya Kale beside him in the passenger seat, turned the unmarked grey Ford Mondeo left off the old Shoreham Road into Blenheim Street, a narrow street of small, semi-detached 1950s houses that ran south down towards Shoreham Port. Cars, vans and a couple of taxis, as well as an old converted ambulance, were parked along both sides. Without stopping, they clocked number 62, a tired-looking house with flaking paintwork and an unloved front strip of garden. But there was only one Volvo in the whole street, a small recent model with a completely different licence plate. He felt the same butterflies he got in his stomach on every raid he ever attended. What dangers did his team face going through the door? 
What would they find? The car's probably garaged somewhere nearby, Tanya Kale said. He's unlikely to be stupid enough to have left it outside. Grace nodded. His mind was on the abducted girl from last night, Ashley Stamford. He checked his iPhone to see if a picture of her had come through yet. Then it rang. It was the critical incident manager, Superintendent Steve Curry. All in position, Charlie One. Are you ready? Grace looked at Kale. She nodded. Yes, yes, he replied. Let's go. Adrenaline kicking in now, he turned the car around as fast as he could. Two white vans appeared at the top of the street and accelerated down towards him, both of them halting double-parked outside Number 62 and its immediate neighbours. He pulled up, nose on to the first, a small van, out of which clambered two dog handlers in black jackets and trousers with black baseball caps marked police. They opened the rear doors and led two German shepherds down the path along the side of the house to cover the side and rear of the property. Out of the second, much larger, transit van poured eight local support team officers wearing blue combat suits with body armour and helmets with visors down. The two front runners carried the battering and hydraulic rams. They were followed by the rest of their colleagues. Grace and Kale climbed out of the car but stayed back, as the protocols required, until the property was declared safe by the LST's inspector, Anthony Martin. Six of the eight armoured officers grouped outside the front door, waiting for the command, while the other two followed the dog handlers around to the rear of the house. The inspector gave the signal. All six LST officers yelled in unison in classic shock and awe procedure, Police! 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 The first team member fired up the ram, pushing the two sides of the doorframe wide apart. The second pounded the door with the battering ram and it splintered open almost instantly. All of them barged through, yelling at the top of their voices, Police! Don't move! Police! Police! The two detectives waited on the pavement. After less than two minutes, the tall, thin figure of Inspector Anthony Martin appeared in the front doorway, his visor up and with a perplexed expression. He signalled them to come in. As they walked up to him, he said, Not very convinced about what we have here, Roy. Are you sure about your intel? And what do you have? Come and see. Inside had a smell of musty furniture and cats. He entered a living and dining area with an elderly three-piece suite and a small dining table on which lay the remains of a meal and a copy of today's Daily Express and an old-fashioned kitchen beyond that reminded Grace of his childhood. Two officers were opening cupboards and removing cushions from the sofa and chairs. Accompanied by Tanya Kale, he followed Martin up the narrow stair treads. As they reached the landing at the top, two fat tabby cats shot past them and downstairs. Is the ambulance coming? I thought you was the ambulance, said an elderly, whining female voice. I called them. I have to get to Worthing Hospital. I have an appointment, you see. I thought you was the ambulance. Grace looked down at a carpet discoloured with stains and what looked like cat faeces littering it and wrinkled his nose. There was a smell of urine and body odour. It was the kind of place officers used to joke in his early days, when he had been a beat copper, where you had to wipe your feet on the way out. Above him was an open loft hatch, with an extended loft ladder down to the floor. Following the inspector, and trying to step in the patches of carpet between the droppings of cat shit, he entered a bedroom. Lying on the bed was an elderly woman, in her late seventies or even mid-eighties, patches of pink skull showing through her threadbare white hair, who was so fat it took him some moments to figure out where her multiple chins ended, and her face began. Her face reminded him of one of the three-dimensional maps in geography lessons at school, showing hills in relief. They said the ambulance would be here by nine o'clock. I can't get up, you see. I'm ill. Grace had to struggle to stop himself telling her what he thought was actually wrong with her as he stared at the box of doughnuts and another almost empty giant-sized box of Cadbury's dairy milk chocolates on her bedside table. On the ancient television on a table just beyond the end of the bed was a fuzzy image of James Martin cooking in his kitchen. Instead, he flashed his warrant card at her, holding his breath, trying not to breathe in any more of her stinking vapour than he needed. Detective Superintendent Grace, Surrey and Sussex Major Crime Team, he said. I'm afraid we're not your taxi service. I'm looking for Martin Horner. Who do you say? She wrinkled her face. Martin Horner. His Volvo car is registered at this address. Never heard that name. 
and he didn't have no car here. It's the ambulance on its way. I'm going to be late for my appointment. I can't get out of bed on me own, you see. I'm very ill. What's your name, madam? Tanya Kale asked. Anne. Anne Hill. Do you have a carer who comes in, Mrs Hill? Grace asked. No, I'm all on me own. I had one for a short time, but not any more. He stopped coming. Probably because he'd seen through her, Grace thought, and stared at her eyes. What's your full name, Mrs Hill? Hill. Anne. Just Anne Hill. Still staring at her eyes, he asked, Someone had breakfast downstairs, Mrs Hill, and bought a copy of today's Daily Express. Can you explain that? No, she said. No, I don't know nothing about that. I can't get up, you see. Grace pressed. If you can't get out of bed, then who else is here or was here? The old woman was silent for some moments. Her eyes were racing around from right to left, as if searching for a convincing answer. Just me, dear. Behind him, he heard a voice call out, The loft's empty. He turned to see an officer from the LST, torch in hand, clambering down the ladder. So who had breakfast here this morning, Mrs Hill? Tanya Kale asked. Martin Horner? She screwed up her face, looking puzzled. Martin Horner? Who's he? The two detectives looked at each other. As you are bedridden and unable to get up, I'm assuming Martin Horner is the man who bought today's express and ate his breakfast downstairs, unless you have a better suggestion. The old woman's face reddened. She looked fearful, her eyes like two marbles, rolling around as if disconnected from any nerves or tendons. No, no, I... no, I can't explain that. Anne Hill, I'm arresting you on suspicion of obstructing the police. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Is that clear? With even greater agility than her two overweight cats, the elderly woman suddenly sprang out of bed, her layers of fat wobbling beneath her translucent nighty, and stood, unsteadily for some moments, then unhooked a filthy-looking dressing gown from behind the door and pulled it around her. It's all right, she said. It was me. I went out and got me paper and had me breakfast. Why did you lie to us? Tanya Kale said sternly. To his dismay, because he knew what was coming, Grace realised the woman was telling the truth. Paramedics were always complaining about people like this woman who abused the ambulance service. They would feign immobility to get a free ride to hospital instead of having to fork out for a taxi. It was a standing, sour joke among the paramedics that for many hours each day their ambulances were nothing other than big yellow taxis. Shall I call and cancel the ambulance, Mrs Hill? he asked. Or would you like me to arrest you for defrauding the National Health Service instead of a charge of obstructing the police? She nodded vigorously. Yes, she said. Yes, dear, cancel. I'll call a taxi. She scurried with surprising speed down the stairs. Grace and Kale looked at each other and shook their heads. So where is Martin Horner? the D.I. asked him. Not here, Grace replied gloomily, and never has been. We've been led on a sodding wild goose chase. As he stepped outside and walked back to the car, his iPhone pinged with an incoming text with a photograph. It was from the duty inspector at John Street Police Station. Roy, was told you needed this urgently. Photograph of Misper, Ashley Stanford. He tapped on the postage stamp-sized image on his screen to enlarge it and stopped in his tracks. Chapter 44 Saturday the 13th of December Logan cried with terror and frustration. The salty tears stung her eyes and she was desperate to wipe them. She struggled against her bonds, but still she could not move her arms. She lay in the pitch darkness, shaking, alternating with flashes of fury, her thoughts a constant jumble. Was anyone looking for her? Was she in hell? Her maternal grandmother was devout, a member of a strict chapel. She had warned Logan on every occasion they had met of hell and damnation, to beware of sinning and the consequences of being a sinner. Had the old woman been right? What the hell was going on? Who was this weirdo who was keeping her here? What was going on in the outside world beyond this hellhole? 
Hell. She was beginning to realize what hell really was. Hell wasn't some biblical dungeon of fire and brimstone. Hell was darkness. Hell was listening to people she could not see and did not know, crying out in terror and pain, listening to people being hurt and dying. Hell was eternal darkness and eternal fear. Praying had not worked. It had changed nothing. Her mouth was parched. She had to find a way of communicating with her captor, had to bond with him somehow, whoever he was, wherever she was. Some time ago, she wasn't sure if it was minutes or hours, she had heard what sounded like birdsong, very faint. The dawn chorus, sparrows, thrushes, starlings, blackbirds. Was she in the city? or in the countryside. Suddenly, very faintly, she heard a siren wailing. Her hopes rose, the police, on their way. Still faint, as if in the distance, the siren grew louder. Louder still. Please, God, please, please. Then it faded again. Please come back. Please, please. Come back. Her thigh still burned like hell. Agonizing cramp had returned to her right leg and she couldn't stretch it away. She wanted to scream out for help, but she was scared of the man. So scared. She had to be smart, strong. But how? Her thoughts went back to the terrified voice she'd heard some while back. Help me! Oh my God, help me! The thudding sounds, the cries, more thudding sounds, and then silence. Whoever had brought her here, the man in the shadows in the underground car park, must want something. What? What could she offer him? Her body? Money? Jamie had always been fascinated by television documentaries on serial killers. She twisted in terror at the thought. Maniacs who got pleasure out of torturing and killing women. Please, don't let any of this be happening to me. She heard a scraping sound above her. The lid was being moved back. She saw a green glow, then blinding light in her face. Moments later, she tasted honey. She sucked it gratefully. Then more. She swallowed. It was followed by deliciously cold water. She gulped it down. Then she said, Can we talk? Please? Please can we talk? She heard another scraping sound. The lid was closing again. Then silence. Chapter 45 Saturday the 13th of December We're having a bloody emergency early meeting this morning. That stupid bitch, Ashley Stanford, should not have hit me. She should not have resisted. My projects are meant to be passive. I dictate what happens to them. It's my agenda, not theirs. Everything's going pear-shaped. <laughs> That's how it feels. And it feels that I'm surrounded by flakes. Ashley Stanford died before I had any fun with her. A bitch. Felix is telling me to calm down, that it's fine, that sometimes shit happens. He's really the one I can trust the most. I don't think Harrison's help matters with his idea about that sodding London shrink. What was he thinking? He has a dangerous, sadistic streak. He's a loose cannon. He's suggesting another visit, but I don't think that's a good idea. He says he likes to push the envelope, that it gives him pleasure to present people with conundrums. Although I have to admit what the shrink said made me smile. It's the only thing that has made me smile for a long time. I've now got two dead projects. Two that I need to dispose of. Marcus is angry with me. He thinks I should have controlled myself last night, taught Ashley Stanford a lesson, but not killed her. Now I'm all out of sequence. Logan Somerville should have been next. I need to find a new one this week. Then I can move Logan up the chain. 
Well, the good news is there are plenty of potential new projects lining up. The four of us are taking a look at their photos right now. The front runners in my Hall of Fame. On the big screen on the wall, copies of each of the 35 photographs of the young women who might make suitable projects, whom he had spotted and followed during the past months, appeared in sequence, their names and addresses beneath them. Two of them he had first seen on the Volks Railway. Another had arrived grinning with her boyfriend at the end of the ghost train ride on Brighton Pier. Another he had snapped sitting outside Love Fit Cafe in Queen's Road. Another he had first seen lying on the grass with two girlfriends on the pavilion lawns. Another on the Hove lawns. Another outside the Big Beach Cafe. Another, one that really excited him for reasons he couldn't totally explain, except that she looked like a younger version of his bitch wife, was eating prawns outside the Brighton Shellfish and Oyster Bar, a cream-painted stall famed for its seafood down by the arches. Eating standing up. That was a sin in his book. He despised people who ate standing up. Food wasn't just fuel. It should be savoured, enjoyed, shared with friends. Eaten seated. It was like those vile women who smoked while walking along. Smoking sitting down was fine, sometimes elegant. But women who walked with a fag in their mouth were slags. Flotsam. They should be eliminated. But he could hardly be expected to clean up the entire city single-handed. On that point, Felix, Marcus and Harrison were all agreed. Nice to have consensus. And now... As he froze one particular image, they all agreed again. That one, Felix said. Harrison studied it for some moments and then said, Yes, that one. Even Bolshe Marcus, who always took some time convincing, had no issues here. I'm with you, that one. All happy, guys? They agreed. They were all happy. Unanimous. That was rare. Although she was fairly new, she was so perfect. It had to be her. Her name was Freya Northrop. He knew a lot about her. He would enjoy taking her. She'd be a great project. His mood changed. He felt happy again. Happy all over. We're strong. He thought, the four of us, we're like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Conquest, war, famine, death. He smiled. He liked that a lot. The four horsemen. Chapter 46, Saturday the 13th of December. Roy Grace dropped Tanya Kale back at Sussex House then drove as fast as he dared downtown, heading for John Street Police Station, better known to all the local officers as Brighton Nick. He drove almost on autopilot. He was stressed about their impending move, desperately wishing they could delay it, but it wasn't possible. The new owners were moving into Cleo's house next weekend. Though he had planned to be there to help Cleo with packing everything up, with the way this inquiry was going, that was not going to be an option. Sure, he was excited about the new house and the prospect of living in the countryside, but he barely had room for that in his thoughts at this moment. His absolute priority, for however long it took, was Logan Somerville, as well as the new potential abductee, Ashley Stanford. His concerns for her were deepening and darkening every second. Martin Horner The Holmes... Home Office Large Major Inquiry System analyst team on Operation Haywain had so far identified hundreds of Martin Horners in the UK and was working through the list. One was 93 years old, suffering from Alzheimer's in a care home in Bradford. One was 17, at school in Newark, Lincolnshire, and the third was a 63-year-old vicar in Oldham, Lancashire, with a solid alibi. He was increasingly certain that Martin Horner was a cleverly constructed false identity, clever enough to have been able to register a vehicle in this name. The one mystery remaining was why whoever Martin Horner was had selected Anne Hill's house for his fake registration address. Did he know her? Or someone who knew her? Or had he just picked her address at random? The old bag who lived there was strenuously denying knowledge of any Martin Horner, and he had a feeling she was telling the truth. 
but they would find out for sure. He drove up the steep hill towards the White Hawk area of Brighton, then made a right into the open, lower car park of the police station, found an empty bay between a row of marked cars, then climbed out, staring affectionately up at the five-storey slab of a building where he had started his career over twenty years ago. He hurried past a couple of young uniformed officers having a smoke, up to the rear entrance, and used his pass card to open the door. Here, at John Street, he always felt the pulse of excitement. Street crime, neighbourhood policing, child protection, public order policing, and many other divisional units were run out of this place, which was soon to have a massive facelift. He'd recently discussed the possibility of promotion to head of CID, but that would have tied him to a desk and endless meetings. The buzz in his job came from doing exactly what he was doing right now, fully hands-on on a major crime investigation. There was only one promotion he would ever consider, and that was the top job here at John Street, the chief superintendent job, divisional commander of Brighton and Hove. The current commander, Nev Kemp, and his predecessor, Graham Barrington, had both come from similar CID backgrounds to himself. It could be some years before Nev Kemp moved on up the career ladder, but when that time came, he might be tempted to put himself forward for the role. But right now, as he bypassed the lift and sprinted up the two flights of concrete stairs, that thought was a long way from his mind. He turned right along the familiar corridor, then almost instantly turned right again. Ahead of him were signs saying Superintendent and Chief Superintendent. But before them, he stopped at an open door on his left. Inside the small office sat Wayne Brooks, the slightly camp duty CID inspector hunched over his desk, phone clamped to his ear, writing down notes on an electronic tablet. Grace waited impatiently for him to finish. Then he stepped into the office. Brooks, a thin, wiry man in a grey suit and with a shaven head, looked up. Roy, darling, good morning. How are you? I've been better. Congrats on your promotion. Four months ago, but thank you. It's wonderful. I'm loving it. Nice to see you here. Anything I can help you on? I hope so. You've a reported misper from last night. Name of Ashley Stamford? Yes, that was her boyfriend I was just on the phone to. What's the latest? Not looking good. No one's heard from her. Not her parents, nor either of her two closest friends. Sounds out of character. She's a pretty stable person, not likely to have run off on a one-night stand, although she's a fashion design student. I'd have thought that world might be a bit flighty, or, you know, flaky. What info do you have on her? Just got a couple of pictures through from her mother and from the boyfriend, that one that was sent to you. I've sent copies up to CCTV. There won't have been that many solitary women cycling home at around 1am this morning. Can I see the others? Sure. Brooks tapped his keyboard. After some moments, the image of an attractive young woman appeared. She was smiling, looking like she hadn't a care in the world, against a glorious summery backdrop of Brighton Pier and the crowded beach beside it. Grace stared again at the pretty face he had seen on the text earlier, at her high cheekbones, her full lips, her long brown hair. Ashley Stamford, Logan Somerville and Emma Johnson could have been sisters. And so, if you ignored the thirty-year gap, could Katie Westerham. Presumably someone's tried her mobile phone, Grace asked. Yes, her boyfriend's rung it continuously. It's still on. We've put a request into EE, the service provider for triangulation, but I don't think we're going to get much back for a while. Has the boyfriend been interviewed yet? Grace asked. Not yet, no. He looked at his watch. It was just coming up to midday. Shit, why not? He said, more angrily than he had intended. Because I'm short-handed, thanks to all the sodding cuts, darling, Brooks said. If you want the truth. Grace nodded. Yep. OK, give me his address. I'll get one of my team there right now to interview him. Is there something more to this, Roy, that I don't know about? I hope to hell not. But if you want the truth, I think there is. And it's not good news. You need to start increasing the number of officers you have available for this coming week. I'll give you a heads up now that we could be looking at cancelling all rest days imminently and banning new applications for time off. The inspector frowned. Something big going on? Grace stared down again at Ashley Stamford's image. It's looking increasingly like it.
Chapter 47 Sunday the 14th of December They're on the table, getting cold, Zack shouted, and we have to get going. Freya Northrop lay in bed, reading and enjoying the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which her new doctor, the eccentric but rather jolly Edward Crisp, had been talking about when she'd had her appointment with him on Friday. She'd left his surgery, walked straight down to Church Road, turned left and along to where it morphed into Western Road, entered City Books, and asked if they had any volumes of T.S. Eliot poetry, then headed home. She yawned and called out, Almost finished. Be one minute. She could smell the tantalising aroma of warm toast. The alarm clock beside her read 9.40am. He shouted back, You said you'd be one minute already. That was about five minutes ago. You wanted your eggs soft. They'll be stone cold. Wow. You sure found out stuff you didn't know about someone when you started living with them, Freya thought. Like one of them was goodbye to her Sunday morning lions. Zack hated to waste a minute of the weekend, and had already been up for hours, finally realising the only way he was going to get her out of bed was by tempting her with her favourite Sunday breakfast, scrambled eggs and smoked salmon. Besides, she thought ruefully, in any case, Sundays as a day off were about to become a thing of the past. Zack Ferguson was an accomplished chef. She'd met him six months ago, when he came into the Notting Hill restaurant where she was waitressing, and where he ate alone. He had returned the next night, alone again, and spent every moment that he could chatting her up. She'd realised by the time she brought him a double espresso at the end of his meal that she was a little bit smitten. Being a totally rubbish cook, she had bought herself a bunch of cookery books, and the one she had found the most comprehensible, and which provided really tasty and easy-to-prepare recipes, was called Don't Sweat the Aubergine by someone called Nicholas Clee. It lay beside her bed now. Zack had big plans. Thanks to an inheritance, which had also paid for this small, executor sale Edwardian mock Tudor house in a leafy close near Hove Park, he'd quit his job at an uber-cool restaurant in London's Hoxton and had bought a bankrupt Brighton restaurant, which he was in the process of revamping. When it opened in two months' time, Freya was going to be the front-of-house manager. Until then, he was full-on travelling to the best seafood restaurants around the country, seeing what was on offer, what ideas he could glean and recipes he could borrow and improve on. Today they were making the two-hour drive to Whitstable in North Kent at the mouth of the Thames estuary. Famed for its oysters, in recent years the town had become increasingly fashionable with a number of highly rated restaurants. They were booked to have lunch at two of them. But there were two gastropubs he wanted to check out on the way, hence the early start. Zack, who had already done a twenty-mile bike ride at 5.30 this morning, remained thin as a rake, despite the eating marathon they had embarked upon. Freya had put on over a stone. One effect, which had pleased Zack, was that her breasts, never her best feature, had become larger. Another effect, which seriously displeased her, was that her thighs had become larger and dimpled. She should start exercising too, she knew. Dr. Crisp had asked her about that, and had frowned when she'd admitted to smoking ten cigarettes a day, and had frowned even more when she'd confessed to downing the best part of a bottle of white wine a day. You should stop smoking, and that's too much for someone your age to be drinking, he had admonished her. He was right, she knew, but she enjoyed both, and they were pleasures she shared with Zack. After a year on her own, since she'd been crassly dumped by her previous boyfriend, by text, Zack made her smile. She loved his energy, his humour and his ambition. And she loved just how much he genuinely seemed to enjoy cooking for her, trying out his recipes. Although she'd been less happy last night when he'd knocked over a saucepan and two very bolshy lobsters had skittered across the floor, claws clacking, causing her to shriek and jump onto a chair in fright. She looked back at the T.S. Eliot poem. God, how prescient Dr. Crisp had been. It was all about food. References to sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, tea and toast, a life measured out with coffee spoons, tea and cakes and ices. They were in a seaside city, and today they were going to another seaside place. And here, in this poem, Eliot had written about growing old and wearing the bottoms of his trousers rolled. Would Zack be like this one day?
would they grow old together? Walk along the seashore, he with his trousers rolled up and barefoot in the lapping water. She could see it. For the first time in her life, she had met someone she could truly see having a life with, growing old with. She put the poem down, slipped naked out of bed, and pulled her dressing gown round her. Then she walked barefoot downstairs into the kitchen, where Zack was sitting, showered, shaved, and dressed in a T-shirt and jeans, smelling of the aftershave she loved, and studying the food pages of the Observer. She put her arms around his neck and kissed him on the cheek. You smell delicious, she said. The breakfast was laid out the artistic way it might have been in a top-rated restaurant. The eggs splayed on the plate, with slivers of truffle on top, the smoked salmon in neat curls beside it, interspersed with slices of lemon and a display of sliced cherry tomatoes. The toast was in a silver rack, butter in a square modern dish. This looks seriously yum, she nuzzled his ear, almost as yum as you. Your eggs are going to be rock hard. She slid her hand down onto his thigh, then around to his crotch. Mmm, she said. They're not the only things hard around here. Eat your bloody breakfast, girl, he said, stifling a grin. Then he turned and kissed her back. An hour later, they went downstairs again and walked out of the front door of the house into the dry, blustery morning. Zack's old MX-5 was parked in the short driveway in front of the integral garage, alongside Freya's beat-up Fiesta. The MX-5, which hadn't been polished in years, had a rip in the canvas roof patched up with black tape and was spattered with seagull dropping. This dog, how long are we going to be stuck with it? Bobby, she said. He's called Bobby, and he's totally adorable. You'll want a puppy after you see him. Koreans eat dogs. They have great recipes for them. A sack. That's horrible. Yeah, OK, sorry. It's just, I want you to myself. I don't want to have to share you with a dog. You'll love him, I promise you. And it's only for a week. She had agreed to look after her friends, Emily and Steve's, mixed-breed terrier while they were away on holiday. But she hadn't reckoned on Zack being so negative about the adorable creature. The man inside the small grey Renault saloon parked a short distance up the road, his face masked by the main section of the Sunday Times, watched the MX-5 reverse out into the road and drive off. He was reading the front-page article about Logan Somerville with great interest. On the passenger seat beside him was a yellow high-vis tabard and a clipboard. Like taxis, he knew, people never took any notice of someone in a high-vis jacket holding a clipboard. Chapter 48 Sunday the 14th of December Shit, man, that's the oldest trick in the book, Glenn Branson said in his tiny office, cradling a can of Diet Coke in his massive hand. What do you mean? Roy Grace asked. I've been thinking about Martin Horner. I reckon he's taken a dead man's identity. Roy Grace should have gone home this lunchtime, he knew, to work on his eulogy for tomorrow morning, but Bella would have understood. If there was the remotest possibility of saving Logan Somerville, and now possibly Ashley Stanford, she would have hated that her death in any way hindered the speed of the investigation. He sipped a small apple juice and, ravenous, munched on an all-day breakfast sandwich of egg and bacon, complemented by a packet of sour cream and red onion-flavoured crisps, both of which he had just bought at the Asda Superstore across the road. He was glad Cleo was not around. She would have been furious to see him eat what she would have considered to be such an unhealthy meal. But the apple juice, he felt, was arguably the one healthy option that salved his conscience. Like those fortunate enough to be in a career where they actually had weekends off, Monday morning gloom loomed tomorrow for him too, but for other reasons. I've been wondering the same thing, he replied. Day of the Jackal. Ever see that movie? James Fox? Nah, his brother, Edward Fox, plays a hitman hired to shoot President de Gaulle of France. He gets a fake passport after going to a graveyard and finding the name of a dead small boy who would never have had a passport. He uses the dead boy's name to get a phony passport. It's a top movie. Never saw it, Grace said, sipping more of his juice, then munching on his sandwich. 
He pushed the crisps towards Branson, who shoveled out half the contents in one handful. Through a mouthful, he said, You know your problem. You're an uncultured Philistine. How the hell did you ever get to make such top copper? By not associating with dickheads like you, Roy Grace grinned and gave his best friend a hug. Actually, I read the novel years ago. It was a novel? Grace looked at him. By Frederick Forsyth. Yeah? Yeah. Way before it was a movie. You didn't know that? You never read it? Nope. Now who's the Philistine? You're a tosser. Glenn Branson shrugged. But, you know, so far as tossers go, you're up there among the good ones. Thanks a million. To Grace's dismay, seemingly oblivious to the fact this was his lunch, Branson tipped the rest of the packet of crisps out and ate them noisily. How are you feeling about the funeral? I'll be glad when it's over. Grace sipped his juice. So, update me on Operation Mona Lisa. Are you any closer to identifying unknown female? Yes, we might be. As you know, Lucy Sibbon has estimated her death to have occurred about 30 years ago, and she was in her early 20s. I used the parameter you set to look at all the mispers in the county aged between 18 and 25 who are still missing, from 20 to 35 years ago, that fit our description. We've been able to eliminate some from their hair colour. We'll have a computer e-fit face tomorrow, and we know she had long brown hair. When we have that, we should be able to come up with a probable victim. Then we'll have to hope we can trace family members. If we can, there'll be a chance of checking dental records or getting DNA. Grace nodded, thinking about Sandy's disappearance. A lot of families who have a member disappear, particularly a child, keep their bedroom as a kind of shrine. There's a good chance there'll be a hairbrush or a toothbrush or something else to get DNA from. We have one development that may be significant, Branson said. I showed you the file on Friday on Catherine Westerham, the body from Ashdown Forest. Yes, she was 19 and had the same You Are Dead branding as well as similar looks. You've gone very pale, Glenn Branson said. You look like you've seen a ghost. Grace nodded. That's how I'm feeling. I have a very bad feeling about this, mate. These killings have to be linked. The marks, the hair, the age range, the victim profile. There are so many similarities. It was all a long time ago. A long time ago, in another country, and besides, the wench is dead. What? Branson frowned. Christopher Marlowe. Who's he? He wrote that in 1590. Am I still a Philistine? Grace finished his sandwich and his juice, patted his friend on the back and stood up. I have to go. See you on parade in the morning. But Glenn Branson did not reply. He was studiously tapping Christopher Marlowe into Google on his iPhone. Grace thought to himself that as soon as the girl from the lagoon was identified, they might be able to establish what the link between the two young women was. Suddenly, Grace felt his phone vibrating. It was DC Liz Seward in MIR1. Sir, she said, I've just taken a call from someone who wants to speak to the SIO, an elderly-sounding man who says he has some information that might be of interest. I tried to get him to tell me, but he was adamant he would only speak to you. Can I give you his name and number? Chapter 49 1974 Hey, Mole, how come you're so fat? My name's not Mole, he said in his squeaky voice that had not yet broken. He stood naked in the bathroom of his new boarding school, the Cloisters, in Surrey. It was the start of the second week of term. You are gross, Mole, Gossage said. A boy pinched the layers of flab on his stomach so hard he cried out in pain. What do you call that? That hurt, you creep. Who's Mole calling a creep? Gore Parker said. Me? I'm a creep? Are you calling Gore Parker a creep? taunted Chaffinch, a piggy-faced boy who definitely was fatter than himself, except no one seemed to notice. Leave me alone. He stepped into the shower and turned on the taps. Listen, you arrogant piece of whale blubber, Gore Parker said. You kept us all awake in the dorm last night, wanking. I was bloody not wanking. I'm surprised you can even find your dick under all that blubber, Gossage said. The others peeled with laughter. Tell you what, Mull, you like tunnels. 
Why don't you dig yourself a nice little tunnel out in the woods where you can go and wank away to your heart's content, Chaffinch said. And preferably not come back, added Gore Parker. We don't like fat wankers, Gossage said, secure in having the protection of his mates, who had formed a clan during these past few days. Just leave me alone. He had tears in his eyes. The matron said you wet your bed last night, Gore Parker said. Who's a little homesick diddums then? I'm going to report you all to Mr. Hartwell. Hartwell was the housemaster. Oh, really, Mole? Chaffinch said. What are you going to report us for? I know you're all reading porn. I've seen the magazines. Feigning shock, Gossage turned to Chaffinch and Gore Parker. Oh, dear, everyone. Are we terrified or what? Mole is going to report us for reading porn. What are you reading, Mole, that makes you need to wank all night? Books on tunnels? The others laughed. You're the bloody wanker, he said sullenly, stepping into the water spray and starting to soap himself. He closed his eyes, spreading soap across his face. Suddenly he felt a vice-like grip on each wrist. Then he was being yanked harshly out of the shower. Hey! he yelled. Hey! He opened his eyes and was instantly blinded by the stinging soap. His feet slithered across the shower tray and then the linoleum floor as he blinked, his vision a blur. He felt himself being lifted, then dumped down into water. A bathtub, he realised. His head was right beneath the tap, which was pelting out a lukewarm mix of hot and cold water straight onto his face. No! Oh, oh! He tried to shout out, but merely swallowed water. Hands were pinning him down. Help me! Suddenly, he couldn't breathe. He writhed in panic. He was drowning. Then he was jerked forward, gulping air. He could hear the roar of the open tap inches from him. Then he was pushed back, and the torrent of water covered his mouth and nose. He writhed, twisted, kicking out, desperately trying to shake free, but firm hands held him down. You're a dirty bastard, Mole, Gossage said. Moles burrow in earth. You must be covered in earth. Yuck! Maybe we should cut your dick and balls off to stop you wanking, Gore Parker said. He was swallowing water. He shook, violently, choking, trying desperately to break free. Then suddenly he heard a voice. A familiar voice, stern, furious. What the dickens is going on here? Gossage? Gore Parker? Chaffinch? What do you think you're doing? Get dressed and come to my study right away. It was the voice of Ted Hartwell, a man Mole had lived in terror of since he had arrived at the cloisters from his fearsome disciplinarian reputation. But this Sunday evening, he felt like he was his saviour. Chapter 50 Sunday the 14th of December Grace stared at the piece of paper he'd torn off Glenn Branson's desk notepad, on which he'd scrawled Dr. Jacob Van Dam, the name of the man Liz Seward had spoken to, who insisted on talking only to him. The man's name rang a faint bell. He hurried along the corridor, logged onto his computer, and then to Google, and typed in the doctor's name. And was instantly impressed. Now he knew why the name was familiar. Van Dam had been, at one time, among the leading forensic psychiatrists in the country. But looking at his date of birth, he was knocking on, well past retirement age. Curious, he dialed his number. A quavering man's voice answered after five rings. Dr. Van Dam? Grace asked. The response was guarded. Yes? Who is this? Detective Superintendent Roy Grace. I'm the senior investigating officer on the disappearance of Logan Somerville. I understand you wanted to speak to me. Well, yes. Thank you for calling. I'm very worried about wasting police time, but the thing is, you see, I have something that has been bothering me for the past well, nearly two days. He fell silent. Tell me, Grace prompted. The first thing I should tell you is that I am Logan Somerville's uncle. Okay. Well, you see... I had a very peculiar patient on Friday, whose name was Harrison Hunter. Does that mean anything to you? Harrison Hunter, Grace wrote the name down. No, it doesn't. The man was speaking almost irritatingly slowly. 
He told me he's an anaesthetist, but so far I've not been able to verify that. Grace made a further note. Then he made a rather strange claim. I held off contacting you because, to be frank, I rather dismissed him as a fantasist. I've had plenty of people like him during my career. He claimed to know all about Logan's abduction. Then he told me, as evidence of his bona fides, that Logan had a tattoo or a mark of some kind on her right thigh. Suddenly, Grace's interest in the man increased dramatically. On her right thigh. That's what he told me. So immediately he left, I got the name of Logan's fiancée from her mother, and I telephoned him to ask if Logan had a tattoo. He was absolutely adamant that she doesn't. The psychiatrist fell silent for some moments. I've been discussing it with my wife. But the thing is that Logan's parents her mother is my sister, are worried out of their wits. Understandably, Grace replied. They are worried about Logan's relationship with her fiancé. Apparently she broke their engagement off, and he's had a problem accepting it. So it is possible he lied to me when I asked him the question about the tattoo. Why do you think he would lie about a tattoo? I can't explain that. Unless, of course, as the parents think, he might be behind this. Did this Dr. Hunter give you any description of this tattoo? Yes, he did. Well, it said, You are dead. Roy thanked him for the call and sat in stunned silence for a few minutes, thinking hard. Then he made three phone calls. The first was to Glenn Branson, asking him to send one of their detectives to London right away to interview the psychiatrist. The second was to the chief, Tom Martinson, and the third, Pew, to alert them and schedule a meeting. This latest information had just turned a major investigation into potentially one of the biggest that he and Sussex police were likely to experience. There would no doubt be massive national and international media interest, and it would be important for him to keep control of the investigation. He would also have a duty to work with key opinion formers and community groups to ensure that the public's reaction was managed to prevent panic. He would be telling the chief and Pew that, in his opinion, they needed to form a gold group. A gold group was only formed in extreme circumstances, such as a major crime, critical incident, significant public event or natural disaster. The group would consist of senior police officers, senior representatives from the city council, safety officers, the police and crime commissioner, the local MP, the divisional commander, members of the independent advisory group and, importantly, a dedicated senior public relations officer. He would be discussing the details straight after the briefing when he went to headquarters. This was all he needed. A funeral tomorrow, and with this current investigation, perhaps the biggest challenge of his career, in the week he was moving house. He picked up the phone to dial Cleo taking a deep breath before she picked up. Chapter 51 Sunday the 14th of December Roy Grace ran a rather stilted Sunday evening briefing of Operation Haywain. He was due to meet Martinson and Pew straight after to update them on the potential magnitude of the situation. He was not going to be delivering good news after his conversation earlier with Van Damme and several more phone calls during the afternoon. The close-up photograph of Logan Somerville's face that had been distributed had been picked up by almost all of the Sunday papers, with several carrying it on the front page. A search operation had been ongoing since Thursday evening with police, specials, PCSOs and volunteer members of the public, as well as the police helicopter, despite its huge operating cost. The search operation was intelligence-led, together with responses to specific information received from the public. The immediate search of the area where Logan had gone missing had been completed with a negative result. Ashley Stanford's boyfriend seemed a decent young man. He had spent much of the afternoon in the CCTV room at John Street with operator John Pumphrey, watching firstly the cameras covering her normal journey home, down West Street and along the seafront, He'd identified the first image of her, pedalling up the pedestrianised Duke Street at 12.52am, then down West Street, 
and turning right along King's Road. Over the next eight minutes, four more cameras had clocked her heading west, one passing the peace statue, a second along Hove Lawns, a third when she ran a red light at the bottom of Grand Avenue, and the fourth as she crossed Hove Street. The next camera would have picked her up if she had continued west at the start of Shoreham Port. But the fact she hadn't shown up indicated she had either been abducted from this road, with her bicycle as well, or on one of the streets off, such as Carlisle Road, a quarter of a mile along where she lived. She had literally vanished off the face of the earth. Except for one thing that had turned during the course of the afternoon into a serious lead. A Skoda taxi had been clocked by the same cameras, driving slower than the speed limit, keeping a steady and substantial distance back from the cyclist. The taxi had also not showed up on the fifth camera at the start of Shoreham Port, which meant it, too, had turned off somewhere. Nor had it appeared anywhere else on any of the other cameras that had been searched around all the possible routes it could have taken. However, the registration number had been picked up by an ANPR along the seafront, and they'd got the driver's name, a Mark Tuckwell. Tuckwell had been found and interviewed, Whilst it was undoubtedly his registration number, he had been at a wedding reception in Lewis with about a hundred potential witnesses there to confirm his alibi, and his taxi had been in the dealer's garage over the weekend with its engine out. Someone had gone to a lot of trouble to clone the vehicle and number plate, and it was not easy to get fake number plates made in the UK these days. There was a parallel with the Volvo that had been sighted outside Logan Somerville's flat around the time of her suspected abduction, which was also concerning Roy Grace. There is one possible link, he said to his team. The offender who took Ashley and the one who took Logan were both in estate-type vehicles around the time of the girl's disappearance. Neither of them showed up on any further cameras after the alleged abductions. That, to me, indicates two things. He took a sip of water, then went on. Firstly, that the offender has a detailed local knowledge of the city and an awareness of the camera locations, and clearly extensive knowledge of all the back streets to avoid them, and secondly, probably lives locally within the city. I've studied the camera maps this afternoon, and from each of the two abduction sites it would have been impossible for either vehicle to have left the city in any direction other than driving into the sea without being picked up by a camera, either one of our own CCTV network or ANPR. The area where Ashley was last seen has been thoroughly searched and house-to-house -house inquiries have also been made, but nothing of significance has been found to date. He turned to D.S. Exton. John, what do you have to report about your interview with the psychiatrist, Dr. Jacob Van Dam, uncle of Logan Somerville, and his patient, Dr. Harrison Hunter? Well, to be honest, sir, something of a conundrum. The man claimed he was referred by a Brighton doctor, general practitioner Dr. Edward Crisp, and produced a letter. I managed to obtain Dr. Crisp's home phone number afterwards and rang him to check, and he says he has never heard of a Dr. Harrison Hunter. Van Damme said Hunter claimed to be an anaesthetist at a London teaching hospital, but Van Damme subsequently checked up on the man, and there is no such person listed. He says he was a strange-looking character in his mid-fifties, wearing tinted glasses, and what he was certain was a blonde wig. He said the wig reminded him of Boris Johnson. He said he would have been tempted to dismiss him as a nutter, except that he claimed Logan had You Are Dead tattooed on her. Grace nodded. He had a sick feeling in the pit of his stomach. Did Dr. Van Damme have any idea why this man came to see him, or what he wanted? Exton nodded. It was his view that he was seeking help of some kind. Dr. Van Damme said he was unsure whether the man wanted someone to tell him that killing people was okay, or whether he was a fantasist, or... The detective sergeant shrugged, then fell silent for some moments, as if deep in thought. Or what, John? Grace pressed. Exton looked down at his notes. I'm trying to recall exactly how Dr. Van Damme expressed it, sir. It was as if it was a kind of confession, but a very complicated one. As if he needed to tell someone, sort of, to share it, unburden himself. Kind of a cry for help. We could help him, Norman Potting said. We could lock him up and throw away the bloody key. There are a few smiles. Grace asked Exton to ensure he recovered the referral letter, then turned to D.S. Cale. Tanya, 
You had an outside inquiry team do a house-to-house along Carlisle Road where Ashley Stanford lived. Anything from that? No, sir, not so far. I have four uniform officers still out there. They've checked Carlisle Road and the immediate neighbouring streets, but nobody saw or heard anything during the night around that time. They're expanding the search zone. I've also been with DC Seward, checking as much of the surrounding area as possible for any sighting of the bike or the taxi with no luck. It's a fairly distinctive dark blue bicycle with a sticker embossed with the bike shop South Downs Bikes on the frame. Good work, Tanya. Has anyone heard back from EE about the triangulation of Ashley's phone? Not good news on that, boss, DC Emma Jane Boutwood said. Just before the briefing started, a neighbour a couple of houses down from Ashley's in Carlisle Road called the main switchboard. She'd found a mobile phone in her garden earlier in the day, and it only just occurred to her that it might be connected with all the police activity in the street. Duh, hello, exclaimed Jack Alexander. What kind of a bush did she think it was, a phone plant? Potting asked. Two houses away, EJ, Grace quizzed the DC pensively. Yes, south of where her flat is. And it was the other side of a hedge, in a front garden? Yes. That sounds to me like she didn't just drop it while cycling along. Phones don't bounce over hedges. Did our offender take her as she slowed to dismount and throw it there? Logan Somerville's phone was left in her car. Now Ashley Stanford's phone is left behind also. I think we're dealing with someone very smart here. Someone who knows phones can be tracked, who knows this city, who knows not to use the same vehicle twice. I assume the phone has been collected and is currently being examined? He turned to DC Alexander. Jack, how are you getting on with locating Martin Horner? Well, sir, I've found an address for the right Martin Horner. The date of birth tallies with what the DVLA have on file, but I don't think you're going to be very happy about this. The young detective constable glanced down at his notes, then with a slight awkward grin said, He's currently residing along the old Shoreham Road in Hove Cemetery. What? Guy Batchelor quizzed. What do you mean? He's sleeping rough? Not exactly. His full address is Plot 3472, Hove Cemetery, Old Shoreham Road, Hove. It took some moments for this to sink in. Then there was a titter of laughter from several of the team, but not from Batchelor, who was having a total sense of humour failure at that moment. What the hell is that supposed to mean? he said with a frown. But from the look on several faces around, it seemed that some of the team had got there before him. Jack Alexander stood up and pointed at a large photograph which was fixed to the whiteboard below the faces of Logan Somerville, Ashley Stanford and Emma Johnson. It was a close-up of a small, modest tombstone. The engraving on it was clear and stark. Martin William Horner, October 3rd, 1964 to June 12th, 1965 dearly beloved son of Kevin and Beverly. Looks like some sick bastard's taken this dead boy's identity, Tanya Kale said. And registered the car in his name, Grace confirmed. Yes. What about the address, 62 Blenheim Street? Grace asked. Whoever did this must have some connection to it. I've had our outside inquiry team talk to the woman who lives there, Anne Hill, Kale continued. She's now being very cooperative, worried as hell we're going to have her prosecuted over faking her infirmity. She's adamant she knows nothing about this vehicle, but she told us one thing that may be significant. Six weeks ago, a man turned up who said he'd been appointed as her carer. He came for a few days running, then vanished. She called her doctor to ask what had happened, and he told her that he had no knowledge of any carer having been appointed to her. The timing is significant, I think. Presumably she's given a description of him, Guy Batchelor asked. Not a very good one, Kale said. Middle-aged? quite long hair and dark glasses. But he seemed to have medical knowledge, she said. We need an e-fit, Grace said. Yes, Kale said. We've got that in hand. Someone from the imaging department is with her now. Then she looked at her notes, briefly, and went on. It was November the 2nd that the Volvo was purchased by this Martin Horner. It's possible the carer had turned up in order to grab the documents when they came through from the DVLA. Do we have a description of this man who bought the Volvo, our imposter Martin Horner? Grace asked. Not much of one, boss, Guy Batchelor said. We've found the previous owner, an antiques dealer called Quentin Moon, but he wasn't much help. He didn't see enough of his face to ever recognise him again. The handover was done at night in a poorly lit multi-storey car park in Worthing. When asked, Moon hadn't kept any of the contact numbers. 
He remembered Horner was wearing a tweed cap, scarf and dark glasses and paid in folding. Fifteen hundred pounds. Jack Alexander asked, Is there any chance he might still have any of those banknotes which would give us the opportunity for fingerprints or DNA? Excellent thinking, Jack. Check it out. Didn't he wonder about Horner's appearance? D.C. Davies queried. Dark glasses at night in a dark car park. All he would have cared about was getting paid for his car, which he was, D.S. Bachelor said. He's an antiques dealer. Probably gets plenty of customers looking a lot dodgier than that. Grace smiled. From his team's recent experience working a major antiques case, he couldn't disagree. Do they have CCTV in or near that car park guy? Yes, there's both, Bachelor said. But Horner bought the car six weeks ago. Very few CCTV systems keep recordings that long. Grace nodded, but he felt that with increasing use of digital equipment, it was worth checking out. He reflected that everything he had just heard confirmed the conversation he'd had earlier with Glenn Branson about who Martin Horner might be. Norman Potting, looking as bleak as hell, as might be expected on the eve of his fiancée's funeral, raised a hand. I've been to see Anne Hill's doctor, a Simon Elkin, who practices at the Port Slave Medical Centre, to ask him about the carer who had been appointed for her. He wasn't too complimentary about Mrs. Hill. She's been demanding a carer, but he felt she was quite capable of looking after herself. So I went and spoke to some of her neighbours. None of them seemed to like her that much. The young couple next door say they see her out and about regularly, but they avoid her, because if they even so much as nod at her, she comes over and tells them how ill she is and complains that no one cares about her. She sounds like a regular moaning minnie. No one seems to have seen this carer, nor the Volvo. You should really go home, Norman. Get some rest, Grace said. I prefer to keep working, Chief, if it's all right with you. Grace smiled at him. You're doing a good job. We all need some rest before tomorrow. Go tell that to the missing girls, Potting said. Chapter 52 Sunday the 14th of December With the chief constable living in Brighton and Cassie and Pew in temporary rented accommodation in Hove, it was decided the three of them would meet in Roy's office at Sussex House rather than make the 25-minute drive each way to police headquarters in Lewis where Pew and Martinson were based. It was shortly after 7.30pm that the two men entered Grace's modest office, the chief constable in jeans and a baggy cable-knit sweater, Pew in cavalry twills, suede brogues, a thin roll-neck, and one of those natty tweed jackets with epaulettes and leather patches on the sleeves that, Grace thought, Pew imagined gave the impression of a country squire, but which made him look more like a spiv bookmaker. Grace made coffee then joined them at his small round conference table. He thanked them both for coming out on a Sunday evening and then launched straight into his reason for wanting to see them so urgently. I'm afraid, he said, that all the evidence indicates we have an active serial killer in our city. Martinson's face visibly stiffened. Pew looked like a man who had just swallowed a wasp. You realise the implications of this, Roy? Martinson said. Brighton doesn't have serial killers, Roy. Pew said. I mean, not since the trunk murders of the early 1930s. How sure are you? Grace brought them up to date with both his own and Glenn Branson's investigations into Operation Mona Lisa and Operation Haywain. When he had finished, both the chiefs were silent. They agreed that there needed to be a gold group set up and that Pew would take on the responsibility for organising this. In advance of meeting both of you, Roy continued, I spoke to Jonathan Atkins at the National Crime Agency Operational Support Unit today, telling him my views, and he's given me detailed guidelines on how to proceed with the investigations from this point and how to manage the impact on the community. His advice is to go very public and get the press and media on board from the start. I'm also waiting for a call back from an SIO who's currently instructing at the National Police College who has had past experience on two serial killers. The impact on the community is going to be enormous, Roy, the chief constable said. I know, Grace replied. I'm putting together a prevention strategy which will include measures we can take to help lessen the risk of future victims. We've had some experience in the Met, Pew added pensively. You need to understand Brighton isn't metropolitan London, Grace said. You have more than an eight million population there. 
we have just over a quarter of a million. This is much more of a tight-knit community. People are less used to murder here. Our strategy needs to reflect that to avoid panicking the city. We finally lost the very unwelcome title of injecting drug death capital of the UK after almost 11 years, Tom Martinson said. Now we have this. I agree, sir, and the impact's going to remain until we've got the offender charged and locked up, Grace said grimly. You realise what the consequences will be if you've got this wrong, Roy? Cassie and Pugh asked, the familiar whine, unpleasantly close to a sneer, returning to his voice as if the wasp was now confidently digested. I can imagine there being a short-term impact on the tourist trade, sir, Grace said, as well as a lot of very nervous citizens, but the consequences of not warning the public could result in another death, maybe more than one. How much detail have you been advised to release to the public? Martinson asked. Well, I've also spoken at length to Detective Inspector Jordan Finucci at the FBI's Homicide Bureau at Quantico. I met him on a course I attended four years ago. He's had experience with two of the USA's worst serial killers, Ted Bundy and Dennis Rader, BTK. He's given me some advice based on how they caught BTK. Which was? Pugh asked. Well, it's a pretty established fact that the overwhelming majority of serial killers have massive egos. Some homicide detectives in the US have had results by using that knowledge. The advice I've had is to rattle our offender's cage and try to flush him out. But if you do that, and the missing women are still alive, might that not provoke him into killing them? Martinson queried. The statistics are against us, sir, on them still being alive. Most victims are killed within an hour of being abducted. Very few are still alive 24 hours later. We have to be positive and conduct the inquiry with the full urgency of trying to find them and save their lives, but we need to have an eye beyond these young ladies. We have to prevent another one, or indeed several more, from being taken. What we have established is that he's a meticulous planner, or clearly thinks he is. He got clean away with killing at least two women 30 years ago, it would seem, and now he probably thinks he's invincible. You know, Roy... Pugh said. It seems very strange to me that he should suddenly stop, and then start again all these years later. With respect, I recently ran an investigation of a serial rapist, the shoe man. He'd stopped for many years, the reason being he'd got married and had kids. BTK in the USA stopped for a similar period, for similar reasons. Roy's right, Cassian, Tom Martinson said, and we don't know for sure this offender did stop offending. We just believe he stopped in Sussex for a long time. He might have continued elsewhere in the UK, or even abroad, and then recently returned here. Presumably your intel cell is checking throughout the UK back 30 years, Roy, for matching offences, said Q. Yes, they are working on it, but with no results so far. One other thing I've done today is contact a forensic psychologist, Tony Balash. He worked on two high-profile serial cases, the M25 rapist, Anthony Imiela, and the Ipswich prostitute killer, Steve Wright. His advice concurs with Jordan Finucci's. Flush him out through the media. Roy, Cassian Pugh said, there's an SIO in the Met I've worked with, Paul Sweetman, who was seconded to help with the Ipswich case, without in any way wanting to tread on your toes. Would you object to my asking him to come down and offer his support? Grace stared at him warily. The relationship between Sussex Police and London's Metropolitan Police had never been an entirely easy one. Many good officers had been poached by the Met through a better pay scale. Roy, Martinson said diplomatically, I'm sure Cassian has only the best interests of our city at heart and has no intention of usurping your command of this case. He looked to the ACC for confirmation. Absolutely, Tom. Pugh turned to Grace with a smarmy smile. Roy, I know we've had our differences in the past, but they're firmly in the past. A DCI Sweetman is a good guy. I would only suggest he came down, and in a strictly advisory capacity to you, if you were totally comfortable with this. If not, we'll forget it. Grace thought for some moments, realising he had little choice. If he refused and the operation went pear-shaped, Pew would hang him out to dry. I'm sure he'll be of assistance, he said. Good, Martinson said. Roy and Cassian, I want you both to work on this together, 
keep me in the loop. Come up with a plan. I will keep the police and crime commissioner informed. I know she's going to be highly concerned and the senior members of the community should be joining the gold group tomorrow. Despite the funeral, you need to keep your focus on this. I suggest we hold a press conference later tomorrow after the funeral and the first meeting of the gold group, at which you make the announcement that we have a serial killer. But be under no illusion. It is going to rock the city to the core. It's going to cause panic. And it's going to hurt the whole area commercially. On the basis of what you're saying, Roy, Cassian Pugh said, I think you should subsume Operation Mona Lisa into Operation Haywain. I've already thought about this, sir, Grace replied. I will be in overall command of the total investigation process, and I've asked DCI Ian McLean to be my deputy. I will then have key officers running individual aspects of the investigation for each of the victims. Pugh nodded, then glanced at his phone, which had just beeped. Another thing I think we should do, Grace said, is come up with a nickname for the offender before the press think up some sensational name of their own. We don't want the Argus coming up with something alarmist, such as the Brighton Ripper or the Sussex Strangler. Do you have any suggestions, Roy? Tom Martinson asked. Yes, I've discussed it with Tony Balash, and we want something that doesn't glamorise him too much. The one we both like is the Brighton Brander. The two senior officers pondered this for some moments. I think it's clever, Martinson said. Yes, Pew said. Let's confirm that with the gold group to make sure the community's on board. For the next ten minutes, they talked about resourcing and costs. With the potential community impact, Martinson told both officers that money, on this rare occasion, could not be a factor. They had to throw all their resources at this regardless. Before the meeting, Roy Grace had already realised the enormity of his responsibility. Now he was feeling it even more. Plot 3472 in Hove Cemetery, Pugh said, suddenly looking down at the notes he had taken. Yes, Grace said. From the tone of Pugh's voice, that piece of information was having a seriously detrimental effect on his blood pressure. Grace hoped for a few brief moments it might prove terminal. That's the oldest trick in the book, Pugh said. Yes, sir, Grace said. D.I. Branson has already pointed that out. Chapter 53 Sunday the 14th of December Freya Northrop felt stuffed to bursting as she turned the MX-5 into the driveway of their house shortly after 10.30pm. She stifled a yawn, totally exhausted. Zack, in the passenger seat beside her, had slept most of the way back from their last stop of the day, an evening meal at the Cat in West Hoathley, a pub restaurant he'd heard great things about and which had not disappointed. He had photographed and written down details about his starter of hazelnut-crumbed goat's cheese with honey-roasted figs and parma ham, and the coffee parfait served in a cappuccino cup, complete with froth and sugar cubes of chocolate jelly both of which he planned to try out with a view to putting them on his menu. She never ceased to be astonished at the amount of food Zack could pack away. They'd had two lunches at different restaurants in Whitstable, starters, mains and puds, because he'd wanted to try a range of dishes, and while she had pecked at hers, he'd wolfed down all of his and finished hers. And now they'd had a three-course dinner at the Cat, and again he had scoffed the lot. Yet he was, she thought enviously, ridiculously thin. Her dad had once told her never to eat in a restaurant where there was a thin chef. It wasn't a good sign. Yet Zack was a brilliant cook. He'd been born with supersonic metabolism, he joked. But it was true. Honest to God, where did he put all those carbs? She patted his sleepy, brush-cut head affectionately. We're home, my sweet. He woke with a start and stifled a yawn. Then he took her hand and kissed it. Thanks for driving, he yawned again. Want to sleep in the car? She said with a grin, opening her door. He unclipped his seatbelt, opened his door, and climbed slowly out into the cold, damp night air. I've eaten too much, he said, and patted his stomach. Coming from you, that's quite something. I might just make myself a little snack before we go to bed. Freya laughed. Want me to see if there's a suckling pig in the freezer we can chuck on the barbie? She stepped up to the front door, unlocked it and went inside, fumbling for the light switch. 
The smell of fresh paint and new carpet and recently sawn timber greeted her. Zack followed her in and closed the door behind him. They walked through to the ultramodern kitchen, the first room to have been completed, with today's observer lying on a huge butcher's block that served as the table. As I haven't had a drink all day, I think I deserve a glass of wine before bed, she said, opening the fridge, removing a half-full bottle of Sauvignon Blanc and tugging out the cork. Want one? He shook his head. Thanks, but I've drunk far too much already. No comment, she said with a grin, lifting a glass and an ashtray out of the dishwasher and setting them down on the table. She poured some wine, then rummaged in her handbag for her tobacco, filters and licorice roll-up papers. As she began placing strands of tobacco in the opened-out paper, she noticed Zack frowning at something. What? she said. There's a draught. Can you feel it? She nodded. She could. A steady, cold draught. He continued frowning. Where's it coming from? I've never noticed it before, Freya said. It's always been so snug in here. The kitchen was usually cosy, thanks to the underfloor heating Zack had put in. But she could feel the cold air. Definitely. Zack suddenly stood up and walked across to the back door. Freya, darling, he said, his voice sounding strange. We locked the back door, surely. We locked up carefully before we left this morning, didn't we? I locked it myself, she said. I remember doing it. Why? He pointed at the top and bottom bolts, which were open. Then he pointed at the key in the lock. I just tried the key, and it's open. Unlocked. Are you sure you locked up? She shrugged. I'm 99%, yes. Oh, shit, he said, suddenly staring down at the floor. What? He pointed at the leaded light window next to the back door. One small square pane of glass, six inches by six inches, was missing. Then he jabbed a finger down at the floor. Look! She stood up and walked over and saw the pane of glass lying close to the mat. How? How? How did that happen? She was quivering, staring wildly all around her now. Panes of glass don't detach themselves, Zack said, and if they do, they don't fall onto a tiled floor without shattering. And locks don't unlock themselves. He strode over to a drawer, pulled it open and grabbed a carving knife. He walked through into the hall, brandishing the blade. We should call the police, she said nervously. Do it, he said. Dial 999. He stepped forward. Don't go out there, Zack. If there's someone... She grabbed the phone and almost dropped it. She was shaking so much. Then, panic-stricken, she stabbed out the numbers. Chapter 54 Monday, the 15th of December A fine mist of rain fell silently and steadily, soaking the gathering mourners and glossing the grey, stark, neo-Gothic edifice of St. Peter's. The imposing building was the largest church in the city, and had been chosen for today because of the number of police officers and support staff who had expressed the wish to attend. That morning, Grace had brought the team briefing forward again to 7.30am and left a small corps of officers continuing with the investigation under the leadership of his deputy SIO, Ian McLean. He was planning to return to Sussex House immediately after the service and committal. Everything about this Monday morning felt grey, he thought. Even the sky was tombstone-coloured. He was attired, a little uncomfortably, in the formal dress uniform he had not removed from its dry cleaning bag in over four years. The last time he had worn it was also for a high-profile funeral, a Sussex police officer who had died in tragic circumstances. Shortly after 10.30am, he walked with Cleo, the two of them huddled beneath an umbrella, down from the rear car park of John Street Police Station, where he had been fortunate to have been given one of the few available parking spaces, towards London Road. Neither of them spoke much, as he rehearsed what he was going to say in his mind. They were entering what had once been one of the scuzziest areas of the city, but was now up and coming. Normally, out of habit, he would have been checking the faces of everyone he passed, but today his thoughts were elsewhere, mostly focused on the funeral that lay ahead, but frequently switching back to the disappearances of Logan Somerville, Ashley Stanford, and, possibly linked with them, Emma Johnson. 
Cleo held his hand tightly, and he was comforted and more grateful than he could ever say for her support. He could not remember the last time he had felt so nervous. He was shaking as he walked, butterflies going berserk in his stomach. He'd been in many dangerous situations in the line of duty in the past, but nothing he could remember had ever made him feel this way. Above all, he was terrified of cracking up when he reached the pulpit. You'll be fine, darling. She kissed him. He patted his inside pocket for about the seventh time to check that his speech was there, panicking for a moment that he might have left it behind. He tugged it out and checked it, just to make sure, then carefully replaced it and checked again that it was safely tucked in. The approach to St. Peter's was lined with motorcycle police officers. Beyond them stood the Guard of Honour of uniformed officers already in place, as well as a contingent of fire officers, despite there being twenty-five minutes to go. Swarming around them were press photographers, TV camera and radio crews. As they neared, he saw Cassie and Pew, in full dress uniform, engaged in conversation with Tom Martinson, also in dress uniform, and Nicola Roygaard, like Cleo and most of the other women, all in black. Rainwater dripped from the edge of her broad-brimmed hat. The trio greeted Grace and Cleo with respectful nods. Then Cassian Pugh extended his hand and gave him a limp handshake. You know how sorry I am, Roy. The problem with Pugh's whiny voice was that anything he said, even condolences like this, sounded like he was sneering, Grace thought. Thank you, sir, he said stiffly. I don't think you've met my wife, Cleo. Pew shook her gloved hand and simpered unctuously. What an absolute delight. I'm told you're sorely missed at the mortuary. Are you enjoying life as a mother? Very much, she said. But I plan to be back at work again soon. Not soon enough, so far as I'm concerned. He smiled, his lips curling to reveal a viperous set of incisors. Grace remembered that A.C.C. Pew was outside the burning building where D.S. Bellamoy had died, remaining there all day until her body was brought out. He did at least respect his old adversary for that. A difficult morning for you, Roy, Nicola Roygaard said. Yes, he said, his voice choked. This is my wife, Cleo. The two women shook hands. As they did so, Pew stepped out of the line-up and said to Roy Grace quietly, Any developments overnight? Grace saw, heading towards them, the Argus reporter, Siobhan Sheldrake, Nothing since my update of yesterday evening, sir. Excuse me, gentlemen, Siobhan Sheldrake interrupted them, holding out a small microphone. Could I get a comment from each of you about the tragic death of Detective Sergeant Bella Moy? Roy Grace had to listen, close to vomiting, as Cassian Pugh launched into a sickly, glib list of superlatives about the diligence, dedication and outstanding courage of the fallen officer. Pugh finished with the words... Detective Sergeant Bella Moy was quite one of the most remarkable police officers it has ever been my privilege to work with. Except, Roy Grace thought, stifling his anger, Pew had never worked with her. But this was neither the time nor the place for trying to settle scores. He let Pew finish, said his own piece into the microphone, then led Cleo towards the entrance of the church, where Glenn Branson was standing next to Guy Batchelor, who was accompanied by his blonde, attractive Swedish wife, Lena. They smiled at each other, politely, but none of them felt like talking. Grace noticed a faint smell of cigarette smoke on Bachelor, and could have happily slunk away for a quick smoke himself right now to calm his nerves. Glenn put his arm around him and gave him a hug. Grace sniffed, pulled out a handkerchief, and blew his nose. Good luck, mate, Branson said. He balled his fist and touched knuckles with Grace. Grace always wondered what it would feel like for anyone on the receiving end of a punch from his friend's fist. It felt as if it had been hewn out of rock. The almost ethereal silence across the city was shattered suddenly by the Doppler wail of sirens as an ambulance threaded its way through the clogged-up London road traffic. Once it faded away into the distance, an even greater silence followed. It was as if the entire city of Brighton and Hove had ground to a halt. Even the seagulls were quiet. The only sound that could be heard for several minutes was the clop-clopping of horses' hooves. Then the cortege came into sight. The coffin was clearly visible, draped with the Sussex police flag and a policewoman's hat, surrounded by flowers, through the glass windows of a carriage drawn by four black horses. 
It was followed by a black limousine, both pulled up outside the front of the church. Roy Grace put his arm around Cleo and led her inside, accepting the two service sheets that were handed to him, and headed down the aisle, nodding in acknowledgement at faces he knew. As they sat down, Bella's mother, a frail lady with a zimmer frame, and several others of Bella's family members, including three children, sat down on the pew in front of them. Roy handed a service sheet to Cleo, then stared at the photograph on the front of his. It was an angelic young child with golden curls, the dates of her birth and death beneath. Bella Kathleen Moy. She was just thirty-five when she died. He opened it and ran his eyes through the order of service, noting the hymns that had been chosen, glad to see that one of his own favourites, the rousing Jerusalem, was among them. Cleo had told him she believed in God, although she never went to church to worship. They'd had a number of discussions about faith, particularly in the days following Noah's birth and whether to have him baptised. Cleo wanted it. She liked traditions and the idea of godparents. Grace was not really sure how he felt. Part of him would have preferred not to have a christening and to let Noah decide for himself when he was older. But if it was what Cleo wanted, he was happy to go along with it. There had been a time, too, when he had believed. Then he'd gone through a period of being almost a militant atheist, partly prompted by the death of both his parents and Sandy's absolute cynicism about religion, and then had arrived at where he was today, open-minded. He found it hard to believe in the biblical notion of God, but equally he was uncomfortable with the modern atheists like Dawkins. If he had to nail his colours to the mast, he would have said that there was a bigger picture, and human beings weren't, as yet anyhow, smart enough to understand what it was. But whenever he entered an impressive church like this one, he could understand something of the mystical spell cast over people. He remained seated in the pew, breathing in the smells of wood and musty fabric, while Cleo unhooked her kneeler, laid it down, and knelt on it, her face buried in her hands in prayer. He followed suit opened his hands and pressed them against his face. He tried to remember the words of the Lord's Prayer, which he had said every night throughout his childhood and in his mid-teens. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, he murmured self-consciously and stopped as the next line suddenly eluded him. Then music began playing, John Denver's leaving on a jet plane. Suddenly all around him people were getting to their feet. He and Cleo stood too. As the music played on, the pallbearers carried the pine coffin down the aisle. He turned, along with everyone else, to see four sombre men, one of them Norman Potting, tears streaming down his face, slowly approaching the altar. Then they placed it carefully on the catafalque. The congregation sat again. As the service commenced, officiated by Father Martin, who only a short while ago had officiated at their own wedding, Roy Grace pulled his speech from his pocket and read through it once more. The vicar said a few words of introduction, then they stood again for the first hymn, Abide With Me. As it drew to an end, the vicar gave a reading from 1 Corinthians 12. Then Norman Potting stood up, slowly made his way towards the pulpit, and entered it. His face was wet with tears, and there was total silence in the church. It took him some moments to compose himself, this is about Bella, he said. Then his voice faltered. The music she loved, the people she loved. No one ever loved her more than I did. He began to sob. After several moments, dabbing his eyes again, he said, Throughout the time I was lucky enough to know Bella, and for her to become my fiance, there was one Sussex police officer who knew all along just how damn good she was. He pointed straight at Roy Grace. You, sir, Roy, please come and say a few words. I, uh, I can't, I can't say any more. As he stumbled down from the pulpit, Grace stood and walked towards it. When he reached Norman Potting, he stopped, gave him a hug, and kissed him on both cheeks. Then he climbed into the pulpit, took out his speech, and laid it on the lectern and waited for Norman to find his front row seat and settle into it before commencing. The police 
I have come in for a lot of criticism in recent years, he said, catching Cleo's reassuring expression, then scanning the congregation of almost one thousand faces. Fair dues to the press for highlighting the idiots in our forces, the wrong uns. There are over 135,000 police officers in the UK. In any body of people that big, you're bound to find some bad eggs. Maybe their number about 1%, although I would guess the figure is lower even than that. So what about the other 99%? Bella Moy was one of these. She worked as one of the most valued members of my team on many cases. During all the time I knew her, despite her obligations caring for her mother, she never threw a sickie, never moaned, never went home early, never took a single day off that she wasn't entitled to. Sussex CID was her life. A life that very recently, and for far too short a time, in which she found true love with Norman. He paused, faltering as he caught the detective sergeant's eye, and had to take a deep breath to compose himself. He stared again at the sea of silent but attentive faces, most of whom were familiar. I've been privileged to serve Sussex Police for twenty-one years, and I've met and know many of you here today. There are few officers in our force, or in any other police force around the nation, who have not at some time been in a situation where their life has been on the line. Whether it's confronting, single crude, a scimitar-waving drunk at three o'clock in the morning in Brighton's lanes, approaching a car in a dark country lane with a suspected armed robber inside, entering a brutal pub brawl, or crawling out on a high-rise window ledge to try to talk down a potential suicidal jumper. What I do know is that all of you officers here today would go into that situation with barely a moment's thought for your own safety, to do your duty in serving the public. He fell silent, to let the words sink in before continuing. Bella Moy died doing just that. What makes her death even more poignant and heroic is that she was off duty. There was a burning building, and she could have driven right by, but she didn't. She stopped. And when she learned that there was a small child trapped inside, she went straight in and saved that child. The fire services had not arrived at this point, and it is likely that if Bella had not gone in, the young child would have died. It was an act of bravery that cost her her life. She knew she was taking a very big risk entering that blazing building, but she didn't actually have time to make much of a risk assessment. She knew there was a chance of saving a child, whatever the risks to herself. He paused to take a breath, then went on. I think the words of this American author, Jack London could have been written about Bella Moy. I would rather be ashes than dust. I would rather that my spark should burn out in a brilliant blaze than it should be stifled by dry rot. I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy and permanent planet. The function of a human being is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. His voice just held out. Bella used her time, and it ran out on her. We are all the poorer for that. But the richer for having known her. He stepped down, and blinded by tears, made his way back to his pew. Ten minutes later, after the words of the last hymn, Jerusalem, faded, everyone kneeled again. The vicar gave his final blessing, and suddenly, very different music started. Fergal Sharkey's A Good Heart. The pallbearers and Norman Potting shouldered the coffin and carried it back out, followed by Bella's family. Slowly, Roy Grace climbed to his feet and held out his arm for Cleo. Then he picked up his umbrella and followed them along the aisle, struggling to keep his composure. Outside, among the throngs of people standing in the bitter cold, a young woman in black, with a small pillbox hat over a tangle of fair hair, and accompanied by a small, rather sullen child, suddenly came up to Norman Potting. Excuse me, Mr. Detective Potting? Yes, Potting nodded. 
My name's Maggie Durrant. Your fiancée, Bella, I... I just wanted to let you know that she saved Megan, my daughter. And she saved our dog, Rocky, too. I... I don't know what to say. I just... I just wanted you to know how grateful I am. And how sorry I am. She sniffed, tears trickling down her cheeks. Thank you, Norman Potting said, his voice choked with emotion. Thank you. He looked down at the little girl and gave her a tearful smile. And she gave him the faintest trace of a smile back. Chapter 55 Monday the 15th of December Logan heard a scraping sound, the lid above her being opened. She saw in the faint green glow a head appear, the features entirely obscured by a black gimp mask with goggles. An instant later, a searing white flashlight beam blinded her. Everything's a bit shit at the moment, he said, in a clear, educated voice. But look on the bright side. There always is a bright side. You're still alive. But I thought you should know that you are on borrowed time. But then, aren't we all, eh? No one gets out of life alive. Hyperventilating with terror, she heard him chuckle. It was a hideous cackle like a witch. I'm thirsty, she gasped. I need more sugar. Please, please tell me why I'm here. What do you want? I'll give you anything you want. If you want to have sex with me, I won't resist. I'll do anything. Yes, you will. You will do anything I want, he cackled again. Then his voice suddenly softened. You want water? Please. Suddenly, without giving her any opportunity to draw breath, a stream of icy water began pouring onto her face. She gulped some of it down, but it kept on coming, covering her whole face, pouring down the sides of her face and her neck. She shook her head, swallowing more down, but it kept on coming. It shot up her nostrils agonizingly. She tried to breathe, but choked on the stuff now. She turned her head sideways, trying desperately to break free of it, but it kept on pouring. She began shaking, suffocating, drowning. She tried to scream, but only a gurgle came out. She was thrashing, twisting, and turning against her bonds, but the water kept on coming, jetting down on her as hard as a fire hose. Her whole inside was tight, her lungs bursting. The water kept on coming. Then, as suddenly as it had started, it ceased. Spluttering, coughing, choking, gulping air, she closed her eyes against the searing white light again. You talk when I tell you to talk, slut. The lid slid shut above her. She lay, whimpering in terror, closed her eyes and prayed silently. Oh, please, God, help me. Please help me. When she opened her eyes again, she realised the lid was open once more. The man in the mask and goggles was staring down at her. God doesn't like sluts who break off their engagement, he said. The lid slid shut again. Who was it? Was Jamie behind this, she kept wondering. Had he set this up? Where, oh, where the hell was she? She listened constantly for any sounds to give her a clue where she might be. She'd not yet heard the dawn chorus again. No sirens, no aircraft noise, just the constant, unremitting silence, except when her captor came to visit. She called out, but only silence came back at her. Chapter 56 Monday the 15th of December Roy drove in silence in the slow traffic behind the cortege, with Cleo at his side. The rain was falling harder, the sky as dark as their mood. I've never been to a sadder funeral, she said suddenly. He nodded, too choked to speak at the moment. Normally, she said, you know, there's something uplifting. Most of the funerals I've been to have been of elderly relatives. Lives lived. I went to one, a couple of years ago, of an old school friend who died at 27 of cancer, but even that one, although desperately sad, didn't affect me in the way this one has. 
I guess in the police we all know the dangers. Glenn was shot during that raid to try to free a kidnapped couple. Had the bullet gone a couple of inches either way, he'd have been killed or paralysed. And then EJ was inches from being crushed to death by a van she was trying to stop. And you, my darling? Honestly, how many risks have you taken, my love? A few, he said. I suppose one of the closest was at Beachy Head last year, when I had to go over the edge of the cliff to save Pew's life. And I hated the bastard. With good reason. I'll never forgive him for what he did. Grace thought back to Pew's humiliating attempt to prove he had murdered Sandy by having the garden at the home they'd shared scanned and excavated. He was determined to prove I'd killed her. Then I put my life on the bloody line to save his. Now he's my sodding boss. How great is that? Well, maybe he'll now show his gratitude. Grace touched her thigh gently. You know, that's one of the ten thousand things I love about you. You're always looking for the good in people. And you're always looking for the bad. That's what twenty years of being a copper does for you. Don't ever stop looking for the good, Roy. There is good in everyone. Sometimes you just have to drill down deep. I'd like to believe you. Especially when you look at someone like Bella, who is devoted to her job and equally devoted to looking after her elderly sick mother. Then you have a truly good person. I've encountered too many people who are totally dedicated to doing evil. How many of those ever had a chance in life? How many got warped in childhood by abusive parents, lack of education and no role models? Most of them. But does that excuse them? Hey, I'm awfully sorry I just beat an old lady to death so I could burgle her house, but it's all right because my mum used to get drunk and hit me. He drove in silence for some moments. Then he said, I'm sorry, darling. I don't want to sound cynical. I don't ever want to be a cynic. But Bella died a hero, a true hero. I'm not sure how many of the scrotes we have to deal with every day in this city would ever be capable of heroism, or of even doing anything good. Finally, they entered the hilltop cemetery and saw the cortege a short distance ahead. They wound past the rows of flat tombstones, the only ones permitted here now because of the long history of vandalism, and halted. A short distance away was the freshly opened family grave where Bella's father had been buried some years earlier. Green astroturf covered the mound of earth on one side as if peeled from inside the grave. Two planks of wood lay across. Oblivious now to the wind and driving rain, they hurried over to the limousine that had halted behind the horse-drawn hearse, just as Norman Potting, looking utterly lost and bewildered, tears streaming down his face and clutching a plastic bag, climbed out. Grace put a supportive arm around the detective sergeant, who was crying inconsolably. Be strong for her, Norman, he said quietly to him. Just be strong for the next short while. I don't know how I'm going to be able to go on living without her. You're going to have to go on sodding living because I need you. He led him towards the chubby, white-haired figure of Father Martin, who stood by the grave oblivious to the weather in his black cassock and purple stole, as Bella's family and friends gathered around. The coffin was carried to the grave and tapes threaded through the handles. For some moments there was total silence, just the sound of the wind and the falling rain and the deep, intermittent sobs from Norman. I am the resurrection and the light, says the Lord intoned Father Martin. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live and shall not die eternally. Friends, welcome here. To these few moments in this cemetery as we come and bring Bella to this final resting place. We are reminded in the scriptures that we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's bow our heads for this first prayer. Grace listened to the words of the prayer and remembered Father Martin's reading earlier, blinded now by his own tears. He continued to support Norman Potting, who was shaking. He heard the priest's words intermittently. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? He heard. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. Where, O oh death, is your sting? Potting's sobbing became louder. 
Grace tried to comfort him. We are going to commend Bella to God's keeping, Father Martin said. The pallbearers bowed their heads. Slowly, they lowered the coffin until it was out of sight. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger. He remembers that we are but dust, our days are like the grass, we flourish like a flower of the field. When the wind goes over it is gone, and its place will know it no more, but the merciful goodness of the Lord endures for ever and ever. We have entrusted our sister Bella Kathleen Moy to God's mercy, and we now commit her body to the ground. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. In the sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then, after the final Amen, Bella's mother stepped forward shakily, holding on to the arm of a family member and threw a handful of earth into the grave. Moments later, suddenly silent, Norman Potting broke free from Grace's grip, stumbled up to the grave and knelt. Then, from the plastic bag he was holding, he pulled a small red box. Looking around wildly, almost insane with grief, he said, Bella will need these. She'll need them. She will. He leaned forward, headlong into the grave, and dropped the box of Maltesers on top of the coffin. Then he staggered back to his feet, helped by Roy, who ran forward to support him. She will, Potting said. She'll be giving them out in heaven to everyone she meets. Chapter 57 Tuesday the 16th of December Good morning, boys. It's make your mind up time. Make your mind up time, chum, he said with a giggle. Who remembers that line, eh? Felix? Harrison? Marcus? Silla Black in the TV dating show Blind Date? ventured Felix, always the one to lead. No, it was Huey Green in Opportunity Knox who used it first, said Marcus. What do you think, Harrison? I'm not so sure, but it rings a bell. Ding, ding! He giggled again. It was definitely Blind Date, Felix said. I never saw Blind Date, Marcus said. Tut, tut, what a sheltered life you've led, eh? A better one than this, Marcus retorted, sullen. Tut, 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 what kind of gratitude is that, Marcus? What exactly do any of us have to be grateful about, he retorted. Ooh, feisty. I like it when you get all feisty, Marcus. It sets all my pheromones racing. You never saw Blind Date? Did you spend the 1990s living under a rock? The whole planet saw that show, except, of course, for you. Myself, as well as one quarter of the Earth's population who have not yet made a phone call, let alone enjoyed the luxury of watching television, Marcus replied. Oh, very good. I love your social conscience, Marcus. I like a person with principles, but I suspect that figure you are quoting is lower these days. You're out of date. Really, you are. I don't know what you spend your time doing. Honestly, we'll have to help your cultural enlightenment. I'll see if I can find some recordings of Blind Date for you. I think Felix is right, said Harrison. It was Scylla Black in Blind Date. Yes! He squealed with delight. Yes! 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 So Felix wins today's prize. Let's all hear it for Felix. Let's congratulate him, Felix. You get a Mars bar. I know it's a bit early in the morning, but hey, as my mum used to say, what's time to the Irish, eh? He pulled a Mars bar from his pocket, ripped the wrapper off, and let it flutter down onto the floor. Oh dear, what a little lout I am. He held out the chocolate bar. Here it is, Felix. Enjoy. Let the losers salivate over your success. Oh, but before you take the first bite, because you're not quite there yet, I want you to tell me what Scylla Black's name was before she changed it. Can you tell me? He held out the chocolate bar, tantalising him. I don't know, Felix said. I so totally do not know. It was Priscilla White, he said triumphantly. Oh dear, you lose. 
He held the bar up. All right, while I decide if one of you gets the whole thing or we all share it, I'd like to know everyone's opinion about my latest project, Freya Northrop. Are we all still agreed? He held up her photograph. She ticks all the boxes, yes. She does, Felix said. Harrison, what do you think? Felix is only saying yes because he wants the Mars bar, Harrison replied. She's definitely your type, Marcus said. Oh, you are being nice to me now, Marcus. Could it be that you are angling for the chocolate? You're right, though. She is my type, isn't she? Ah, oh, yes, she is exactly my type, all right. She's home early every night to prepare dinner while her boyfriend, Zack, stays at the restaurant working away. When he comes home one night this week, big surprise! There'll be no dinner and no Freya. Do you have a thing about couples shacking up together? Harrison asked. Are you going moralistic on me, Harrison? I'm only mentioning it. Purely coincidental, old chap. He shook his head. I'm sensing a lot of attitude this morning. He put the picture down and looked at his watch. 6.15. Tut, tut. I've not had my brekkie yet. He took a large bite out of the Mars bar and chewed. Through his sticky mouthful of chocolate and toffee, he said, Mmm, not had one of these for a while. It tastes good, really good. Too good to share, and I've got a busy day ahead. Need to keep my strength up. Sorry, everyone. He pushed the rest of the bar into his mouth. Bastard, Marcus said. He nodded. Yep, I am. You're right about that, Marcus. But then. You always have been. Chapter 58 Tuesday the 16th of December Shortly after 7am, Roy Grace carried a mug of steaming coffee into his office and sat at his desk, reflecting on the events of yesterday, and in particular the first gold group meeting that had followed the grim funeral and the equally grim wake before the press conference and the evening briefing. It was dark beyond his rain-spattered window, the Asda Superstore complex and the skyline of Brighton barely visible apart from the hazy, misty glow of street lighting. In between two of the piles of paperwork he needed to tackle sat a foil package containing the egg and tomato sandwich Cleo had made him last night for his breakfast and six red grapes. She had read in some health column that six red grapes a day were the new big anti-aging elixir and the tomato was apparently good for warding off many cancers in later years. Since Noah had been born, he had noticed that she had become more preoccupied than ever with both of them eating healthily. And never ordinarily a nervous person, she had become a tad anxious. No doubt something to do with a mother's protective instincts, he thought. Feeling very flat, he stared up at the photographic print of the words branded on unknown female. You are dead, pinned to his notice board. At least part of the gloom, he felt, was over the imminent arrival of the Met officer, Detective Chief Inspector Paul Sweetman. Maybe Pew was acting in his best interests, but from past experience, anything Pew did needed to be viewed with suspicion. A lot of people had congratulated him on his eulogy, but he'd barely heard their words. Although he'd had no involvement at all in Bella's decision to enter that burning building, he still felt a strong degree of blame. The fire had been started by the arsonist monster at the centre of the investigation he had been running. If they had caught him sooner, Bryce Laurent would never have started the fire, and Bella would still be alive. He replayed over and over in his mind the whole scenario of that investigation, Operation Aardvark, from the very first report that a woman, Red Westwood, was in danger from a stalker, to the moment when Detective Sergeant Moy had so bravely, if recklessly, entered that burning building, wondering what he might have done differently to have arrested the man sooner. It gave him little satisfaction that Bryce Laurent had burned to death in a cell at Lewis Prison in an apparent suicide. He would like to have seen the man brought to trial, and through that process understood something of what had created such a twisted mind. On the other hand, Laurent's death did mean closure of a kind for Red Westwood the woman whose life he had made such hell. At least she would not have to live with the fear that one day he might be released from prison and come after her again. 
As was his morning ritual, he logged on to the serials and checked the tagged summary log. An attempted gay rape of a man in Kemptown, an escaped prisoner from Ford Open Prison arrested at an address in Hollingbury, a street robbery, a reported break-in at a house in Hove, nothing apparently stolen, according to the owners, a chef and his partner, and another break-in at a student house off Elm Grove, where two laptops had been taken. Next, he turned his attention to this morning's briefing on the joint investigation, Operation Haywain. He reached for his sandwich and began to remove the foil paper Cleo had put around it, and as he did so, he noticed among the different piles on his desk a folder with a yellow post-it stuck to the top with Glenn Branson's slanted handwriting on it. Take a look at this. He put his breakfast down and opened the folder, and felt a jolt as if a bolt of electricity had shot through him. He was looking at a copy of one of several CAD, computer-aided design, impressions of unknown female, the body found at Hove Lagoon, the computer-generated image created from the bone structure of her skull. Each version showed a different hairstyle. She looked an attractive young woman in her early twenties, and in this one, the artist had shown her with long brown hair. Shit, he said to himself aloud. Yeah, that's what I said too. He looked up to see Glenn Branson, sharply dressed and looking a lot fresher than he himself felt, and smelling more strongly than usual of a musky fragrance. He hadn't heard him enter. Obviously, Branson went on, the artist has speculated on the hairstyle. A few strands aren't much to go on. Putting the hair aside, their looks are so similar too. Grace stared down at the blank, expressionless image that was devoid of whatever personality the deceased woman once had. Emma Johnson, Logan Somerville, Ashley Stanford, Katie Westerham, and now unknown female. Two of them died thirty years ago. Three of them have vanished within the past month. Time would tell whether these images would be useful or not, but for now it was helpful to have a possible visual focus on the victim. Branson turned around one of the chairs in front of the desk and sat astride it, his arms folded over the back, staring thoughtfully at his colleague and mentor. How did your gold group meeting go? Good. We formalised the structure and agreed three main objectives, the safety of the citizens of Brighton and Hove, the direction and progress of the investigation, and our press and media communications strategy. Do you want me at the press conference? I did, mate, but Mr Preening Peacock wants to be there himself along with me, so he can take the glory when we get a result, and blame me if we don't. Grace looked down at the pictures again, his brain spinning, thinking about the different experienced people he had spoken to for advice. Was he covering all the bases, he wondered repeatedly. I have some news which might help us that's come in overnight. We've got the names from the council records of three of the men who were on the team that laid the path at the lagoon, who are still alive. Two of them have been located and are being interviewed this morning, Branson said. The total workforce there at the time was seven. Three of the men have since died, and one emigrated to Australia. We'll need to find him and get him interviewed, if he's still alive. It could be that one of them is the killer and took the opportunity to rebury the remains before the surface went down, thinking the path would be there forever. Norman Potting has a contact in Melbourne Police who he's spoken to and is on it. But the guy emigrated nearly twenty years ago. It might take a few days. We don't have a few days, Glenn. I'll volunteer for the trip. I need you here. If we need to send anyone, and it's a big if, it might be good to send Norman. Give him time away for a few days. By the way, what news on that Argus reporter you fancy? Any developments? Glenn Branson raised his hands in the air and swivelled them from side to side. What's that meant to mean? I'm being careful with Siobhan. In what sense? Branson drew his forefinger across his lip like a zip. Keep it that way. She gets it. She's a journalist. Journalists eat their young. Okay? Journalists and traffic officers. Yeah, well, the big difference is that I'd trust the traffic officer, even if he or she booked me. She's cool, I'm telling you. I know her pretty well by now. Grace gave his close friend a sideways look. A thought was going through his mind that it might actually be no bad thing to have a tame journalist at this moment. Then he stared back at the photograph of the branded words. You have someone contacting all blacksmiths in the area to see who might have forged the branding iron that did this. Someone would remember making this if he or she's still around for sure. There can't be many blacksmiths get commissioned to make a branding iron with those words. 
There aren't many blacksmiths or forge masters at all. Yes, there's an outside inquiry team on it, but no luck yet. It could, of course, be a DIY job. Grace nodded, silently thinking. What would give someone the idea to brand victims? What did branding signify? Power? Ownership? Sheep and cattle were often branded to show their ownership. Slaves, too. Jews in concentration camps were branded for identification, although they were done with tattoos rather than heated metal. But ultimately the branding was done as a symbol of power. I own you now. I can do what I want with you. You are nothing more than cattle. The idea he had about the Argus crime reporter was forming more clearly now in his mind. Mate, he said, I need you to ask Siobhan to do something. It's a uh, you-scratch-my-back-and-I'll-scratch-yours kind of favour, OK? Branson nodded, looking puzzled. Yeah, no problem. Keep it work-related, OK? The D.I. grinned and said nothing. Chapter 59 Tuesday the 16th of December Adrienne Macklin enjoyed her job working in the front office of the Round Stone Caravan Park on the outskirts of Horsham, a prosperous town 25 miles north of Brighton, with a modern shopping centre and surrounded by glorious Sussex countryside. Part of the company's business was the sale of caravans, and they had a wide selection on display from bargain second-hand tourers up to luxurious top-of-the-range static caravans. The other part was managing the site's 200 mobile homes. Some of the owners were permanent residents, but many were holiday makers who came several times a year from not only all over the county of Sussex, but from many other parts of the UK. And then there was the gentleman in Unit R73. A widow, Adrienne was always on the lookout for a potential new partner, and he ticked a lot of her boxes. This man was good-looking, charming, and always cheerful, but so far all her attempts at engaging him in conversation had been, very politely, rebuffed. She knew virtually nothing about him at all. He had owned a very nice mobile home for many years and kept it in immaculate condition. His visits were sporadic, turning up sometimes during the week, sometimes at weekends, occasionally staying for a few days, but mostly only for a few hours. He always came alone, carrying armfuls of newspapers and magazines and a waitrose carrier bag with, usually, the neck of a wine bottle peeping out of the top. One time she'd asked him what he did for a living. Oh, he had replied, I'm in IT, you know, that kind of thing. Very boring. Not to me, she had responded, trying to keep the chat going. It is, dear, trust me. Another time she'd tried to find out where he lived. But he had replied, cheery as ever, Oh, you know, here and there. I'm planning to retire here. Not long to go. So she remained in hope that one day soon he might actually retire here, and perhaps she could get to know him better then. Meanwhile, she attempted a little detective work of her own, snooping around the outside of his mobile home while he was absent. She'd even tried the lock one day, as she kept keys to most of the homes on the park, but without success. There were three separate locks, and the door had reinforced steel around it. The windows, with their blinds down, gave her no clue either. It was impossible to see in. He was clearly a very private man. Some days she wondered, uncharitably perhaps, if he was a bit of a deviant. Was he some kind of pervert? What did he get up to inside that mobile home with all his papers and magazines? The only time Adrienne had ever really engaged in any kind of proper conversation with him had been a couple of years back when her daughter, Haley, had been helping her out as a summer job to earn some pennies whilst at uni. He'd taken a bit of a shine to Haley and had stood in the office for ages chatting to her about music. It turned out they were both fans of the Kinks and he told Haley about a pub in North London which Ray Davis frequented. It was the first time she had ever been jealous of her daughter. But Haley soon put her back in her place after he had left for his caravan, clutching his usual armful of papers and magazines. What a weirdo, Haley said. I think it's rather dishy. Get real, mother. Chapter 60 Tuesday the 16th of December 
Following the 11am Gold Group meeting, shortly before midday, Cassie and Pugh strutted into the lounge assembly room at Malling House, the Sussex Police Headquarters, wearing a starched white shirt with epaulettes and a black tie. Roy Grace, in a navy suit, followed him up onto the podium and they stood side by side in front of the microphones facing the largest gathering of press and media Grace had ever seen, amid a dazzling storm of flashlights. He remembered what he'd been told many years ago, to take several deep breaths both to calm his nerves and energise him before addressing a crowd. There were at least fifty people in the room, journalists, television crews from Sky News, Latest TV, BBC South, and radio reporters he recognised from Radio Sussex and Juice FM, as well as half a dozen more he was unfamiliar with. Also on the podium, standing well to their left, was the Police and Crime Commissioner, looking smart and elegant in a grey suit and white blouse, and the Chief Executive of Brighton and Hove City Council, Philippa Tomset, also smartly dressed. The room fell silent. Pugh began speaking, but no one could hear him. Stand a bit closer to the microphone, Grace whispered to him. There was a squawk, then a loud crackle, then Pugh's voice rang out. Thank you all for coming. I'm Assistant Chief Constable Cassian Pugh, with responsibility for the overall investigation of major crime in Sussex, and on my right is Detective Superintendent Roy Grace of Surrey and Sussex Major Crime Team, who is the Senior Investigating Officer on Operation Haywain. We also have with us on my left the Police and Crime Commissioner for Sussex and the Chief Executive of Brighton and Hove City Council. I'm asking Detective Superintendent Grace to brief you on the investigation thus far, and then we will take questions. As soon as Grace had finished, a sea of hands rose. Siobhan Sheldrake from the Argus called out first, Detective Superintendent Grace, is it true you believe the disappearances of two Brighton women in the past week, Ms Logan Somerville and Ms Ashley Stanford, are linked with the disappearance two weeks ago of Worthing resident Ms Emma Johnson? Grace took another deep breath and stepped up closer to his microphone. Yes, and we also have reason to suspect that the offender behind their abductions may be responsible for two murders we believe occurred approximately 30 years ago. One is the unsolved murder of Catherine Jane Marie Westerham, a 19-year-old student at Sussex University who failed to return to her residence in Elm Grove, Brighton in December 1984 and whose remains were found in Ashdown Forest in April 1985. The other is the remains of a young woman in her late teens or early twenties which were recovered from Hove Lagoon, who we believe was murdered around the same time. He pointed at the screen behind him on which photographs of Emma Johnson, Logan Somerville and Ashley Stamford were being projected. The main focus of the investigation at this time is finding these three young women and we are appealing to the public for anyone who has seen them or may know their current whereabouts to come forward and contact the incident room or Crime Stoppers on the phone numbers behind me. Detective Superintendent, a slovenly looking middle-aged reporter Grace did not recognise called out, are you saying there is a serial killer who has been dormant for 30 years now active in the city of Brighton and Hove? Grace could feel the sudden silence in the room and the almost vulture-like air of anticipation. He chose his words, which he had rehearsed many times, carefully. We are looking for a middle-aged man with local knowledge and a sadistic streak who appears to be targeting young women of a specific appearance. He's already made a number of mistakes, which I can't go into now. There is evidence we have found so far where the victims appear to be branded with the same phrase. That phrase is, you are dead. Immediately the words, you are dead, appeared on the screen behind him. I know, he went on, that you out there will want to give him a title, and for this reason we are calling him the Brighton Brander. Instantly a barrage of questions was fired at him, each of them desperate to get their questions heard. Where were they branded? What was it done with? How big is it? What's the significance? Roy raised his hands to try to calm the audience down. We don't know the significance of this phrase, but I can tell you it is approximately two inches wide and half an inch high. Another question came from the rear of the room. How can there be such a long gap, Detective Superintendent? We only know that there was a long gap here in our city, Grace replied. It's possible he may have moved away for a period, offending elsewhere, but there are plenty of examples both here in our country and overseas of patterns of this kind. Are you certain the offender is male? A sharp-faced woman said from near the front. Yes, we are, from forensic evidence. 
Can you tell us what kind of forensic evidence? Seaman? We're not prepared to divulge that at this stage, Grace replied. We would like to hear from anyone who saw an old grey or dark blue k Reg Volvo estate in Kemptown or Dyke Road area in the vicinity of the Chesham Gate apartment building between five and six o'clock last Thursday evening. They were deliberately holding back the registration number at this stage. A grey-haired man in a baseball cap, standing by the latest TV cameraman, called out, Do you have any suspects for the Brighton Brander, Detective Superintendent? Grace was pleased the man was using the name. Not as yet, no. We are working with forensic psychiatrists and a psychologist. He took a deep breath again, then went on. Although we are linking the disappearances of Emma, Logan and Ashley, this is a relatively rare occurrence and we don't want to cause unnecessary concern. We will be providing guidance and advice to young women in the city, as well as increasing the police visibility on the streets. Pew suddenly leaned forward and spoke again. The important thing is that we don't want to create a situation of panic. We are confident of an imminent arrest. Grace gave him a sideways glare, inwardly despairing of the man. He had just said the very word Grace had been so studiously trying to avoid. Panic. Pew had also promised an imminent arrest, which at this moment, without a live suspect, they had no chance of delivering. Assistant Chief Constable Pugh, do you think the 